God morgon Johan och välkommen. Ja, tack så mycket Lena, tack så mycket. Hur är läget med dig? Det är bra. Mm. Ja, det är bra. Det ska bli skönt med lite sommar tror jag. Ja, det är, nu, är det so- nu är det sommar ute i alla fall. Hur? Ja. Hej, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's wait till vi startar. Hur är läget med dig? Uh, I think uh, Lena, I think everyone should hear you so let's uh, let's okay. wait for the for the I, beginning. I, I keep quiet. <laughs> it's, it's my fault. It's my fault. <laughs> Hey, good morning, everyone. We're about to start. Uh, welcome to the Nordic Engineering Education Seminar, the first one. We have beautiful morning here in Vilnius. Sunny day, Friday, so we're about to have a good seminar, I think. Uh, we're hoping that's our first try. So welcome, and uh, we're going to start soon. My name is Gedi Milas, and here's my colleague, Alisa. We're going to be hosting together. So good morning, Gedimini. Good morning, uh, people of Nortec. We are happy to see you. Actually, we are so excited and we are delighted. And uh, we really believe that we are going to be enlightened after the today's session. So as we are talking about uh, a very beautiful day, let us also talk about a very beautiful network. Uh, the network which actually united all of us today. And of course, I'm talking about the, uh, I'm talking about Nortec. Uh, little did I know about Nortec, to be honest, but my colleague Gediminas actually told me a lot of things, and I'm absolutely sure that today you are also going to hear a lot about it. <laughs> 
Uh, but generally, just to speak very briefly, uh, Nordic is a great network of uh, Northern European technical universities, and this is exactly what is the common ground for us. Uh, we aim to unite all the universities which specialize in technical and engineering sciences. Uh, and uh, most probably, we are also looking forward to uh, build up a very strong community of teachers, researchers, and students. That's yeah, sure. yeah. So Nordic does multiple things. We're going to hear a little about that later from from the Nordic officials. But of course, today we're focusing on engineering education, and Nordic has that engineering education group. You could see some information about that on our website. And today, full day is dedicated to learn some and share some uh, engineering education knowledge so I'm, I'm i'm really interested into that i'm also a teacher of engineering and we both work as you see vilnius tech so really all about that and when we'll we'll, we'll have uh, speakers from multiple countries uh including united states but mostly <laughs> mostly northern countries so a lot of a lot of good uh, knowledge to share uh, if right. I may step in here, uh, just to give the exact number, we are going to have uh, generally more than 30 university members today uh, from eight different countries. So there's a lot of things to hear. But once we're talking about learning, uh, isn't it so that, uh, well, we are actually learning all of the time. And if we reflect on the um, last spring, uh, once COVID pandemic stopped, uh, stepped in, generally we had to renew our knowledge Knowledge and we had to uh, reprogram ourselves to uh, actually be working online, which was quite challenging. Uh, well, we succeeded, we failed, then we succeeded again. Uh, but if you are looking forward uh, to any new techniques which you may apply to your students, definitely and for sure, today is the day for you. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have a lot of uh, presentations uh, connected to distant learning, to, to networking. So that's very interesting. Of course, we wanted to meet live this time as well, but you know, there's even a chance that we're not gonna resume the the the, the actual uh, teaching. I don't know, but I hope I hope we're gonna get back on um, September to the auditoriums. But we really and I'm personally learned a lot through this year. I know you did as well, and our dear presenters, the speakers, gonna share their really interesting knowledge. You can see it from the program which you also, of course, can find on our website. And talking about the presenters, uh, well, let us step into the communication rules which are going to be applied today. So as you see, we are broadcasting the uh, Zoom seminar, uh, which means the webinar, which means that you are welcome to ask your questions via Q&A section. The, some of those questions are going to be answered uh, by the hosts, uh, that is Gediminas and me, or uh, some, of those, uh, some of those questions might be actually actually asked verbally. You're also kindly invited to raise your hands uh, while talking to at it, while talking to the panelists. And finally, I should also remind you about the program, which is also available online. Yeah. And the very last thing, uh, if you are not planning to spend all day with us, uh, just mind the time zone you are at and uh, generally uh, come back to the sessions which you find interesting. Okay. Also, I heard that uh, today, even the president of uh, the network is going to be here. Is that true? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. I can, I, I can probably see him there. So, <laughs> yes, of course. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to announce that uh, President Johan, president of the Nordic, is uh, about to, to speak and to open this, uh, this seminar. I can see attendees are gathering in. So, Johan, the stage is yours. Um, Good morning. Good okay. Morning, Johan. You there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, we cannot hear yeah. you just now. You, you cannot hear me? Yeah, can you, can you hear me issues, now? But we are used to that. So. Can, can you hear me now? or? Sorry, Where? still no sound. You can hear it? Magna can hear it? Yes, oh. I can hear you once. So do you Le hear Le me? Lena can hear me. So. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Something. Hey, okay. Loud and clear. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect, Johan. Very good. <laughs> Our bad. Very good. <laughs> uh, on, on behalf of uh, Nordtech, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, uh, 
uh, engineering education uh, uh, meeting. And uh, as already Alisa mentioned, uh, uh, Nordtech is a network of uh, uh, technical universities in the Nordic countries and in the Baltic countries. Today, about 30 university, universities are members of this network. And uh, this corresponds to about 120,000 engineering students. So what we do matter a lot. And I would also say that during the last few years, the, the Baltic countries have, have become members. And that to me is one of the biggest uh, uh, improvements, I think, for the network. I think our region has historically have contacts since the Middle Ages so, and the tradition of, of engineering in all our countries. So I, 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 I especially since we are now at Vilnius, I would especially like to, to say how pleased we are in new tech that, uh, that uh, technical universities of the Baltic countries are in, now in our family as they should be. Uh, and uh, so what do we do in new tech? Um, we do lots of things, but we try to, to, to uh, focus on three areas. And one of these areas is engineering education. Another is entrepreneurship. And a third is mobility. And, and to me, uh, talking about engineering education today, I, I think it, it has to be one of the most interesting periods in history to talk about engineering education right now. Because the, the changes are tremendous uh, with digitalization. And I see that also in this schedule of today that, that this is going to be a topic later today. How are we going to use digitalization to, to improve uh, education? I think it opens tremendous possibilities. We still want to meet in real life, but digitalization opens new possibilities. Yeah, I think you, I see you also talk about flipped classrooms, how to make students more active. So I do think this is a conference in, in an area that goes through, a, goes through a tremendous development right now. So it's a very urgent and important topic. And I also heard from Lena Gumelius that, who is in charge of, of the engineering education uh, focus area that this will be a yearly event with these uh, seminars on engineering education starting today here at Villiers. And I think that's a very good uh, initiative. And I think it will, what you will do here today will mean a lot for, for our engineering students and therefore also for, for in fact, for our countries in, in, in our region. Um, so I, I would also if, I'd like to thank uh, Gediminas for for uh, fantastic organization and, and work with this program, Gediminas and and Alisa and, and their associates. So thank you so much. Uh, I think this will be a start of a very important series of of, of seminars. And with this and with a big thank to to Lena who organizes this focus area. My give my word back to you with my best wishes for your future work. Um, thank you, uh, Johan. It's so nice to have you here. We are glad that you're here. Took the time and say welcome. Uh, I, I would just like to, sh to share a few pictures and say a few words about the NoTech Engineering Education Network. So let me try this. As Johan and Jedmin has mentioned, uh, this is our first seminar in the engineering education network. And to come here, it has taken us a few years or at least a couple of years to decide what will an engineering education network look like in the Nordic uh, in the Nordtech, what can we achieve? How can we contribute? Um, uh, so now we have actually formulated the vision and we have a steering group who work with this network. So we hope it will, 
uh, we will achieve something good. This is part of the vision uh, that we want to establish a platform for know-how sharing in STEM education. So why do we say STEM? Yes, of course, we will work with engineering education development when we also think we should broaden our thinking. So we will also include outreach and attractiveness and see how do we attract students to engineering education. And then we think it's important that we deal with all the subjects that are linked to engineering education. We want uh, to be a network where experiences can be shared and where it's possible to learn from each other. Um, I guess that this event is part of that mission, that we want to meet each other. And of course, we want to meet in reality so we can mingle around as well. Uh, but that will hopefully be next year. So annually, we hope we will have a seminar or we plan to have a seminar where we meet. We also want to be a node for supporting partner universities and external stakeholders by providing information about Nordic STEM education. So we want to go beyond just being a meeting place. We hope that we will also do projects within this network. Uh, we have started a bit with uh, a small project where we have, for instance, mapped how we will, how we do engineering education in the Nordic countries and how students get into engineering education. What kind of education do you need in order to uh, apply for engineering studies? So that survey will hopefully be published at the web page uh, later this year. So, so this is our vision now. Hmm. No, no. Um, so what more? How will we work with this? Well, we have an idea and that is that we should have one theme each year. The theme of this year might, might not be that clear, but we have thought of post-COVID or something, what do we need to know to, in order to pass this pandemic? But what about next year? What theme would we like to have the, then? Uh, we have also stated in a vision that the theme should be decided upon by the members and the members are actually you. So we will hope to get back to this question. I know that we have some time in the end. So I hope that during the day, you will listen to the presenters, but also think about, okay, what do I want to see will happen in the NEE network next year? I guess uh, that's it for now. Uh, this is just the names of the steering committee. It can be good to see that uh, the people who work with this network are from different parts in the northern countries. And I also want to thank Peter Jaronsson, the general secretary of Nordtech, uh, who has, is helping us a lot. So thanks Nordtech for giving us the opportunity to establish this. And thanks all for being here. Enjoy the day. Now back to Jedeminas. Thank you very much, Lena. Uh, maybe not everyone catched. Lena is uh, the chair of this engineering education group. So She's uh, kind of uh, responsible for all this happening. We're happy to have her. Um, and uh, one more time, we had a few questions about the organization. Again, for attendees, there are multiple new people connected. So you have uh, at least two buttons on your screen. Raise hand if you really want to ask a question with your microphone. Uh, but usually just type in your question in the Q&A session. The panelists, the speaker will see that and uh, we will see that and we try to answer it or just pose it to the speaker after the, the, his presentation. Yes, that is absolutely true. And uh, I believe that, uh, well, that was a very beautiful introduction. So maybe we could switch right away to the speeches as such. What do you think? Shall we? Yeah, yeah, we, we should start session one digital. Well, we have a little more time, I guess, right? But uh, uh, yeah, first session, digital engineering workspaces. Sounds interesting. I believe we'll learn a lot of new things today. We already have uh, a few speakers. Uh, 
but I think we will change the program a little bit because the first one is uh, is unfortunately late. Well, that happens. Yeah. Well, so, you know, uh, once again, a kind reminder to mind the time zone. So I think uh, um, Professor Henry Birkelainen is here. Hey, good morning, Henry. Could good you? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Could, could you be kind and help us at switching your place to the? <laughs> And um, we have the honor to begin. For me, it's okay, I, unless the first speaker is here. So um, I'm you. here. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. Um, can I start? So or you sure can how? start. Well, of okay. Course. A lot of volunteers. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll okay. start. With, with... Wish our students were that active. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so then we start with Professor Peter Jan Randewick. I'm sorry about the pronunciations. Uh, actually, we all met like first time, most of us. So sorry about my... Uh... Uh, no problem. Okay, here we go. Yes, so my name is Peter Jan Randewijk. Um, I'm from DTU and I'm presenting a, a digital, our digital labs or remote lab in power system engineering that we've uh, built recently a year or completed uh, actually more than a year ago already uh, so uh, it's remote microgrid lab uh, for stay-at-home experimentation uh, in system engineering uh, power system engineering um, so basically what i'm going to talk about a little bit of background information on remote laboratories in general, the learning outcomes that uh, was that they wanted for, for this specific uh, uh, laboratory, uh, then a little bit of how the setup works and how to operate it. Uh, and then I'll, I'll show you the typical exercise, the, the first exercise, we're planning a lot more, but <laughs> we'll, we've only done one uh, yet. Um, I'll show you that, and then a little bit of results, what we actually wanted from the students, show you, uh, and then I'll give you a live demo as well uh, from, uh, from this um, uh, lab, and a little bit of reflections uh, from what, our, uh, uh, what we've found, um, and then there's a to-do list, and then some questions. Um, oh, it, it seems there's something missing on the bottom of the screen. So basically, a remote laboratory is not a new thing. Uh, it's been a, a revised or rethought now with this COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Uh, but um, I did some studies online when we, we started this, and it's like a, 20 years ago, uh, was one of the first uh, papers published by Gillette. Um, and the, the reason why they did this is, was for distance education and uh, to complement and enhance um, the, the understanding, it was done for control engineering, to reinforce the learning. Uh, so this is also what we want to do today, um, but uh, not for distance education, but due to this COVID uh, epidemic. Um, then there was a lot of disagreement uh, among some people, uh, is this really as effective as, as having a, a real lab? Ah, there's still a lot of uh, discussions about that. But uh, it is very uh, important that we still uh, have even in, in, in this the difficult time that we still have uh, laboratories because that's an essential part for undergraduate and even graduate training. Um, so um, if we can't have the students to meet physically, we must uh, sort of have them think <laughs> that they're in contact with a real app. And this is basically what a remote lab is. They sit behind their computers and they're in contact with a real lab. Uh, and uh, yes, as you can see, actually, this was also, people also thought about this in 2015. As, as again, what this was for remote uh, or for distance education. Uh, so uh, the problem with remote labs, however, it's, it's not that easy to, to do. And uh, there was a nice uh, article about Ma Nicholson. Uh, you can also read in my, um, uh, bibliography, I'll, I'll, I'll share my slides with you. It was a very nice study where they did a comprehensive analysis of all the remote and distance labs. And um, what it is, I think I can't remember, like 60, 60 different citations. They went through all this, all this uh, literature on what people have done. And I think you will find much newer as well. But this was when we, we started off last year 
uh, when the COVID just started, <laughs> uh, much more research has in the last year been done on this. Um, and but the problem was there's no off-shelf uh, systems available. So uh, basically you have to do it yourself. Uh, and this is basically what I did. Uh, but um, the big thing is we, um, with this lab, uh, luckily our lab is such that we it's not just for remote, but it's, it, it switches very easily to remote uh, understanding. And uh, it's to focus the conceptual understanding. Uh, and there's also some professional skills that, that students can develop with, with this remote lab. And the, another thing that there was a more recent study is that um, some of these labs that we have is, is it's actually a little bit removed from, from a real industry. So what you see in the lab, all the wires and stuff, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to say how, how is this what we're doing here in the lab related to what is going on in the real world. And actually with the lab we built and actually it, it actually made it very easy then also to do it, uh, make it a remote lab, is that what we have now is a thing that relates to industry very, very, very nicely. It's almost like, a, we'll see it later, it's like, like almost like you, you operating the SCADA interface controlling remotely uh, this, 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 this power system. Um, and there's also some other things that, uh, that, that from, from a study that it helps also this collaborative working people from different places are working together on, uh, on, a, on a piece of ex, uh, um, equipment a lab, uh, lab equipment, and uh, th there's some other things that also develop from that. But uh, the big thing from all the labs is that we want to reinforce and improve the understanding of concepts. Um, so when uh, I started with this microgrid, uh, it was a very humble beginning. Uh, although I call it microgrid lab, the microgrid has got a different uh, meaning for different people. But basically the grid that we built, uh, this is a paper I presented last year at the CEFI conference, it's just a micro version of the traditional grid. And uh, the reason why we did this is, is again to reinforce uh, the under basic understanding of what our grid, the traditional grid operates. Uh, yes, so, but this, this, you can read a lot online of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of, of these things. So, um, Another thing that was apparent um, and uh, when, when we looked at labs is that there's a general lack of hands-on experience in, in, in power engineering. So a lot of power engineering education reverts to just simulations, power factory simulations, VSCAD simulations. Uh, but we wanted to, to do something differently. Um, and, um, and also we wanted, there's a lot of, um, different subjects that, that it's compartmentalized when the students look at it. There's electric machines and there's control systems and there's power engineering and there's protection. Uh, and how does machines and power engineering relate together? So we wanted to, to tie all, all these things together. Um, so, we, so all these different subjects, uh, we want to have this common ground in Danish to have the same uh, a red thread. We wanted to have this red thread going through, through all of these courses. And we wanted to emphasize the relationship between uh, synchronous machines um, and the grid. Uh, and also uh, when we started with this, there's actually some of other things that you can, you can do in a little bit of uh, physics uh, that we taught about core saturation. You can now very nicely see that. And how do you parameterize a synchronous machine, the whole synchronization process. Uh, they talk a lot in the power industry. Oh, it took so long time to synchronize this with the grid. How does it work? And active power flow, uh, core losses, efficiency, all of these things. Uh, and then in power engineering, this thing of over and under excited when you have synchronous machines and reactive power flow. Uh, and, and this concept of four quadrant uh, power flow, where you have active power flowing in one direction, reactive flow of flowing in a different direction, and you can change them. And actually, it showed from, from this, this experiment that students still have some perception uh, problems uh, understanding this. Uh, and also some, some other more advanced direct and quadrature theory, uh, synchronous condensers, which is also now becoming quite uh, uh, popular and then also this graphical representation using phaser diagrams instilling some basic skills in the students uh, and then also tied in with a PID control uh, and governor operation 
bring in a little bit of control systems in, in power engineering, and then uh, more advanced stuff like automatic voltage regu uh, regulators and, and so forth. So uh, typically uh, what we didn't want is, this is one of our setups that we have very nice for students hands on, you plug these wires in into a meter and then into a, a, a power electronic converter. And if, if you've got a PLC, how do you control things? And then your motor, everything is, is, is wired. Um, but this is difficult to, to operate a, some experiment like this, uh, although very, very handy uh, remotely. So we decided to go more for an for a industrial look. Uh, this active learning experience that closely matches real life engineering implementation. Uh, and then we also thought, but if you do that, you can also add some other stuff to this to this course, maybe uh, at a later stage. How, how do you design a control cabinet and how do you do it according to uh, the 6617 uh, uh, standard of, of, of drawings and the referencing? And how do you implement a project in a PLC using um, higher level programming languages like, like structured text, um, field bus? So we have a, actually a, a, th a thing in the lab that looks like industry and how and which is done according to industrial standards, uh, not just an experimental thing with wires and, and, and things. Um, and there's also how to design a graphical user interface, SCADA, and all of these things that we would, that that we store uh, on our sort of to do list. So basically, yes. So how do you draw it? So you can you can show them a, a real life drawing. Uh, this is from ePlan. Uh, and this is how it looks like. And you can actually build a course around that, um, high level programming, how do you design a GUI? And there's also some very nice tools that ABB has for the uh, AVR, which is actually at the heart of our, pro uh, of our project, uh, which is exactly the same exciter system they use in, in small uh, power stations uh, or emergency supplies, emergency, um, uh, uh, what they call null for sitting there. In, 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 in hospitals and such. And uh, they come with a lot of instruments where you can tune PIDs and set parameters, look at the Modbus. Uh, there's actually a lot of things that you can do when you have this, this higher level um, thing, um, um, design experiment. So basically what we, what we thought out, we said we wanted to simulate a, a small mini grid where we have three power stations or three, in our case, three generators or machines connected to a bus bars connected like this and there's the rest of the grid so this this forms a mini grid and if you if you if you open the circuit breaker you have a, a micro grid here uh, no renewables just just traditional uh, uh, generators at this point in time so there you can see the nice industrial rook nice cabinets uh, this is the master cabinet switching all of the things together uh, if, you, if you just go back so this is the master cabinet how we can do the switching um, and uh, then the other three cabinets are each for each three machines. So what the students can do uh, for, for um, when a, we, we can accommodate three groups, one group log into this panel, one group to this panel, and then they can work with, with these three machines separately. Basically how it looks inside that first panel, yeah, we still have some space to simulate line impedances, but there's all the connectors to connect them together. You can see from industrial perspective, this is typically what you will what we'll see in a, in a real real life scenario. Here is our control cabinets for the for the for the for the machine control. Uh, yeah, this is not what you typically will see, but this uh, is is the inverter that controls um, the induction machine that acts as the um, mechanical front end, the, the gas turbine or the diesel or, or the steam turbine. Uh, these are also bi-directional, so we can actually have these machines operating as a load, not just as a, as a, as a generator source. So we can have this four quadrant of power flow, uh, also with active and, and, and reactive power. Uh, for uh, This is some of the people that is in power engineering will recognize this, but this is for, for just to look at the synchronization. Uh, if we have uh, yeah, that doesn't work for remote labs, but when the students are, are here, uh, there's the um, uh, panel interface uh, that the students can use if they're in the lab itself. But very, but it was very nice is this also allows for um, uh, web server interface, so so we can operate this this lab remotely. Uh, some power meters, input power, output power, uh, and these are also fed into this. Uh, Panel, so you can also access the, the readings uh, remotely. 
so there's our 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 heart. <laughs> well, okay. uh, this I said also the, the exciter is a heart, but basically here's our three synchronous machines. Uh, our traditional grid works, and there's our three um, induction machines. That is the, the the prime mover. But as I said, this can also work in opposite direction. So we can actually uh, usually we, we operate this guy as, as a load, and these two as generators. And we can demonstrate a lot of a lot of things if we do a lab demonstration. Uh, you can see also there's some inertia, so we can also have one without inertia, so we could also do some inertia testing, uh, but that is also on the to-do list for later. So basically what it is, is each screen has got this uh, web interface uh, where the students log into with the username, I give them the password, and there's also a, a video link where you can actually see, see the machines, how they operate. Uh, there's a chat message. Oh. No problem. Um, it was not, yes. Uh, so here is the interface, web interface to showing the machines. Unfortunately, we the, the view is a bit, bit skewed, so we can only see two, the students can only see two of these uh, machines. Uh, there is where they log in to the system. And then once they've successfully logged in, they, they'll see a screen like this. Um, and then, yeah. And on the next screen, there's some measurements from the from the exciter unit, and this is the one meter that was on the left panel. So this and this is the meter, the input and output power. Uh, well, depending on how, how you define uh, the power flow, um, and uh, you can see some of these things are crossed out. Uh, they don't give very accurate results because what is important is this unit troll exciter unit that we're using is a real life. Um, Exciter unit that is used in the megawatt range for 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 um, synchronous machine control. So it's a little bit inaccurate. Uh, this is why we have this smaller uh, meters in it. Um, also, the meters were were connected like um, into the machine, um, so you get negative values if it's supplying uh, active or reactive power. Uh, and that was actually one of the concepts that the students struggled a bit with, but uh, eventually got got around got around this. So for the first exercise uh, that we, or the lab exercise that the students were doing remotely, uh, they logged into the system and then they controlled the machine and determined this open system characteristic, the short circuit characteristic, and then they calculated the, 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 the uh, D-axis synchronous reactance of the machine, the parameterization, and then they had to operate this machine in, in six different modes and then draw the phaser diagram for that. And also, uh, once they've drawn the phaser diagram, they from the phaser diagram they had to calculate this this induced voltage uh, in the machine, and then uh, from the handbook uh, you you get this formula. Uh, and if you've correctly calculated this and you and you plug it into this 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 formula for for uh, power flow, uh, you should get the power that you've measured. Uh, so this is sort of a check if if have I done my 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 calculations and my drawings correctly. Uh, it uh, obviously assumes that they've taken the measurements correctly, but that is just a screenshot, luckily, from, from the online um, um, uh, diagram um, interface. So here is typically results that they would have got when they do the open circuit characteristics. They, they can see the machine saturates. This is all the measurements they would take. Um, and then they do a curve fitting there for, on the linear part. They can do also a curve fitting here. Uh, on, on to determine exactly the voltage where they want to operate. Uh, this is the short circuit characteristic, which is very interesting. Uh, and you can do the, the theory about why is this linear and that, that doesn't saturate with the students. And this is typically for the six operating conditions, the measurements they would take. And then, then this is the calculations that I expect from them, uh, uh, from them depending on, on, on what it was, they, what they should get out. And then the typically phaser diagrams that shows all these operating conditions, which uh, tells me a lot, maybe not for all, all of you out there, but uh, this, is, this is what I, I wanted the students to see. So uh, we've got a demo time. I'm running a little bit late. Uh, let me just see. So here I'm logged in. Um, this is, there's the machines. This machine is actually already running. Um, so a little, maybe a bit difficult to see that it's running. And this is the typical interface. So this is my interface where I uh, connect uh, all of these things together. Uh, I can switch off all the power on and off. So this, this is, looks like the, 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 the power grid we have. And then the students will see something like, oops, they have to log in. Okay, this is the admin password. Uh, they have to log in. 
and uh, then they will see something like like this. So I go through explanation how it works. It's, it's maybe a little bit in intimidating, but uh, yeah, in, in real life, all these control panels are also actually <laughs> a little bit intimidating. So they have to enable the machine. It's enabled. I've put on the power. They have to start it. And there the machine starts. They can see the feedback. Uh, basically, one of these, this is actually the machine that you can't see that that is now, now starting up there. And then we can sit, put on the excitation. They have to do it manually uh, by setting the set point. But I can, this is auto set point there, where we slowly increase the excitation on the machine and the output voltage uh, increases. And actually what this will do, it will automatically, once the voltage is correct and the frequency is correct and the, there's the angle difference is, is zero, it will automatically synchronize the machine with the grid. So I've already started these other machines. So these machines are already synchronized with the grid. These also synchronized with the grid. Um, yeah, so now I've got basically sort of a, a, a mini, can't I move this? This is now in the way. I move it a little bit out of the way here. Um, yes. So uh, yeah, it ac actually happens very quickly. Doing it manually is, is a bit more time consuming. But this is what the students have to do in 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 the in the online lab. They have to manually adjust this current setting, manually adjust the speed a little bit up down so that it matches the the the, mach the machine frequency and the grid frequency match. Uh, yes, so uh, it takes them some time. Uh, and also, yeah, which I didn't show you them, they meticulously have to, to, to also increase this voltage, uh, the set point for the, for the current, measure the voltage, apply a short circuit, measure the current to, to parameterize the machine. And after they've parameterized the machine, then, then again, they have to, uh, change this uh, to get this 400 volt out and then change the speed of the of the system to 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 match uh, this, this this criterion for for synchronization so this is all the theory that that emphasizes the theory but um, yes so this is the experiments and then basically uh, then they have to operate the machine at, at different power levels so uh, we you can actually um, say uh, minus uh, let's say three, uh, uh, actually uh, 3,000. So uh, now this, it will change the, the, the reference to the uh, inverter uh, to change the power output to the inverter. And basically with the emphasis to put in three, uh, sorry, they, it will, there's a PID, this PID is very slowly on, on this machine. Uh, the governor controller it will slowly uh, try to to get this power to to 3000 uh, watts it's minus so we we um, we're delivering power to to the network so uh, after the students have done this experiment uh, actually i say okay now let's let's demonstrate a microgrid um, where I, what i'm going to do i'm going to uh, supply two kilowatts there three kilowatts there and draw five kilowatts there and switch off this infinite bus so that we have now our, our grid there in the middle. So let's let's try and do this. So I'm going to say, oops, I say, I want you to draw 5,000 watts and I want you to deliver, say minus 3,000 watts. And uh, yes, I'm going very fast now. Uh, we have limited time. So if you're overwhelmed, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, um, but uh, if you're in power engineering, maybe you you, you understand what what is what what we try to do here. So what we're doing, we're putting in two kilowatts there, three kilowatts there, drawing five kilowatts there, and uh, now if if we look at the at the system, the frequency is, is is stable, and I can even switch off this this bus. So there, it's off, green, safe. So now we have a have a microgrid here, and and this so. This is a demonstration part after the students have done their, their experiments. I can, I can show them uh, what, what happens now. Let's say when we increase this to 6,000 watts. So now we're drawing 6,000 watts, but we're only supplying three there and two there. What will happen in the grid 
is we will experience that the frequency starts to drop 49 and it's going down the frequency is going down so we've got some problems if this was a real grid uh, you will have this shutdown of under frequency relays tripping the system um, but luckily um, real oh what's going on here uh, go away uh, but luckily in a, in a in a real grid there's a thing that they call droop control where we, if we switch to droop control and this is what the governor does in in a, in a power system uh, it actually and you can set what the droop must be two percent or three percent what this done it actually sees as the frequency starts to fall it knows that the, the power system is under stress and it automatically adjusts the reference signal the the what we call the dispatch points uh, to increase the power and basically what this will do it will bring the frequency back up so where the frequency was falling to almost going to 48 now the frequency is only a 0.13 uh, hertz drop uh, which it's difficult to do these kinds of experiments if, if you don't have a setup like this uh, showing students how this droop work and also the sharing how the sharing work between uh, between a three percent droop and a two percent droop uh, but you will see if we add this value to 2650 with this value 3, 4, uh, almost 50, uh, then that will add up to the new 6, six uh, kilowatts we draw. And we all can also go the other way if we if we reduce this now to 4, kilo, uh, four, four kilowatts, uh, then you will see that the frequency will, will rise and it will actually go to above 50 hertz. And as soon as the frequency goes above 50 hertz, these other two machines will actually start to decrease the set point. So you you have normal dispatch points for all your power stations, and uh, and this this droop work work on this frequency. If the frequency goes too high, you actually too likely load it, and you must you must lower your set points. Then you can also take this machine that we have here, uh, and we can basically play in manual mode with the uh, set point, uh, the, the excitation. And as soon as we, we, we play with the excitation, we will notice here, if I go there, that our reactive power, we, we, we change our, uh, the reactive power starts to increase. So now we're drawing a lot of reactive power uh, on this, our load here. Oh, this thing is all in the way the whole time. Uh, this load um, is, is drawing a lot of reactive power. Yeah, it's just hidden behind here. Or maybe if I click there, it goes away. Yes. So now we're drawing a reactive power what does that mean? We need power factor correctioning because we can see our voltage starts to fall. And again, uh, this whole thing of, of, of reactive power in the grid is now very nicely demonstrated in, in this lab. And what our um, uh, generator needs to do here is we need to put it in VAR control or uh, sorry, auto uh, automatic uh, AVR control and say, I want you to regulate the voltage at 400 volts. And I can do this the same for this, for this power station here. Oops, uh, control the voltage to 400 volts. And what it, what you will see is that it, it will slowly, uh, maybe this guy already, uh, it was 1.7. It will try and increase the excitation, increase uh, the reactive power and, uh, in, and uh, the end effect of that will be that the, the voltage in the, in the system will slowly increase. There it goes up 380 very, very slowly. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, even if this guy is underexcited, these guys are, are overexcited. Now they're at 2.2, they, they went up from 1.7. They supply more reactive power into the grid and the voltage in the system is, is, is going up. Uh, so uh, even, yeah, we, we can have our experiments in the lab or remotely and the big, Big thing, uh, the, the bottom line is we want to emphasize the understanding the students have of how a, a real power grid works. And that they can do this now without having to come in. Uh, I can guide them uh, over the web, have three groups working, and then give this demonstration to this class. And I can also demonstrate this in, in my class without having get them to go to a lab somewhere in an online, an online lecture. Basically, yes. Uh, so. There was a lot of things that I, I, I was clearly that students have actually too much hands-on experience in power engineering, three-phase systems, reactive power flow, all of these things. And, and hopefully this experiment uh, sort of um, helped them with an the understanding of this. Uh, also, uh, yeah, the, the problem with, with radians and degrees and phasor diagrams was one thing that we must, must, must address and, and, and 
hopefully this 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 experiments uh, help the students to to understand how to draw phaser diagrams. So the next thing is also to to go and add some some wind turbine emulators. Here's my next project. I'm going to build a wind turbine emulator and battery storage to my microgrid. So it's actually a real microgrid, and also uh, get faster loop times on my PLC to see if we can do some transient analysis. That will really be be nice. Um, yes. Uh, so questions. <laughs> that was a very fast. I think we've got five minutes left for questions. Sorry about. I think it was agreed at 10 minutes or something like that. Wow. Thank you very much, Peter. That was really impressive. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> I'm not sure what your students will say about <laughs> your course. Yeah. Yes, I, I go I go much slower with them. So we have sure. we have 10 minutes for a demo, but but uh, the whole thing is is building a real life grid that looks like the real thing out there and giving them as they press buttons. Hope I, I try to make it student proof so nothing blows up. Actually, mm. uh, because we have got a camera on there, I tell them this is not a simulation. This is real life machines. If there's smoke coming out there, then you've blown up something. <laughs> yeah. So for our uh, listeners, uh, this is going to be recorded. So those are electrical engineers. They can look into details and see all the equations Peter showed later. But for now, I would ask, so how students reacted? Because you did a lot of work. That's that's perfect for distant learning. But how did they react? Does it work? Do they like it, or they really want to go to the to the real laboratory? And they, you know, uh, uh, the students. Uh, the last year when I did the first time, they said that it would be nice to see a, have a camera there. So I've put a camera there, but maybe I need more cameras, different views. Um, uh, but the interesting thing is when they stand in front of the, the, the touch panel, they see there's the buttons on the touch panel, things going on, uh, or sitting in front of the PC and, and clicking with their mouse. It's, it's basically the same interface. So uh, even students that actually went, there's one group that got permission, so they, uh, <laughs> that went into the lab, but basically they didn't sit in front of the machines. They sit in a different classroom and on their PCs, they were operating the machine in the laboratory next door. So it was basically the same if they were sitting in the laboratory, one, one laboratory on or sitting at home with a cup of coffee in front of at, at the dining room table and operating a lab. Uh, I think they got the same experience uh, doing the measurements and then getting these these visual phaser diagrams and, and trying to understand how things work i mean yeah, that is that is that that was the bottom line that i wanted uh, thinking of the measurements i take and what does it mean what what does all these numbers tell me uh, so i think they would have gotten the same same experience had they had they been physically in the lab wow so that's essentially the same you well uh... You say that there's no real difference and they kind of feel the same. So that system, electrical system management, well, they can learn it in distant way with their computers and that's mm. essentially the same, right? So they would yeah, do so, so if, the same if, in if, the laboratory, right? Yeah. So, so also what is, as I said, this active learning experience, if they were to work at, at a big place like like uh, Arstel or something and they had a power station that they would operate, they would also sit in a room with a computer screen and they would operate a generator and an excitation and all these things. So this, this gives them like a mini version of the real life experience that, that how, how, if I go out there and I, I practice my engineering, I, I will get the same experience. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's just more of a controlled environment with a little bit more safeties built into the system. Thank you so much, Peter. Just one question from the audience. Uh, so uh, the question is as following. Do the students actually record their screen while acting uh, just for the reflection purposes and for, let's say, inclusion into their reports of the lab work? Yeah, so uh, they did screen captures. So they captured the, so actually that measurement screen mm -hmm. with all the numbers on it. So. Uh, they they could just capture that screen capture and get all the uh, measurements and then they use this in their report writing to 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 use that numbers uh, for their calculations i don't know if that is actually answering the question it wasn't a physical recording they recorded my my, my explanation of how all the interface works because uh, what button must i press again or what light is this so yeah that, that they recorded so they can go go back okay thank you very much peter i remind the the audience that you can also participate in the discussion in the end of the session and maybe peter if you'll have time will answer more of your questions yes and uh, now we're yeah all right and actually one more the very very last no. question uh 
Chrome, uh, uh, which was asked for. Uh, you haven't shown any graphical information to the students uh, to follow the changes in the system. So that was the question. Or did you actually show that? Uh, yes, basically. So it is a fixed system. Um, and you only control it is these reactive the active and reactive power flow so there's no physical changes it's just a system connecting to this to the network and then you change the set point uh, the active power set point and the reactive power set point uh, so, so, so so yeah as a typical system would work so right, thank and, you so uh, that is what you had to understand <laughs> what the effect of all these things are in the network all right. Thank you, Peter, so much. It was a pleasure to listen to you. And uh, the only thing which I may say is that, well, the future is really here. Yeah. And now we're happy we have uh, Professor Ryder. So we, we go back to our initial uh... plan. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Professor Ryder, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And first of all, let me apologize for this uh, time zone confusion. And considering that I've just... Uh, been through a, a collaboration with the University of Tartu, I should have known better, I can only tell you that. So my only vague ex excuse is that this is actually my birthday, so uh, <laughs> happy birthday to me and, and happy birthday. Well, congratulations. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let's see now, I think we're going to go for this one. Um, I hope that you see my uh, PowerPoint uh, right now. What should we think of when we design new spaces or redesign old ones? And this is uh, um, sort of a philosophical uh, reasoning and thinking and reflection upon these matters. And first of all, let's start with this. Learning in higher education, as we all know it, uh, used to look like this a lot. There was a number of people sitting in a room and listening to somebody doing a presentation. This clearly is a presentation more, possibly more than uh, a teaching learning situation, but we're very familiar with this situation. So what should we do in the future? Uh, first of all, I think that we can recap some situations that most of us have uh, uh, experienced. And we know where we have uh, planned for our students to discuss in small groups, but they stay silent. It can be very, very hard to uh, persuade students to partake in discussions between themselves. And, they stay silent, they've uh, come into the room, they stay far apart if they're in an auditorium like the one we saw just now. Students tend to sit in clicks, small groups in different parts of the room and it's hard to get them together. Also, if you want to ask uh, questions in class, you usually have the experience that it's the same few students who ask this every time. Um, as, as, as one who talks a lot about this, I'm very grateful to J.K. Rowling for introducing Hermione Granger in the Harry Potter book, because she's the kind of student who always answers all the questions. We've seen that. I, if you want students that work together on the task, it's very common, and I think that we've done so ourselves when we were students and even pupils, that we divided the tasks between us. We didn't really work together on them. And all of these things are challenges that we know are there. So how can we address this? Uh, traditionally, we've sort of said that, well, they're grown ups, they learn sooner or later, they will. And, and over a period of three to five years, many students do manage this, but we will have to uh, acknowledge that we could do a better job out of this. So if you look at this, we know something. And student active learning is one of the approaches that's really important for this to happen. And one definition of many is that it's an educational method in which students are involved in higher order thinking, such as analysis, synthesis, evaluation. And we know that student active learning also is, some, is, is, is uh, uh, in line with um, emphasizing time on task. Uh, it's about encouraging active learning and it's about collaboration, cooperation among students to discuss. One of the most important things that students learn from students is just turning to your mate and asking the simple question, did you understand what it was that we were going to do? What, what is expected from us? Did you understand this? How should we, what should we do? That's sort of the, the negotiation that is ongoing. And I think that we should spend more time answering these questions. Now, may it seem as, a, as an odd thing that I talk about this situation before I start talking about redesigning rooms. Basically, 
the space we're learning in, the space we're teaching in, is governed by how we learn and what we need our students to learn. And since uh, what we need them to learn is something far more complex than mere knowledge, than mere skill sets, they need to be able to put the knowledge and the skill sets into a greater context. And that means that we want to develop competencies. And competencies rely on knowledge, competencies rely on skill sets, but there are more things that makes up a competence. So contextual learning is another term that comes up and it's about the approach that, I see that I've written this uh, <coughs> last night without uh, uh, looking for the, the uh, correcting the text. It aims to, for students to apply knowledge and skills in situations that are as real world relevant as possible. So we're dealing with a, a, trying to set up something that's a real world problem to real world solution. And uh, considering that most of our school years are spent in spaces like this, and we're still doing that in university, you might wonder if, if there's some sort of mismatch between the way that we have done things and that indeed we ourselves have learned it and the way that might be an improvement on the current situation. So taking this into mind, there is a... Um, an activity going on in Norway, where indeed the Ministry of Education wrote a white paper a few years ago, where they stated that they expected academic communities to make use of using of using of use of uh, teaching approaches where students have an active role, using appropriate digital technology to a much greater extent than today. So there is a top-down support from the highest level that we're dealing with here in Norway. And at uh, my university, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, NTNU, there is a campus development going on. So these are pictures from different spaces uh, around uh, our university where we've redesigned mostly uh, old spaces in, in different ways. We are currently working on building new houses where we're designing from scratch, so to speak. And it's about establishing learning spaces. And a learning space is not just the classroom, the auditorium, it's also the conjoined spaces, the next, the spaces outside the learning rooms where students congregate to drink coffee, to do group work, to uh, study and so forth. So it's about establishing learning spaces for students that are based on experience, what works, and research. There's a lot of research going on, to, gone, going on into learning spaces. And this is, this is at the heart of the matter. We know a lot about things that will facilitate learning, higher learning, learning that deals with analysis, reflection, creativity, and so forth. And we also need, of course, to develop sustainable technological support solutions because the software can be horrendously both difficult to deal with and, and uh, expensive to, to renew over the time. And in doing so, we need to try out different approaches. And I like Peter's presentation just now, it's something that sort of challenges what we've done before, it takes us into new places, and also expands the idea of what the learning space is. It's not just an auditorium, it's not a space with set uh, lab desks and so forth. So what is it that characterizes these spaces? This is uh, an architect a sketch from, a, for, from one of our new places. You see that we have screens, there are group tables around, and uh, this clearly affects both what the students do in terms of learning and what we as teachers can and should do, and it changes the roles of both teacher and students. So a few words about that. First, the technology. As you see in this sketch, there is a screen there, and there's a possibility of using smart boards and screens so that you have shared areas where you can discuss things, but sometimes a whiteboard is enough. We know that. A number of us are been, have been working in an engineering fields, so and we know that, that uh, you know that an engineer has a, a blank piece of paper, a blank wall, and a chalk or, or a white the board uh, pen or, or just the pen and paper, we sketch out things, we analyze, we understand problems, we suggest uh, 
uh, solutions. We, we, we sketch uh, uh, a lot of things using that. We're very, very visual, not just with math, but with, with sketches of, of how things get together. So this is in part a really central tool that our students should get access to in a much more organized way than what has been in the past. But you don't necessarily need the smart board, you don't necessarily need the screen, you don't even necessarily need the whiteboard as long as you have the table. In many ways, the table where students are facing each other is one of the most radical things that can happen in the room. So what about students and these spot draws? Is this simple sketch of some students looking at a, a, a screen or a smart board? And what they're saying is that you're sharing the text, you're sharing the problem, you're sharing the challenge, you work together. And if you take that one away, it's just a room where each one of the students sits on working on each task that they have. They may sometimes ask their buddy or a mate, uh, are you working on the same problem? What did you do in that step and so forth? So this screen, this area, this projected area defines in many ways what these students are working with. And they're working on the same problems and they're working together. So it's a, it's a radical reframing. It's, it's student work, students working as a team, not just as members in a group. And this is a very nice shift, and it's a very simple one to address. A colleague and friend of mine working at the University of Minnesota has said that uh, as a teacher, we shouldn't waste time informing our students when we could work with them. So he's, he's a firm believer in getting students to arrive at class having prepared with the text. And there's a number of ways of dealing with that. I'm not going to go into those, but those are equally important in this kind of, of, of setup. Further students' voices are, we get to take part in the subject, we work with the subject, and this is a new experience to the student. You get a completely different opportunity to actually talk to the teacher. They are available. Uh, the threshold for asking questions to the teacher is so much more lower and it's safer to ask questions in here. A number of students across the years have, have reported in different settings that asking a question in a class of 100 students is very uh, scary, basically, because a question implies that you don't know, that you don't understand, and a great number of students over the years have thought that they are the only one in this room out of 100 that don't understand. And they don't want to, 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 to show that to each other, so they stay silent. And that's one of the reasons why students in a big group stay silent. There are differences in different, across the student cultures in different countries, but it, at the heart of it matter, you have the, the, the fear of being, of being exposed as less knowledgeable than your mate. It's also interesting to, 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 to understand and think about this. Students repeat study behavior learned in the class out, outside class. If we sanction, if we teach our students that it's all right to collaborate, to work together, they will work together outside class. If we imply by having them sitting more or less alone and next to each other in a big auditorium, and all conversation, all communication is between the single student and the lecturer, the chances are that they go back home to the study room and like a medieval monk, sits down with the text and works that alone. So it's quite ironic because we know that student faculty contact and time and relevant feedback are among the most important aspects of learning. And particularly when we're dealing with complex tasks and complex issues and highly integrated skill sets. So uh, why do we keep the teacher away from the student? Why not design the room so that teachers can uh, get access to all the students or vice versa, the student get access to all the, the, the teachers? But it also changes the role of the teacher. So not only an expert, it's the foreman of the work, it's a dialogue 
with the ongoing dialogue between teacher and the students in groups and individually. It's a supervisor, it's a coach. It's, it's uh, somebody who, whose role in the room and in the learning situation is entirely different. You can challenge students much easier if you do that in this sort of setting than if you stand center stage in a big auditorium saying, I expect you to do stuff. So what's required to do this? Well, first of all, it's highly important that you have leadership support. Somebody has to pay for these rooms. Somebody has to say that it's all right to build them. Somebody has to say that it's desirable. We have that at the moment in many places in Norway. And I've seen rooms like this at, at, at three or four, at, at the three and four, three or four different universities that I visited over the past two or three years. It's about the knowledge, both, of course, the didactic content uh, knowledge that, that, that is a subject matter, but that's in place. That's the least of our worries. Our teachers are experts in their subject matter. But there is something about the pedagogy of the situation. How can this be designed so that students learn more and more difficult things? There is about support as well. So that you need support, pedagogical support, if you're not a pedagogue yourself. And that has to be directed towards students learning and recognizing the teacher as well. The other part is that you need technical support. You need somebody that can ask easily, how does this work? What is the software? What is the hardware? How should I use this? And it's about collaboration between teachers. You need to work this as a team. You need to be able to discuss with your colleagues about how should I do this? I ran into this challenge. What have you done? And so forth. And presently, well, collaboration between teachers could be improved in many aspects and in many places, I think, across most universities. And finally, you need time to reflect. What worked? What, why did it work? What didn't work? Why didn't it work? What can I do different next time? What should I do the next time that worked this time? And also, time to consult your colleagues and time to consult what's published about these things. So. I'd like to some closing in here because I'd, I'd rather have discussion than presentation here. So I'm closing in here and saying that remember this, the space may be new also to your students. If you have students who've spent the first year sitting in an auditorium coming from, from secondary school, from high school to university, you go from small classes of say 30 people to big classes of 100 to 200, 300, even more. And you sit there more or less anonymously in a big room and it's a very, paradigmatic shift for the student to go from, from, from secondary school to university. And they learn, we learn, that this is the way you do it at university. So if you wait for a year and then try to place them in more active spaces, there will be some pushback from students saying, this is not how it should be done at university, say for instance. But it's also the fact that they're in an entirely new learning situation. So you really do need to have the discussion with the students. What, what, what are the roles? What has shifted? And have that dialogue. And you have to also explain why do we do this? Why is this good for learning? What are the expectations? And how should you organize group work? Here's an excellent possibility of dealing with things like peer evaluation and peer instruction. We know from, from, from a number of sources that peer feedback, feedback in all its shapes are among the most important tools for learning and especially learning the complex issues that we want our students to learn at university. By changing this, we may end up in the situation that those who come after us are far better at everything that we are good at. So, so that, that, that is basically one of my, my driving forces throughout my life to see to, the, to it that those who come after me do it better than what I have done. So if culture permeates the walls. We're talking a lot about culture eating, e e strat culture eating strategy for breakfast, but, and, and the culture is just in the walls. But if culture permeates the walls, like this situation, this traditional situation, what happens if we redesign the space? This used to be a traditional auditorium. We rebuilt it at the NTNU. So we, it was a room for 260 students. Now it's a room for 160 students. And it's not perfectly ideal, mostly because it's been redesigned. It wasn't designed for this in the first place. But the main thing that this room does is 
that it, it changes the relationship that we as teachers or teaching assistants have with the students and the relationship the students have with another. They work together on problems and you see here on the walls, you have a, a common screen to the left, you have screens next to each table and there's even whiteboard spaces between the screens and the students can work together and they can hook up to the central screen, they can hook up to their own screen and you can discuss things individually with these students. It does change it. So uh, if you look at this one, I should skip this one. How many man hours do we have here? It's a very passive situation. And the question is, uh, how much activity is there in a usual hall like this? Information in halls like this are a necessary thing sometimes. So we shouldn't stop lecturing, but we should think about when it is necessary to lecture and inform a lot of people. Most of the times at university, students should work and they should work hard. There is a saying, the one who does the work does the learning. And I think that is worth thinking about. So learning is a contact sport. Students should work together. In this picture from University of Minnesota, there is a man in the middle here and he's a teacher and he knows that his design works when he comes up towards the group of students and they tell him to go away because they are working. Uh, I think that this is basically the, the slides that I had intended to show and I must acknowledge the work of two of my colleagues, uh, Gabriele Hansen and Guri Korpos who's uh, been working with these issues for a number of years and uh, uh, this is my uh, attempt of summing up what they have been saying in, 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 a, in a wider context. In essence, if we're going to redesign rooms for learning, we should think about the learning for first and foremost. We should think about the roles in the room, and we should think about how we organize the learning. This room, for instance, is a room for 171 students, and it's working perfectly well. And the teacher is clearly not the center piece of this environment. So um, there, there are, we, we really do need to rethink a lot about this. In fact, the student union at the uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology a few years back uh, said that uh, they, they, they made a decision that uh, as a policy, they said that they did not want any more auditoriums to be built at NTNU ever. I don't know if they still stay by that as a student union. It's always a turnover, but I, I think it, 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 it indicates the shift of attitude among our students as well. So I think I'll stop here, stop sharing, or at least, um, let's see now, at least uh, do the, yeah, I think I'll do that, yes. And um, open for questions. There is a chat comment here, I think. Feel free to ask questions, yes, please do. Uh, I'll keep the slides open if somebody wants to refer to any of them. Uh, Thank you very much, Raider. That's That's a lot to think about. I think this presentation could have been uh, very useful like a, a year or two ago when we had, uh, <laughs> you know, empty universities to, to redesign our spaces. But yeah, my question would be like, well, we have this tendency to have bigger and bigger auditoriums and we and the administration wants, you know, one teacher to teach a thousand students and use maybe flipped classroom methods to, to try to do that. Uh, so what you have shown is that your big auditoriums, the, the big groups of students, they still remain big. There's a lot of students in one room, but they are working in groups. And that seems to me that probably more of the assistance is needed from the from the lecturers. You said, you know, students say that don't don't, don't bother us. We're <laughs> learning ourselves. But like this one. Yeah. So would you in the same time of the lecture? Is it possible to manage a, a multiple group work for one lecturer? I, there is, there is clearly an, an, uh, a limit to how many groups and, uh, and students you can deal with as, as one lecturer. Uh, clearly so. And uh, yes, it helps to be more than one person in a room with, with, with a number of students and number of groups are, are, are 
a very large number. But I think that as one person, this is, this is the workable room, provided that uh, the tasks are appropriate and the students are sufficiently uh, uh, self-governing. One of the things that you, your, your people who design these spaces to think about, this room can be used for students or study places when it's not used for, for uh, teaching learning exercises. That means that you're using the space possibly even more efficiently than you're doing now because an auditorium is quite a useless space when it's not filled with people. So that, that's an argument that can be made. Uh, it's also an argument that can be made that you, you, you probably will need a few lecturing places and there are occasions when it's useful to address 500 or even a thousand people at the same time. But most of those things, there is something that, that, that uh, I've heard about. They call it the internet, uh, that you can actually address a many, very large number of people simultaneously. So uh, it's, it's um, I think there's a Q&A here somewhere. Yep. Uh, yeah, I see this as Lena Gumelius asked, uh, do you see the need of group rooms as well when you're teaching this man? Yes, you do. You definitely, you, should, you, you really do need that. And uh, the, the, how to convince the management of rebuilding. Well, one of the things is that we need to try out these things and, and gain some experience of how it works. And one of the things that you should do is that when you are moving about and making visits to other universities that have designed spaces like this, and there's a great number of them. There is a story that um, this one in particular was inspired by a room at DCU, Danish Technical University, which in turn was inspired by rooms at Purdue University. And uh, I've shown this picture to, to, to the dean at Purdue University who thought that this was a very good idea so that they did develop their rooms further. So this sort of influ influence and uh, inspiration goes around. So. Um, yeah, Hanne Hogland, do you have exercises to do to get the students into the mind of group discussion? Yes, you do need this. And uh, it's, it's uh, something which is, uh, you really do need to address the situation of how should this room work? And one of the things is don't point at a single student. So if you want uh, to get students into the mind of group discussion, you, you, you ask open questions to the students. Never ever ask right, wrong, yes, no, or 2.5 as, as an answer. Ask open questions that deals with issues. And then ask the group if any, if the group has a suggestion after having given them some time to discuss it. And then you harvest a few suggestions and you discuss the solutions so that you get a dialogue ongoing about these. You should you shouldn't you should move away from asking questions that has a right or a wrong answer. I'm looking at the watch now, uh, Alice, I'm getting in outside. I think that uh, the half hour is running out uh, very neatly after that question. That's true, time flies actually. Uh, so as I see, we do not have any more of the questions uh, here and most probably you managed to fit in yourself into those 30 minutes. And uh, <laughs> one more thing, thank you so, so much. It was really great pleasure to listen to you. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much. Yeah. So we're continuing our international journey. We had Denmark, Norway. Now we have a, a, a speaker from Estonia, Professor Tauna. Welcome. Hello. The floor is yours. Hello. Can you see me? Can you hear me? We can see you. We can hear you. And Excellent. you're ready to start. Then I tried to share the screen also as a next step. Well, uh, greetings uh, from uh, Tallinn, and um, nice to be here. Unfortunately, in a virtual way, I have enjoyed Nordic activities uh, in several placements uh, before, So, um, but uh, the times are uh, different. And today's topic is uh, uh, how to make uh, learning of engineering activities uh, uh, more efficient in a virtual way. Um, my background is production engineering, and um, yeah, uh, I'm also head of development of School of Engineering at, at, at Talte. Uh, well, it's it, it's a bird view to the Talte campus, and um, besides um, 
we have a Sierra University uh, and um, yeah, about 10,000 students. Uh, we have also here companies. And one of the companies is producing um, small robots, which are bringing food, pizza, whatever. And um, they are working mostly in the campus territory. And most of our students also are involved because uh, the company is hiring students to be uh, uh, handlers of these small robots. And it's a, today's reality that, that we walk and we share the payments and routes with uh, self-driving small robots, bigger robots, self-driving cars, etc. It also means that um, we should um, give education to students uh, that students can embrace uh, technology uh, as early as, as possible. And in uh, Estonia, we have also a governmental supportive structure. It's a smart industry center, which combines uh, Taltech, uh, Tartu University and, um, and uh, Estonian Life Science University. Uh, so um, it is a view of the real lab. Um, it's Temo Center combining parts of, uh, of FMS, robotics, and virtual and augmented reality. Uh, now, uh, when Corona took place, um, this place was quite empty because students were not allowed uh, to enter to their rooms, um, to restrictions. And we have developed in different uh, directions already several years. And I want to share this experience, uh, uh, what we have achieved. Uh, basically, as a first step, we virtualized uh, all components in the lab. Uh, robot, uh, FMS, all the chairs and tables, computers, and all kind of um, yeah, additional uh, informatics. Well, uh, it is a video showing that um, uh, how it's possible to control the robot uh, by a student using a virtual reality interface. Um, basically, the student can be anywhere, uh, not in the lab, but at home. And we have tested it also remotely uh, from Italy and from US. And yeah, the system like this uh, is working. So basically, the digital twin is created and uh, the interface is located into the virtual reality. So using virtual reality headset is possible to um, control program the robot. So it was the first case study uh, and mostly in doing this were also involved uh, students um, in their uh, Courseworks and diploma works. So we built up the, the full laboratory step by step, uh, uh, digitalizing uh, robots, FMS systems, etc. Uh, here is another example. Uh, we have uh, downstairs a um, free printer of metal, and basically, it's quite dangerous. Uh, technology because it can be flammable. And um, we have developed just kind of uh, augmented reality tool that using the augmented reality uh, classes uh, is possible to uh, speed up the, the, the learning curve. So basically, if you put on the, the smart classes, uh, the smart classes recognize the, the, uh, the pretty code. And basically, according to the code, uh, is giving uh, the student uh, instructions that uh, what are the next step steps uh, uh, student must follow. And um, we have tested this technology also in, in factory floor and, and basically it uh, has a remarkable result that, that uh, yeah, you, can, you can be more effective in, in learning. Uh, and uh, yeah, on the uh, left side of the, of the slide, you can see it's a 3D printed piece. Uh, we, we did it uh, for the one art, if, art monument. So basically, uh, 3D printing uh, can be taught uh, 
uh, in different ways than, than uh, it has been uh, done usually. And the danger basis is that, that uh, the metal powder, if uh, contacting with, with oxygen, can be, can be flammable and uh, therefore it must be handled with, with, with care. Uh, next step was uh, uh, chemification of the environment. Now you can see it's the same lab, but it's um, as a cane. So basically we can make uh, avatar of the student and uh, uh, well, let the student uh, walk through the laboratories. Uh, basically the avatar can be Modified according to the yeah uh, everybody's requests. So, so you can you can uh, uh, choose the gender or the hair color uh, or eye color etc. And uh, walk uh, through the laboratory from one task to another. And um, we also um, are moving uh, out of the labs. So like in real life, if you go from one lab to another, there is a uh, Corridors, there are stairs, and we have also tested that uh, that uh, the model in virtual life is so real that uh, if you put the headset, virtual reality headset, and uh, use the headset only without seeing the, the real world, you can uh, quite quite precisely um, manage to get from one room to another. So uh, such kind of uh, uh, embedded reality, I think, is a, is a vital. Uh, if we want to offer the experience uh, of being at university while not being at university because of Corona or we are offering some kind of distance studies. So basically um, we can create a, a totally supportive environment and uh, basically it's identical to the, to the real environment. Uh, this project is currently uh, on the go and it's supported by uh, Information Technology Foundation uh, for Education of uh, Estonia. Uh, so, uh, when being in the laboratory, we have created also digital twin which works on the mobile phones and tablets. Uh, basically, um, when entering to the uh, digital twin world, uh, student can pick the needed robot. Yeah, there are some examples of uh, robots we have here in our demo center. Plus also we have several mobile robots. Uh, this uh, box spot is our own uh, evaluation and uh, other Robotnik is made in, in Spain. And, uh, we have also this in, in use. And basically, through this, uh, this app, it's possible to take over the robot. And again, basically, it doesn't need the presence in the laboratory. Uh, this digital twin development for the mobile robot was also awarded as a, a second prize at Taltech for the development projects. And um, uh, just um, uh, recently we made some kind of uh, promotional video and uh, the robot itself is, uh, is, uh, will be used in a, a new food factory uh, of Estonia. So you can see that actually this kind of mobile robot is uh, fully functional. It's developed at the university, so all the software is open source. Here you can see so our, our demo lab. And again, um, this kind of development is also uh, made involving uh, our students in course projects and, uh, and uh, final thesis.
the move on robot has uh, has uh, power to uh, uh, to uh, handle uh, about uh, 90 kilograms of the, the load and um, yeah it's a second version uh, already uh, it hasn't been done uh, alone all uh, this uh, we have in uh, Back pocket also European Union support, and uh, one of the projects what was uh, vital is uh, virtual uh, learning factory toolkit, uh, which was developed uh, in cooperation with Taki, Polytechnic of Milano, Chalmers, CNR, and then our university. And basically, it involves uh, three parts: uh, production system design. Uh, virtual and augmented reality and human modeling. And uh, uh, basically we have made available and developed uh, tools which are quite similar of the tools uh, available for, for industrial use. And um, basically um, for students, it's possible to, to download the toolkit and uh, solve the real life uh, uh, tasks in in a virtual environment uh, basically these are three uh, main toolkits uh, there is ontogui it's ontologically basic based graphical user interface uh, there are java modeling tools and uh, apertus vr is uh, um, a special vr solution uh, elaborated by by Stocky, and uh, we have used it in our teaching activities in terms of project uh, in the last three years very successfully altogether. Uh, basically, uh, students uh, work in uh, teams. Uh, they have uh, steps uh, they should uh, uh, follow, and uh, in teams they follows the, the, the path from, uh, from generating some models, analyzing uh, the solutions, uh, making the comparison, testing and validating uh, the solutions. And basically uh, there are four different scenarios, uh, including uh, system monitoring, industrial IT, uh, human sim manufacturing, process design, and uh, manufacturing system reconfiguration. Uh, we have tested it in in, uh, in physical meeting in uh, Budapest. Uh, uh, then uh, the next two years, uh, Corona may change it, but but uh, the software tools were already so advanced that uh, last year we tested it uh, in uh, mostly on based on political uh, demolition and general use cases. And this year, uh, the main uh, task was, was uh, Taltech and uh, students uh, solved uh, uh, tasks uh, uh, to uh, reconfiguring uh, test of didactic systems uh, according to the uh, products uh, described uh, by professors. And basically you can see that uh, uh, there are real life uh, uh, physical models, but the students were already uh, equipped with, with uh, digital tools. So uh, by the end of uh, the, the education training, uh, each team composed uh, own so a solution. And here you can see that, uh, that uh, what is the solution, uh, for example, in this uh, case, one case study looking like, like that uh, they have uh, analyzed the production system, uh, configured it and uh, made all kind of uh, needed um, calculations and cost estimations in a group work. And basically, as it happened all in Corona time, there was no physical meetings at all, all uh, meetings. Uh, and uh, by the way, the, the students were working in, in mixed groups. So uh, there were different universities uh, uh, involved in um, uh, teamworks. Uh, so um, 
the tools can be used and downloaded from, from the homepage VLFT EU. And um, uh, they are currently already available. Uh, and here you can see the, the, uh, one result of uh, the homework to uh, institute, which is FESTA system. Uh, there was uh, uh, elaborated uh, the shortest uh, time for manufacturing. Uh, besides, uh, we had another supportive project, uh, uh, TEFIC, it's Transforming Educational Programs for Future Industry 4.0 Capabilities, uh, in cooperation with Aalborg, uh, Europe University of Flensburg, uh, Tino Solskjaer, Fakskolen, uh, Thomas More Campus, Denair, and University College of Northern Denmark. And uh, in this, uh, we analyzed the needs of industry, uh, proposed uh, uh, solutions, and uh, in our case, uh, we ended up with a course uh, uh, called digital manufacturing. And um, basically, uh, it's um, a special design course, including uh, uh, industry 4.0 trends, uh, including virtual reality, augmented reality solutions, uh, uh, preparation, also uh, robot system modeling using uh, different softwares and uh, machine vision recognition of technological ob objects. And uh, now we are also moving to uh, recognition of uh, uh, movements uh, of uh, people or uh, workers in, uh, in um, technology. And the main difference uh, from the previous uh, studies is that, that uh, students are working in teams, they are using uh, virtual tools, and basically it's possible to uh, solve the tasks without need of uh, actual uh, visiting uh, physical environments. And uh, here you can see some, some uh, physical environments. Uh, uh, here are professors actually showing uh, what uh, has to be done. And um, uh, you can see that uh, some, some uh, elements of the task of the courses, for example, uh, design of uh, simulation of uh, production system or uh, recognition of, um, of uh, technological objects. We have also here a uh, Daltec uh, uh, self-driving uh, car model developed. So um, basically uh, after passing this course, uh, students are already uh, qualified to work also in development of self-driving uh, cars and robots projects. So we, we educate them also uh, to our needs. Uh, Results and evaluation uh, from students was uh, quite different. Uh, basically, um, they expected uh, a lot of different things when we talked about that, uh, digital manufacturing, what, what it is. And um, uh, the, the opinions uh, were very uh, different. So some people were ready to uh, teach everything that uh, teachers are teaching. And some people just came to make uh, games, and uh, I think um, uh, it's it's a way that that uh, that uh, in digital learning uh, uh, tools you you can you can allow students to make uh, selections, and uh, making mistakes is much uh, cheaper than in in physical uh, teaching. Uh, and um, here is uh, some evaluation by students that the uh, um, uh, total number of students uh, participated in the questionnaire was, uh, was uh, 41 and uh, most of the results were, uh, were quite uh, positive. Uh, also, um, we are now uh, doing uh, research in Estonia and looking also partners from uh, from uh, EU countries, uh, the idea is to go through uh, the needs of uh, industry after Corona. And uh, we have made some uh, online uh, questionnaire uh, and also made quantitative uh, interviews uh, for, for with uh, 
the industrial managers. Um, so uh, we hope that, uh, that uh, we get a um, better view of Estonian needs, that um, how uh, industrial leaders are looking uh, for the, the needs of uh, new digital kill skills after the Corona period and um, willing to also to uh, involve uh, other partners, other universities, other, uh, other countries into this uh, survey. Basically, uh, we have spread the industry 4.0 into uh, small particles and uh, according to each fragment, uh, we have developed um, a set of questions that uh, company who is uh, who is uh, active, for example, in three D printing or in machine vision, uh, can can answer and give uh, their uh, input to the uh, to the survey. And basically, uh, we estimate technology readiness. Uh, we estimate also uh, social expectations and economic needs. And also, we uh, want to reflect uh, the, the, the scientific level and the teaching uh, readiness in universities and colleges. Uh, also, um, we are happy to establish or start uh, with a new European Digital Innovation Hub uh, led by Taltech. Uh, it's called AI Robotics Estonia. And um, you can see so, the main. Uh, uh, focus top. It's, so basically, it's um, related very much of uh, digitalization, and um, again, uh, it's very much connected with uh, with uh, students uh, because we intend to use uh, students in uh, those um, projects. Uh, basically, three D printing, smart grid, digital pins, uh, self driving robotic vehicles, and uh, robotization. That's all. Cybersecurity, AI. They as the topics uh, when um, when um, involving students in, in their real life projects uh, uh, makes uh, also education uh, maybe uh, more uh, complete uh, for students and for for enterprises. So um, it was uh, shortly about um, experience in Taltech. Thank you very much, Tana. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so, so much once again. Uh, really appreciate your effort. And it was really very engaging to listen to you and to see all those uh, futuristic robots which uh, you are being developed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, while we're waiting for the audience questions, so I'll start. Uh, you mentioned gamification, and we hear a lot about that. Uh, how do you see that? Uh, how do you apply that in? Uh, teaching other courses than you know digital manufacturing IT, but can you can we use that for you know teaching um, I don't know civil engineering what what I teach? <laughs> yes, um, we have made one um, uh, educational tool uh, uh, for educating um, how to make um, yeah uh, uh, how to make uh, um, well how to use dynamite. In, in construction engineering, because sometimes you, you, you need to broke the old buildings. And uh, sometimes you, you need to broke uh, yeah, also the, the, the grounds. And, and uh, it's, it's quite, quite dangerous uh, to, to send students to the, to, the, to the areas when you, you make uh, uh, some, some kind of uh, dangerous works. So uh, we have made uh, virtual uh, tools that, uh, that uh, students can put uh, the, the smart classes on and um, uh, lecturer is, is, is telling the, the story on background, but uh, they looking uh, using the smart classes uh, can experience uh, the, 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 the story behind it. Mm -hmm. And we have one question from the audience. Thank you for your answer, by the way. So uh, to, to make it out loud, to, to what extent do you think students can uh, participate in this kind of courses where they uh, use virtual spaces? Is it one course every year or do we aim for even more? Uh, more as they are closer to graduation or maybe the opposite? So that would be the question. Yeah, uh, currently we have one course for bachelor level and uh, advanced course for the master level, but uh, 
as uh, well um, that the tools are quite quite new uh, so we, we we hope to expand it also uh, uh, to um several several other, other courses Thank you so much. And we have one more question. So the digital twin lab uh, that was made for virtual reality, who made this external collaborations or did you have the expertise in-house to set the aside time to make these twin labs? Yeah, uh, basically it's it's uh, in-house. Uh, uh, we, we started with, uh, with doctoral students, uh, then we incorporated uh, master and bachelor level students who were interested enthusiast and so it has been developed uh, uh, during the last uh, yeah, four or five years uh, and I think uh, technically we have all uh, computers uh, and tools uh, what uh, what on the, on the market so it's a fun for students and uh, basically uh, I, I see that it's a, it's a future and um, uh, it was also very very useful uh, in times of Corona that uh, we were able to offer the, the alternative tools for real visits to the, to the laboratories. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, you say it's the future. <laughs> so again, uh, the in the Corona times, the, the the distant learning, how was that different? Uh, I mean, could you could you continue with those courses? Because still, you have those cool laboratories and those three D printers. How do you manage that? Have you uh, continued education at full full extent, or? Yeah, I I, I believe that that uh, so the influence will remain, and as, as, as the tools are now uh, ready made, uh, students have used the possibility that, that they can uh, take uh, the, the classes uh, anytime, twenty four seven, and this digitalization makes uh, it possible. And also there is interest from industry uh, because usually industry people, um, yeah. Uh, they also uh, like the possibilities that they can choose the time and um, if needed, yeah, they prefer to do it uh, on their uh, spare time. Uh, um, I see a huge potential because if, if it's uh, ready, you can you can multiply the digital tools uh, in, in um, easier ways than, than physical tools. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like if you integrate your uh, virtual reality with Peter's microgrid factory, that's going to be like Inception movie or something, <laughs> you know, you're virtually doing virtually something. Yeah, thank you very much, Tano. That was very interesting. Thank you so, so much. And uh, I guess that we should proceed. So time really flies and uh, we are approaching uh, the very last speaker in this session. And uh, well, the cliche phrase, last but not the least, uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Associate Professor Henry uh, Birkelainen. I'm sorry if uh, I mispronounced your uh, surname. Uh, really, really sorry for that. You're welcome to speak up. Thank you very much. And I think the pronunciation was quite spot on. So <laughs> hello, everyone. My name is Henry Pirkel. And I'm, I'll, let's see if I can uh, share the slides. So just one moment, just one moment. Yeah, always switching between the Zoom and Teams. So like the sharing functionalities are slightly different, but I'm getting to the presentation very quickly let's try this i uh, have you have you ever <laughs> this might be a bit spooky it's the kind of a beta version of zoom so that it embeds the speaker directly to the to the slide so hope this works can you can you see my presentation perfectly and yeah. once again futuristic <laughs> <laughs> futuristic let's again let's see how it works i i haven't tried this so many times but uh i'm very happy to be here uh so I, I work in Tampere University as Associate Professor of Information and Knowledge Management. Uh, personally, my, my group have focuses on a couple of different areas. One of them is this multi-user virtual and augmented reality, so what we call a social extended reality. Um, this is something that, that we have ongoing projects, European projects, and also national projects running, and, and a few PhD students working eagerly on this. Um, I'm going to look in a couple of different perspectives in, in this presentation. I'm mainly looking at the, the value-related perspective. What does it bring for education and for collaborative work? 
but basically what you see behind is the, the campus where we're positioned. It's uh, Hervanta in, in Tampere. So we had this merger, as, as you might know, a couple of years ago. So we're now one big family, happy family, <laughs> Tampere University. So we belong to the Tampere University of Technology before. And that's, uh, let's say, quite futuristic campus as well. So hope, hope to see you at some point visiting, visiting there. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to derive some lessons learned from our ongoing project. So, uh, as I mentioned, we, we have a quite a few and actually it's it's uh, quite uh, quite funny, like uh, having, having just a ton of presented before uh, from Taltec perspective. So we also like have this uh, VAM Realities project together with, with Taltec, this Edward Petlenkov and Alexei. Uh, Alexei Teplikov, I don't know how to pronounce the last names correctly, but uh, ongoing uh, partnership also with, with Taltec. And uh, we're looking there, for example, the adoption of extended reality for European manufacturing SMEs. But we also have this projects on more into the educational scene. So in higher education, how we may embed this technology and especially for like teaching purposes, but in this ECI university initiative that looks into a kind of a new European um, university model, we're also experimenting a bit with this XR campus, which is a multi-user environment for learners to come together to learn, like uh, embedding in the challenges uh, from private companies and also from public institutions such as Tampere City and, and so on. So that's that's pretty uh, nice. I'm going to say a few words about that, that as well. In this presentation, I, I hope to do a bit of an overview of, of the what social extended reality is, because I think there's a kind of a many at the moment misconceptions also like about, about the technology. So I embedded a few of the kind of a more basic uh, like slides here. But if, if this gets too boring for you, you just just uh, tell me and I can move faster. But basically, when we talk about extended reality, we cannot miss the virtual reality part what, what our, the previous presenter was going in, into details already is that when you are utilizing virtual reality you're replacing your physical reality with a virtual one and uh, working with uh, educators but and also with companies there's a lot of uh, like uh, misunderstandings but also uh, unawareness on what kind of a content can you embed into the virtual virtual reality and of course the thing the answer is that it can be anything or everything that's the beauty of VR, so that you can embed users in an immersive way into existing and real life locations, virtual twins of an organization or similar, embed them into like uh, really realistic simulations and trainings, for example, in the cockpit of a helicopter or a jumbo jet. Uh, it can be really graf graphically sophisticated uh, that the user actually feels that they, they, they are in that virtual environment but it also can be this uh, like uh, uh, real life locations visiting eiffel tower and so and in many cases even these 360 videos which aren't really interactive in a way but might might enable some kind of a sense making and a common agreements when when or at least to share awareness on on physical locations when we embed users there so the options are quite quite endless when it comes to comes to VR, and it's something that we work quite much with, especially from the adoption and use perspective. When we're talking about augmented reality, it's more or less the the other side of extended reality. It's just embedding digital uh, information to our physical world, such as like uh, via. Uh, I'm not sure if you have used any of these IKEA apps or similar, so that you can actually check like the catalog of of IKEA and with your smartphone or tablet, you can just visualize in real like how that particular furniture would fit into your apartment, the diameters and everything, just to ensure if I'm sitting on a sofa. If I put by this, uh, let's say, like table in front of me, can I still see the still still see the TV? That was actually a particular case that I I was <laughs> troubled with, so that's why I just checked the catalog and measured it with with AR. Oh yeah, it's it looks good. That's that's how it would look like in our living room. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about AR is that it's uh, with the new technologies uh, like especially smartphones. Uh, they are quite capable in handling all kinds of uh, uh, 3D content that can be embedded into organizations, uh, into everyday lives in, in, our, in, in our settings. So, but they can also be, especially in manufacturing and construction use, they can be done with different types of AR glasses, such as HoloLens. 
So again, what we are focusing on mainly is this multi-user perspective. So it's uh, when we are talking about extended reality, it's a combination of the VR and AR. We are looking into both, but especially in many of our ongoing projects uh, and studies relate to this multi-user virtual reality. Um, this is not something that is completely new in a way. It, it's something that has been designed for, for over years. But if we look at any kind of existing applications in organizations or especially in, in entertainment, uh, it has been emerging only in the last couple of years. Many of you might have even attended some uh, uh, professional events using alt space or some of these uh, social virtuality applications that can be for professional events that you can access with your like head mounted display. <laughs> I'm not sure if it actually shows this uh, Valve index. It's uh, the third, like it actually uses these cables and similar still, but you can attend those events with your HMDs to really take the benefits of the Im Im like immersion, but it can also be facilitated via web browsers. And of course, one of the key lessons learned when we work with, with companies and with education is that in many cases, the applications that, that we utilize, they, we need to have a quite flexible access to those. Uh, so it often case might not be that the, the uh, students or the participants of a remote team don't have necessarily the access at that point in time to certain HMD device. So in many cases, we are also looking into how we can utilize like browser-based access, you know, that people with the laptops can come to the same virtual space when there's some collaboration happening. But we're quite fascinated about the opportunities of multi-user like uh, VR especially. And, and in this presentation, I'm gonna look a bit on what that means. Uh, and basically, if, if you're if you're into VR, the, something of course happened like in 2016 and around this time time point in time. And when we work with companies from construction or manufacturing, many of their lessons learned from VR might be from time before this. So I think there was some kind of a switching point, like something similar that happened to graf with graphical user interface with Win Windows 95. I think there was a bit something similar for extended reality. So that just the processing power, the optics, but also like in terms of like new kinds of uh, pla platforms, content development started to really boost off after this. So at this point in time, when you make purchases, even of uh, like this uh, head mounted displays, it might be that in one year, they are already a bit outdated. The development is quite, quite fast. And also in these applications for these multi-user environments. And of course, one of the main reasons is that this uh, VR can nowadays be accessed also with these standalone devices, such as what you have in the right hand side. So like uh, uh, Facebook bought Oculus uh, some years ago, and they are, of course, one of the le leading companies when it comes to this, uh, these standalone devices that you can kind of have as plug and play. You pay 350 to 450 euros for a really high quality VR device that actually doesn't require any cables or it doesn't have to be connected to a laptop or a powerful PC unless you want to. But they are kind of a standalone device. Similarly, as in the, like smartphones, you have the app, uh, like uh, app stores, uh, Google stores and similar. You have that kind of a like a place where you can download uh, free content, but also like uh, proprietary applications directly from the device. But of course, the the content, whether the professional and education related content, is already embedded into these devices. That's a completely different uh, discussion, and it might be even quite troublesome to get your applications to these standalone devices in an e easy way. But it's good to remember that even though these uh, cheaper devices that can are re really user friendly and, and are quite powerful uh, in many manufacturing and construction related use cases, there's still, of course, need for these uh, more powerful pieces and the, the third <laughs> devices where you also have the beacons and you have to maybe have a three, three times three like uh, like um, space in, in your living room, in your office or no matter where you are to work with more sophisticated solu industrial solutions. But uh, in many of the projects that we work on, many of the applications, they are tried to be designed, especially for these, uh, these standalone devices that, it's the, that the use can be scaled. Uh, and especially now during COVID, uh, that I think that this has opened a, 
many discussions around virtual reality because as as, as we know that uh, when we are embedded into virtual collaboration whether it's a team or it's a group of students in uh, this um, zoom meetings or team meetings it's quite hard to get the set uh, like sense of shared space so that uh, uh, it's uh, 70 plus of us in the same room, but we don't actually feel that we are in the same space, that we are surrounded by each other and there's, uh, that we could have even nonverbal like cues and, and uh, may, maybe like clap hands or anything. It, it's really quite, quite hard to have the benefits of physical uh, co-location in the times of remote work and especially now during, during COVID. And even after COVID, I think the, the role of remote work is uh, and remote collaboration it will definitely increase. And that's why virtual reality and especially this multi-user perspective for it provides quite many new uh, exciting opportunities. And I'm not sure if you have seen some of these developments, for example, by Vario, like they, they are one of the leading a like head mounted display uh, providers from actually from Finland with some incredible <laughs> resolution that they are also syncing up with some application developers for this multi-user perspective to allow new kinds of collaborative design processes uh, regardless of uh, like uh, this physical distance and um, let's see I, I I might just show you this uh, this link so let's do it that I'll switch to um, very quickly to my my browser window and uh, what you see here basically is that multiple users they might be from different parts of the world they aren't actually in a like next to this uh, physical version of of volvo it's that they are they are coming with their HMDs from different parts of the world. They can join in collaborative design activities via avatars, which is, of course, the way to go in, in this multi-user virtual reality. You might have more in some uh, platforms and applications, more realistic avatars that actually look as your, your the physical self, but they can be also in many cases quite, quite cartoonish. But the basic thing is that you can embed uh, individuals into design activities where they can have a, a feeling of shared space that they're actually next to each other. Uh, they can col collaborate, they can actually manipulate different types of content and even digital twins as uh, uh, from pre previous uh, presentation. And I think that's one of the best parts of this multi-user uh, VR because uh, many of these applications are already out there and you can embed different types of 3D content in the, into them. It's just more or less like a, um, a creativity also to think about what are the essential use cases that you should be supporting for your, for your stakeholders. So from there we get actually now to the next part uh, of the presentation, which is the uh, use cases. So we have been working on this with with uh, from few few different industry and education perspectives, and to look at where is the actual the value created for this multi-user environments, and definitely something that has been represented this uh, architecture, engineering, and construction industries is that there need, is need to involve stakeholders in the decision making in different points in time. For example, when we are uh, designing new properties or constructions. For example, in Tampere, there's the new arena <laughs> coming next to the center where there are, of course, shareholders, other people who need to see the kind of at the final product in an early phase. There are uh, staff members or anyone who need to utilize different properties and the, like uh, reducing any kind of mistakes early on in the life cycle of, of, a, of a design process is, is, is really, really vital. And the beauty of, of course, of this multi-user VR is that you can embed users to different types of designs. You can like have something that doesn't exist yet, but will be in maybe in the next three years, you can like embed individuals to see how things look like from a bird's eye view. And then when you flip actually inside to the 3D models, these are just mock-ups from the, from the internet. That's not how the, the arena, arena looks like in, in Tampere. <laughs> but uh, just to get, get an like, uh, idea how the exocentric versus egocentric views can be directly taken in a way that the users can see in one-on-one -on -one scale how things would look like. 
instead of me, you know, explaining how my uh, living room looks like, I could spend 10 minutes and all of you would have probably a different type of impression in mind. But if, if I bring you to my living room in VR, you can see it in real life scale. Everyone understands it in, in a matter of seconds. And I think that's the, that's the beauty, what we need to use VR for. The second uh, and really essential use case for multi-use virtual reality is this remote uh, collaboration and teamwork in general. And this goes for different types of activities and different industries, of course, have different uh, requirements and more particular activities where this can be embedded into. It's for sure that, you know, researchers even like in even in our team, we have quite regular meetups in VR to do some team working. Maybe it can be even just uh, discussing uh, like some revision for a research article, but especially in areas and this is goes also for training and education. Um, you know, in management education, if we talk about management theories or something, it might add value that we get the learners in the same space, like that they can really concentrate and feel that they are next to each other to, to have really detailed discussions. But, you know, the value, of course, of multi-use, especially VR, definitely comes in like areas where we treat, deal with uh, 3D content, you know, like any kinds of, whether it's a device, equipment, um, property, you know, construction site or something where we need to understand scale also. And this goes also for training and education that I think mainly these um, areas, disciplines that deal with this kind of a 3D content, content and, and tangible assets uh, definitely benefit more from VR, uh, like in also this remote activities, because you can uh, manipulate, you can interact with different types of content directly in VR. One of the really essential use cases, especially for this uh, multi-user augmented reality and where quite many quite sophisticated applications are already existing, is, sorry, re remote assistance. So we can think about different types of situations where like uh, in uh, property management, a new like a new janitor or some something is onboarded and they come to a place where they just don't know the, 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 the place yet. It might be that they like are spending hours or of their effective work time to trying to like locate where there are problems if there was some problem with a boiler or system or something with AR you can of course have different uh, like means to provide remote assistance like uh, real time let's say it's a kind of a video a video calls on steroids in a way that you can provide direct like support for for the other person but maybe even uh, when all kinds of indoor tracking and uh, this uh, geographic locations can be found even by navigating via augmented realities that people can find things faster and they can tap into the problems, for example, of a particular piece of hardware faster and of course save a lot of time. The training and simulation, it's something that it's, of course, the classic of virtual reality. So if there's something kind of a risky scenario, hazardous, so something that the human lives can be, it can be lost in organizations, let's say in power plants or something, if things really go wrong or with some engines that can overheat or similar. In VR, of course, you can like simulate activities in a safe manner and also run people through them in a realistic way so that they know how they can deal with, of course, when, when the actual situations could, could occur instead of just going to simulations that you have to stop or that would be really expensive maybe to develop in, in, uh, in real life. And similarly, because nowadays you can interact even in multi-user setting in, in a in VR in quite many ways is that uh, this something that are really expensive to develop, you know, if it's some jumbo jet and you have to train all of your pilots or something, uh, it might be that if there's a physical physical version of it, it the, the issue of scale is always there. So there's a number of people that you can run through it only. But of course, with VR, it, you don't have the issue of scale because it's mainly that the development might be quite uh, pennies compared to the physical prototype and also you can scale the uh, the training itself 
Another one is the sales and marketing. And it's something that uh, many, comp especially companies are start starting to think about is that the VR can be quite effective sales channel as well, especially when there are multiple persons inside, whether it's my wife and myself, maybe trying to like uh, find a house to, to live in is of course, that if you can look how your future house would look like in real life, you can uh, maybe uh, adjust any of uh, any of the like uh, design choices in a way. Uh, and maybe even make the purchases directly on on online on that uh, multi, on that virtual environment. Those are quite priceless, of course, nowadays. But uh, when we did a survey in VAM Realities, we did a bunch of interviews and and surveys for European SMEs, in especially in manufacturing. It's it was quite clear that the, many of the companies see even better potentials in in these industries for augmented reality. And there might be, of course, many reasons for that, that there's just a bit better awareness on what AR can do and that AR can be maybe used in different parts of the value chains more uh, broadly than currently what they're doing with VR. So with VR, they are mainly emphasizing nowadays the early stages of, a, let's say, product life cycles when nothing physical yet exists, but they need to maybe have a common sense making around uh, 3D objects, for example, designs of like um, pieces of hardware or equipment and to like even uh, have shareholders around those. But AR can be of course used in more pro potentially more broadly in different types of organizational processes, maybe in, uh, in the actual uh, workflows to visualize information about orders or any kinds of products to, to remote assistance. But it's quite clear also that these technologies are just being all like ad, ad, like adopted gradually so that even in, in our like survey around 60% weren't actively using but were considering to move to use to very soon and majority were like already expecting that they will adopt these technologies quite fast. And I think that's why it's really important that there's quite lots of awareness raising also happening in different areas of AR and VR and also on the potential use cases that they could be uh, applied for because they go for the practical uses in industries but it's really also in the uh, higher education but also maybe primary and secondary education that we are embedding these technologies and also tra training individuals to be uh, capable of using them and applying them in the future. And uh, what, what I mentioned before is, uh, I think something that we are quite proud of and, and eager about is this extra campus development that we're doing in ECA University uh, with, uh, with this uh, company Zoan from, from Finland. Uh, and ECA University has this challenge based mode so that there are like uh, tricky societal challenges coming from, let's say cities around Europe, but also from private uh, industries such as we have partners from uh, Ponce, Toyota, Airbus and so on, is that there might be these uh, tricky challenges where learners also need to get together from different parts of Europe. So we have this alliance in, of 12 universities within ECA University and we need to find better ways to effectively embed learners together to solve a challenge. And especially in areas where the, we deal with 3D content, that's where we especially need to utilize virtual reality. So there's currently this XR campus being developed. Uh, the, it's still on a kind of a, let's say, B, I think it's beta phase, but uh, there's the, uh, we start also piloting it with, with my own uh, students. I, I teach data and software business. So we're looking into all kinds of solutions for sustainable cities. And we're embedding our learners in the XR campus in actually in autumn already so uh, they will be using oculus quest 2 devices uh, from their homes to to attend the xr campus and they will do parts of their uh, collaboration in xr campus not everything of course needs to be transferred in vr there's still the benefit of we have to think about when it actually is the like gains the best value and this is what we will explore also with the students so hope that you can also uh, like mark this down and maybe look at what the developments there are. Uh, and also one realities, uh, have a look. There's quite a look of good website resources for AR and VR adoption that you might want to have a look, vamrealities.eu. 
Uh, I look uh, drop here a couple of additional readings if you're really into this that my my uh, PhD students have been working on that look into value of uh, of VR and social extended reality in general. And also, in when we talk about gamification, gamification is something that is really interdisciplinary. So we're actually hiring for uh, uh, post uh, assistant or associate professors in the area of gamification. And if you work in this area, for example, social extended reality, we have one position in our information knowledge management unit that looks more into how we facilitate innovation processes and new types of ways of working uh, via gamification. So keep this in your mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you. Uh, as you said, it was a nice introductory presentation, really. I heard a lot of new things. And uh, so again, while we're waiting, I'll start with my question. I think uh, we have, uh, you know, multiple uh, disciplines, uh, professors and educators here. So everyone is reflecting and thinking how could they apply VR in their courses or something. So I'll ask from, again, from my point of view, I teach civil engineering. And yeah, I know, we, if, you know if you have a nice model of, a, of an arena, as you said, or maybe Ikea creates their models of sofas, etc. cetera, uh, we can look at it and it's cool, but how hard it is to create those models. Like for example, uh, in civil engineering, we do design uh, 3D models in, in various programs and let's say SOLIDWORKS is used by multiple disciplines. Is it hard to actually make that uh, extended reality model from, from a 3D version of some, some software? The thing is that the content creation is still one of the big bottlenecks and especially not necessarily the, because in many cases I think the con uh, digital content exists that could potentially could be uh, brought into the 3D environment but in many cases that the, the uh, even the proprietary and the available tools especially for this multi-user environment there are big limitations in the content that you can embed there. So in many cases, you are you have to deal with some kind of a custom designed even tools for education where you can bring the kind of a content that you want to. So definitely the content creation is one of the bottlenecks, but, but one of the good things is also that there have been a lot of developments in like a conversion of content, like content that goes from, let's say, building information models or similar to VR and back <laughs> so that there, there are these uh, automatic conversions that and ma many other kind of a developments that have um, like removed many bottlenecks there but still uh, what we have identified is that the even in this XR campus is that if we want to bring uh, city models uh, there something that can be quite interactive quite even detailed um, there's the issue then of even the processing power and the bit with the environment. So it is definitely a bottleneck at the moment. All right, thank you for your answer. And we have one more question from the audience. Uh, this time it sounds as following. It would be great if we can integrate the virtual reality in education. Often universities are one step behind. Maybe we have the chance to be at least in line with industry usage. What are these chances? That's a very, very good point. And actually like to adopt uh, VR, for example, some of these uh, uh, standalone devices, also they aren't too expensive. And it's mainly just to identify maybe even one cre like rather creative use case related to what you might be teaching yourself. And it might not be actually so like, um, tedious in a way to, way to get it embedded into part of education. So, uh, for example, in this VR Insight project, we have created a lot of uh, like, or at least we tried to support educators into getting into VR quite fast in a way to, to be on the on the early adopters phase really and be in the line with what some of the companies are doing. So maybe you might want to have a look at some of these uh, simple guidelines, how you might get started. That could be uh, one way to do it. All right. Thank you for a great piece of advice. I believe that most of us would be interested in that. Okay. Uh, thank you. And I uh, hope you still stay for the session discussion. And I invite uh, Professor Magne to, to help us with the generalizing discussion of this session. We've really seen a lot of digital things here. So um, is Magne there? And I'll invite all other 
uh, speakers to turn on their cameras so we could see them. Hey, there they are. Yes, I'm here. Uh, can you also turn on my camera? Oh, I'll try. Yes, there we go. Yeah, my, my name is Magnus Sydnes, and I will try to facilitate the um, discussion after this session here. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all four speakers for excellent talks. And and um, we've been through quite an um, interesting four sets of talks. We, we, well, we were supposed to start out with, you know, learning how you could facilitate the learning environment in order to, to actually make collaboration or collaborative learning the, the, um, the, the main topic and the way to, to um, actually get into the deep end of the, um, the, the science and, and um, engineering problems. And then we moved on to three different talks regarding digitalization. Uh, you could say more or less forced forward by COVID uh, or, or, or maybe just fast forward in a, in a sense that the, the technology was there, but it was pro progressing slowly. And then the COVID just came in and gave a boost. Now we really need to focus on this in order to, in order to get, um, get uh, the, our teaching out to the students that, that are ne needed to sit at home. So I'll, I'll, I have a few questions and then I hope the audience also will, will, um, will uh, help in and, and get, join the common discussions that, that are going. I would, I'd like to start out with uh, Gai Da Ling. Um, happy birthday, by the way. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I like the, the quotation you had, the one who does the work does the learning. So, so when, you, when you say that, you obviously said it, when you're standing lecturing in the old fashioned way, basically the one doing the work is the person lecturing, right? And then obviously the, the students are listening, but are they really learning? That, that, I guess that's the sort of key question that has been used when, when you have um, rearranged the study environment at NTNU. And I must say the, the, the some of those pictures you show, they're really, really nice facilities you have for the students. Uh, uh, how, how many? How long time have you been been uh, working in this kind of uh, setting? Um, the the reform these spaces that we're talking about at uh, NTNU uh, have all been created over the past. I think it is uh, six seven years or something like that. It started about then, mm -hmm. and it, it is uh, it started actually with with uh, initiatives uh, from the top management visiting schools and, and universities in different yeah. places, seeing what they are doing there yeah. and getting some inspiring. And then actually tasking our property division with uh, accompanying us. And it turns out that our property division is, is one of the driving forces. So I would uh, actually, for all of you here, uh, give the advice to include the people at your property division to come along and look at these things because uh, Architects and uh, building people, they like to build new things. So give them the opportunity to see what is around. I think that's a very good uh, piece of advice. Um, there's a number of other aspects I could, could talk about uh, till the cows came home. Uh, uh, but, but, but that is one of the big things to get the people who are actually making the decisions about buildings to, in, to, to, to get them on board that will in, in facilitate a lot of the change that is necessary. And also, I think that there is, of course, a, a pushback from people who are not familiar with and, and in fact, uh, uh, uncomfortable with, with these new buildings. So, so you really do need to have a variety of places to, to work with. And if you build new uh, facilities, there needs to be support for using them, uh, both for the teachers and for the students. And to think about that, but I think when what we're dealing with here, and, and as the, the my colleagues here, Henry and Tano and, and Peter have shown, there's a lot of things that are hands-on that you have to do in, in particular spaces. And what we're dealing with here is trying to addressing the very hard question of how to learn the practicalities that are involved that are involved in STEM fields. One thing is is 
the core subjects, which is basically what I was addressing, students learning the, 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 the groundbreaking collaboration, the social aspects of being an uh, sister, sister, or mathematician or engineer, but, but how should you learn how to deal with, with a actual hands-on experience? And I think that that was addressed in the three other talks quite well. Exactly. And, and I was wondering, um, how did you deal with the, the situation where you, where, where you were, the courses that were used to this group, group teaching, and there were people gathering, uh, discussing, how did they suddenly switch on to, into an um, online teaching environment? How did uh, that work? And I guess maybe the XR campus where you actually could, um, which was presented now here by uh, Henry at the end, maybe could be a way that th th actually you could uh, in a sense, keep that sort of group work environment in a better way than on a flat screen like we are sitting now? There are some things coming out of COVID that are extremely important to remember once we, we get out of this. And that is, we really do need to identify what it was that was successful during this uh, year and a half of forced uh, pandemic uh, conditions. Uh, because going back to what we did previously is not really a, a viable solution, I believe. So the question is, what, what should we keep? What, what, what actually improves things? And in terms of teaching and learning, if you look at the elaboration, uh, that's a challenge. And in, in Norway, for instance, we've had a very low levels of, of, of uh, uh, contagion and so forth. So we actually had socially distanced students coming into labs in, 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 in uh, controlled cohorts and like that and, and try to figure that. With all other forms of the more conventional uh, teaching learning forms like, like uh, uh, lecturing and so forth, teachers have reacted differently. Some have uh, done pre-recorded videos and then basically flipped the classroom. Others have tried on, on, on live Zoom uh, lectures with different uh, re reactions. And, and you, you can get two student groups and teachers describing essentially the same situation. And in one case, it has worked. And the other one, it's been a, a disaster. So we really don't know what worked and why and what didn't work or why. There's a very interesting uh, research project started at Lund University where they put some PhD students on to figuring out what really did happen. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm I at least am very interested in finding out what they come up with at the end of that. So, so uh, there's that. But, uh, I would really like to hear what uh, from, from Henry Town and Peter, what, what uh, they have to say about the, the COVID situation, what happened to you guys. Yeah, yeah, maybe Henry, could you, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, the COVID situation has definitely had a lot, a lot of implications on, on what, how, how we run teaching here as well. And uh, what we have thought about with XR Campus is that we've been trying to experiment a bit with uh, two different study modules on where, when the students should be having this Zoom setting, <laughs> Zoom meetings and when they should be in, in uh, the XR Campus. And uh, one of the problematics that we've identified at this point is that the, it takes time to adopt these new ways of doing things because the, the first times when the learners are also being embedded into XR campus, it looks really different in their fourth time when they come there. It takes a lot of time to, for them to adjust to the new, new kind of a system and even ident like know that they might have hands and they might have their virtual self. And that's why like all the kind of... Um, behaviors that they conduct there they might be really really locked down in the in the first phases so i think this adjustment period is just a bit uh, challenging and what we are trying to now facilitate is some kind of an adoption process how to embed learners gradually into different types of digital formats and i think that's also a bit of a it will be a lot of experimentation but i hope that we know more in in the autumn Right. Yeah. Like all new things, there is a bit of adjustment and a learning curve. And of course, obviously, some do have a shorter learning time than others. So it's like um, it's it's um, but that's that's how it will be, I guess, um, regardless. Um, uh, uh, Peter and Tano. Um, your your um, you have your your talks were related to more like a lab setting, and I and I get my impression was that both for yours, your um your your lab setting, so basically at home lab laboratory um, was was forced forward by by COVID. 
but um, and and based on the, the 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 what the students said, it seemed like at least uh, three fourths of them were quite happy with with uh, or very happy actually with with the way well they're learning um, what they learned from from the courses and were happy about the the, the way of teaching. Uh, but but in uh, say now we're seeing um, we're moving hopefully soon out of the COVID and and more more back to a normal situation, but it will be a new normal. Um, how will the new normal uh, look like for, 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 for the courses that uh, you were expla explaining here, um, uh, where, where you can actually, you don't need to think about the possibility of catching COVID, but, but you, you want to pick the best of, of the two, two different uh, teaching worlds, I think. Yeah, uh, it might be a way of saying it. So, I, 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 Peter, would you like to start off, and then Tano, you can maybe uh, continue after. Uh, yes. Um, what was interesting for me was uh, last year. When was it? March. Uh, when we went into a severe lockdown, um, we had <laughs> not a lot of time to prepare, but uh, I. I we we use the, the the Teams platform, and uh, one thing that I found was in Teams that you can integrate a class notebook into OneNote. Uh, so usually when I lectured, I had three smart boards, and you can draw on the board, and then after the lectures, you you make a new uh, page, and then I save these pages as PDFs, and then I upload it to the web page. Uh, because prior to the smartwatch, students took up pictures with their with their mobile phones of the of the board. Now you could save the board, but during the COVID, uh, using this this one note, um, it was uh, eye opener for me because we you can also make co collaboration notes. And when stuff normalized here in in Denmark uh, for the semester that started in September, the students said, "Well, don't use the smart board." please sit behind your computer and continue using one of them. And, um, and uh, because, at, and some of the students actually uh, sat in class with their laptops in front of them, looking at, at the one notes I wrote in front of them. Some students prefer to, to be at home uh, with a one note. And uh, this was just a new wave because uh, uh, as, um, as was mentioned before, we, we're engineers, we like to draw things. And, uh, even maybe I must share my screen quickly here. Uh, share, oh, sorry, where is it now? Oh, share, uh, yeah, if you can see here, uh, this is typically how, how I use a OneNote, uh, which, which I wouldn't have used if it wasn't for COVID. And now even with COVID and after COVID and between COVID, <laughs> uh, this, is, this, is, this is just a new way of doing it. Uh, drawing things by hand, importing data sheets, drawing on top of data sheets, having this whole folder here and all the courses you have here. So this is this is what uh, where you can highlight things and use this for, from a data sheets for a design course. So um, uh, it, it just opened up the new possibilities uh, and uh, there's even collaboration space here. Uh, oops, yeah, so um, okay, it's not this, maybe not this is the best course, but uh, some of the other courses here, students collaborate, they draw, I draw, uh, even for exams, uh, when it was online exams, the students drew on their own place and I could add questions. Uh, this has opened up the whole student place and how you interact with students uh, just tremendously. Um, also these, these small boards you have to draw on, um, I, I see, I, I used one and uh, I've seen the students now also mm -hmm. use one. It's much easier than to draw with your mouse. So this is one thing that I think makes it, yeah, <laughs> one positive from, from COVID, if, if, if I could say it like that. Yeah, so this is definitely something that you will continue with. Yes, this is definitely something that I could continue with. Uh, yeah, although yeah. we have now our smart board infrastructure. Uh, right. Yeah. We, 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 this, 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 this way of teaching and also uh, sitting in front and recording your, your lectures. Um, yeah, it, it is, I think that is, that is the thing that, 
but if I, under, if I understood you correctly, then your, your, your teaching now is a hybrid teaching. So you have some students in class and some at home as you... Uh, yes, that yeah. was uh, yeah, that was the the case. But even uh, if you don't have hybrid teaching, uh, yeah. I think this 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 way of of um, because I like to as uh, as uh, Reda said, uh, or um, we don't want. Previously, you st stood up in front of a board and wrote, but now you you actually want to sit down and write on a piece of paper. But now everybody yeah. can see that piece of paper in front of them. They sit with their computers. They look at the piece of paper. Yeah. And they can actually in intervene and say, but what did you draw here? And I said, oh, this is, and uh, it's just a new way of doing it, which, 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 which I'm, I really enjoy doing it this way, which was something lacking previously, which, which, yeah, it's now just, why didn't we think of that earlier? Yeah, well, it's good that you can, it's possible to, to draw some positive things out of COVID because there's been a lot of negatives, right? Mm -hmm. I, I see your hand, Raida, but I would like to have uh, Tano just just comment first uh, about what what what, um, what 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 things to bring bring forward from from the COVID situation into the more normal teaching um, um, environment or, or uh, future. Uh, I, I think it, uh, that uh, all the professors are now more flex and, and um, we have at university also policies that uh, all courses should have e-learning support and environment. So I think it has been proved uh, that it is, it is needed and necessary. And I think uh, also students are more expecting that, uh, that uh, despite uh, of not being able to pre being present in physical lecture, uh, they have backup and then they can visit visit uh, the, the uh, digital twin of the lecture. So uh, I think it's it's uh, something we cannot turn back. Interesting. Um, in particular, maybe you mentioned you know where you have operations that potentially is uh, hazardous, right? Like you were saying, metal can um, some some fine grained metal can can ignite, right, and make uh, and you can have fires, and then maybe. In the future, you still would like the students maybe to do it, uh, you know, and see how it's done and do it physically. But maybe you know they, they can practice beforehand and actually do the practice and have the fire on on the screen instead of in the real lab, right? Uh, basically, it also has an economic impact because uh, we are now developing in other project uh, a virtual pneumatic and hydraulic stands. Uh, and basically, uh, if we currently serving the, the, the limited number of students, then using digital twin, uh, I think we can we can serve more people with using the, a quite quite uh, similar digital twin. And um, and yeah, it has also uh, making it, it also making making uh, uh, higher education uh, more profitable. Exactly. Yeah, there is a lot of expensive. Uh resources and materials that needs into some of the engineering courses that may, maybe you can have great savings, but still you keep the learning outcome. Uh, yes, yes, you're right, darling. Um, yes, I, I liked much what, what Peter said and showed that, that uh, in a way, the way that you work with OneNote and all of these things, it's, it's about a shared screen that I was talking about in the student spaces. Now, this is a way that uh, we expect our students to be able to work together in the future, whether they are in the same room or like we are now. I think it's highly important that we post pandemic retain a number of these e-learning environments because our students can expect to work like this in their future work lives. And that's, that needs to be rehearsed, repeated and, and learned by us who are teaching. We're not just talking about the high-end virtual realities that Henry is working with, not nor the augmented reality, but the simple meetings, being able to work in meetings like this. Um, we, won't, we won't be able to travel to Oslo or, or, or from, from Trondheim to do these daytime air trips all the time. We save a lot of time, a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of fuel, um, we can do it quicker, shorter, and much more efficiently if we also use this format. Clearly, there are things that we cannot uh, 
we, we cannot replicate the socialization, the meeting, the learning to know each other that we do when, when we're in the same room. We need to be able to collaborate and, and, and do this in this format. So there is that about, and my, my advice to all of you who are still listening here is that retain this format as part of every single course that we're giving in the future. There should be some aspect that is done in this way. Maybe even in the future, there will be courses that are co-run uh, by our universities. We can reach each other's students. We can have joint projects and so forth in a much, much uh, wider possibility. So that's, that's my sort of message to all here. Keep doing what we've discovered right now. Thanks. Yeah, and it's a good point there that, uh, you know, more and more uh, businesses are, are actually reducing down their office space and because they see people prefer or a lot of people prefer to work from home, right, or from, from wherever. So it gives more flexibility. But then also they, they need to know how to use these different tools in a good, uh, and, uh, in a good way and also um, a productive way, of course. Uh, and... Um, uh, uh, this, this XR campus, uh, I guess, my understanding, if I understood, then basically all 12 universities could have students on XR campus working on a project, sitting at their own campus in, in the different uh, countries uh, or also at their home or in uh, almost, say, a tent somewhere with Internet. Um, is, that, is that how it will work in a plan? So you will have joined, um, joined uh, projects in that virtual reality and uh, cam campus. Yes, it's uh, now the current uh, module that we are piloting with is uh, has some students already from other ECA univer in universities. So there are 12 yeah. pa partner universities from all around Europe, but uh, it won't be scaled before we know that it can work, <laughs> that it works su sufficiently. So many aspects of even about ac accessibility and ease of use need to be tackled before that. But the basic idea is that there are these challenge bases that can that might be facilitated by one of the partner universities and that there are students from all around coming coming to the same same environment. In the first phase with this HMD, so, so you have to have a virtual reality device, but uh, it the uh, um, browser based support is already being developed so that the learners who don't necessarily have at that point so if they're walking somewhere in the city or somewhere so that you can plug plug and play also with the other students directly even if you don't have the virtual reality headset with you yeah i, I don't see any questions from the audience so if there's questions in the audience please bring them forward the, um, i was wondering Tano, could 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 you imagine that, uh, for example, why that robot engineering project of yours could be done in an XR uh, XR campus, or XR lab, like uh, with with multi, uh, or maybe that's what you already are doing. I, yeah, but but uh, definitely, uh, I think uh, the programming simulation part is uh, is uh, is uh, doable. Uh, just uh, referring. To the previous talk, I said that uh, I think uh, that uh, we have uh, nice developments in different universities, and and maybe in Europe we we should uh, more um, look for how to standardize because also students uh, have have maybe too many tools and too many environments, and maybe it would be easier than than we have some kind of uh, more common platforms, and uh, it's easier to incorporate different labs, different universities, different countries, so that data quality would be would be similar for Europe. Europe. Yeah, that, that's a good point because yeah, you, like like uh, one of you were saying that you used to working in Teams and, and, and Zoom and they're slightly different, right? And they all operate slightly different ways. So when you switch between them, you forget about what, how was this and how, uh, and obviously data, if you have one format of data, much easier to share than if you have to reformat or, or uh, yeah. So it, it requires that at least uh, the groups that are collaborating are using the same system and are used to using it, right? So that, that everybody's familiar. So you're not using a lot of time in the project in order to learn how to work with the system because half of the, group members are not not capable or have never used or barely used uh, uh, some tools that are necessary in order to be successful in that project 
So that that's that's a really good point. Uh, common because there's there's so many there's so many programs out there, right? And, and much more will come, right? Because people get creative. But then, of course, the best ones will survive. But until you get to the point where you have a few of the best ones around, you have a, a quite a quite a big range of different ways of doing things that that um, might or might not collaborate well. So there is always some potential hiccups, yeah. But I, at least this session is running very nicely. So so that, that that's very good. I'm I'm wondering now if there is any questions from the audience or or is everybody waiting for coffee? Is uh, they're they're feeling like me that now maybe at least over in Norwegian time here is getting close to lunch time, so I can I can feel that. But <laughs> also coffee time. <laughs> So, so if there is no more questions, I think I would just like to, to round off this session by thanking all four speakers, uh, very interesting topics. And, and, and I, uh, I would say to everybody listening that, yeah, as I said, there is, or and basically everybody, there is, there is definitely things that we should bring with us from this that we have learned during COVID, bring with us into the, into the new teaching uh, future and use the best out of both worlds, I would say. And keep in mind that yes, the students will have to deal with much more e e well, e-meetings uh, and various ways of co co communicating and collaborating without being physically together. But, I, but at the same time, often it's, uh, it doesn't totally rule out the, that one, one, one need to see each other every now and then because collaboration works better, I think, when you actually know the person uh, from before. And then, then, then when you know the person, it's much easier to, to also communicate like this and, and um, have, have good productive meetings. So, so with that, I would like to um, round off this session and give the word back, word back to uh, Elisa and Gedminos. Thank, thank you, you, Magne. Thank you. Thank you, dear speakers. Yes, thank you, everyone. Uh, it was really a great pleasure to listen to all of you. And the discussion section, in my opinion, went quite smoothly and quite well. So uh, it was really great, let's say, to reflect on uh, some common ground which unites us all. And well, unfortunately, at that point, that is COVID. OK. OK, thank you. And we'll see you then in the next session. And we have the coffee break or lunch if you're in Norway. <laughs> yes. Once again, a kind reminder, just mind the time zone you are in. Yeah. If we were all together, we would join the riders <laughs> birthday party. But unfortunately, <laughs> it's just Zoom. <laughs> just just have a glass of champagne and think of me. And I'll be happy. So. Uh, we'll See do. you all. Thanks. We'll do. See, See you ya. soon. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.
Okay, welcome back. Welcome back, and we hope that you really did enjoy your coffee, tea, or any uh, refreshments during the break time. Maybe you even managed to have some lunch. So, uh, as you see, we are approaching session number two, and uh, we are happy to have another group of panelists who are going to speak up on the uh, major topic of... Uh, uh, Efficient learning environments, yes. And the first one is the... Uh, Team member of our Nortec Engineering Education Steering Group, Professor Jens Benison. Yeah. Oh, it's, oh. it's about to start. Yes, yeah. and we see a beautiful advertisement right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to see that. So you know, the floor is yours. Great, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, Jens. Oh, thank you. I'll just uh, see if I can uh, share my screen. And then, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Yeah, it's perfect. Oh, uh, that's good. So uh, first of all, thanks a lot for uh, arranging all of this. Um, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to talk about something that, um, that has to do with learning and stuff like that. So uh, today I'll talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> things that I have been doing together with one of my uh, my very good co colleagues and friends, Peter Gorm Larsen, who actually also will be talking a little bit afterwards. Um, and this is something you were talking about what came out of COVID. This is actually also something that uh, somehow came out of, of COVID, this using uh, videos to, as I called it, promote the uh, professional dialogue. Um, so um, that's what I like to talk a little bit about. Let's see if we can get the technology to work. Um, so I'll talk about uh, the uh, the context where it is. I'll talk a little bit about um, the uh, theoretical background, what we have uh, used here. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about the uh, the actual implementation, which is in a a course on discrete mathematics. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how we have done it uh, using videos and uh, trying to make the students be more critical or more what we call have a better evaluative judgment, which is kind of the theoretical background that we have been uh, using. And then we'll talk a little bit or I'll talk a little bit about the uh, the lessons learned, what we have actually uh, found, and what we have uh, what we have seen. So this is what I'll try to to cover in the next uh, twenty five minutes or so. So first of all, uh, the context of this uh, it's um, it's actually run in a course which is on a professional bachelor's program. It started there. Uh, meaning that uh, part of the students will, uh, they'll have one semester uh, uh, in internship. Uh, it's now also part of a uh, normal bachelor program um, where it's uh, on the second semester, the professional bachelor program there, it's actually an elective course. Uh, it's, as I said, a math course of uh, five ECTS points. Uh, and as I said, uh, on the uh, on the traditional bachelor's program, it's on the second semester, and on the professional bachelor's program, it's at their end either on the sixth or the seventh semester. What we uh, what we actually wanted uh, here was uh, was to to help the students being a little more uh, capable of. Uh, talking about and evaluating the quality of, uh, of their work, the quality of their mathematical arguments, the quality of their mathematical uh, calculations and proof and, uh, and etc. What we have seen uh, in many cases is that uh, the students, when we're talking about uh, at least our engineering students, they see math as something which could be characterized as uh, equation hunting. So they are trying to hunt down the equation and and see what they can actually uh, 
what they can find and do that. So, so it's more trying to apply, trying to find something that are applicable rather than actually seeing, well, what are, is, is that a valid argument? Is that something that you can do? So in one way, um, my other area is, uh, my actual area is, uh, is programming. And, and there we try, there we talk about changing program from a noun so we're not just talking about a program we're actually talking about two program so it's it's the same thing that we want to do here try to move the students a little away of just focusing on well the nitty-gritty details of their mathematical um, calculations and and try to move it into uh, can they actually look into the arguments, can they find out whether the arguments are valid and uh, can they actually also make valid uh, arguments. So one way of saying that is to say that we actually want to to have them being better to, <clears throat> to uh, make decisions and, and find out the quality of, of their own work in this place. And that is what uh, Ty and all have, have uh, called evaluative judgment. This being able to actually uh, figure out, well, is this something that, uh, that I can, uh, that this, this I have done, what, what's the quality of that? Is that something that's good or bad or something like that? And that's, of course, something that we uh, generally over the years when the students are in our uh, study programs, we try to give them better and better uh, tools and, and things to, to do that. We're probably not so kind of concise about, uh, about doing it, but, but that's uh, indeed something that we, that we like to do. And then, then we do that by uh, engaging students in different activities. They suggest uh, co-creation of rubrics and standards and assessment criteria try to encourage discussion critiques and debates of standard and quality. So that's what we would actually uh, like to do in this way of, of focusing on, on the student's uh, evaluative judgment. So the ACTA course, as I said, is a, uh, is a discrete mathematical course. It uh, has uh, the learning outcomes as uh, described there. And what we try to focus a lot on is these, well, you explain and apply and describe and stuff like that. That's something you do in relation with other people. So math is not so much about actually doing the calculation. It's a language where you communicate with other people. Uh, whether it's something that you that you actually calculate, you do that with a purpose and you communicate and discuss about that calculation or whether it's more pure math uh, where you actually do your uh, traditional proof and stuff like that. And that also has some kind of communication flavor to it. So that's kind of the learning outcomes as we have. And we're talking, of course, about uh, alignment here. So we want our both our uh, teaching and learning activities, which is there called pedagogical design and our assessment being aligned with that. Uh, so the uh, assessment is done um, via mandatory uh, hand-ins. The students have to do something and they will get a little bit back, back to that. They have to do the hand-ins, but they also have to critique other students' hand-ins. They also have to do some presentations during the course and they have to do some reviews on, on that uh, presentation. And we have an oral exams at the end where the students actually present something and they critique something. I'll get back to that a little bit later. The, uh, the pedagogical design of the course um, uh, has been for the last five years or so, it has been a flipped classroom course. Um, we do have <clears throat> a lot of uh, video lectures uh, available for the students. We have actually found that it, uh, it's not so uh, needed that we record our own lectures because there is a lot of good, got, uh, good uh, material out there. So, <clears throat> so we have just used um, good uh, material. Then we have what we call workshops <clears throat> in class. So this is where the students do something and we walk around and talk to them and they do some presentations uh, on their 
they do some calculations. We walk around with them in, in groups and, uh, and talk to them and try to guide them and stuff like that. They have also in class the, uh, the possibility of, uh, of working with the hand-ins. Um, this is more a general flip classroom idea that, well, it's, it's probably the work. I think it was also what Rada said. It's, uh, it's the, the work that the student does that actually uh, where they actually learn something. So we want to help them in, in uh, doing their hand-ins and that is also incorporated uh, in the class uh, as work. And then we also have uh, preparation for the exam because that's where we will, uh, we will talk uh, math, so to speak. And, and that's of course also the reason for the, uh, for the examination being oral. And the examination is a little bit different than uh, what we typically have because typically in at least in Denmark uh, an oral examination is something individual where the students uh, draw some kind of questions and then go to the blackboard and present something and we as uh, the reviewers uh, or the <clears throat> examiners we will ask questions to the students. Uh, in this exam here uh, where we also try to facilitate the critical uh, view on mathematical, uh, on math uh, and their presentation skills uh, in math. There, there the students are in groups of uh, three. Um, so they have, uh, first of all, to do a presentation, each of these students in that group. Then uh, that presentation takes about uh, 12 minutes. We have just done it uh, the last three days, Peter Gorm and I. Uh, so, so it takes about 12 minutes, or they know they have to, to do that in 12 minutes. Um, then the two other students, they are uh, serving as reviewers. Uh, so then when the presentation is over, the first reviewer has to critique the, uh, the presentation, meaning, well, what was good, what was not so good with respect to mathematical reasoning and mathematical uh, stuff to do. And then the second person or the second student, the second reviewer will also do that. Uh, he or she can either uh, add some additional comments to uh, the presentation, or he or she can actually also comment on the first reviewer's uh, review. And then uh, the, the, the mark uh, for the examination uh, is uh, based on uh, three thirds on the presentation, and then, uh, sorry, three fourths of the, on the presentation, and then one fourth of the review of the two others. <clears throat> and this is something that the students find a little difficult because actually being, first of all, well, when I review this other students, will that influence his or her um, mark? No, it will not because, well, your review will be the quality that you do. That's what we evaluate as evaluators. It's not the, we, we know what to, uh, how to evaluate the presentation. So it has nothing to do uh, with that. And then, <clears throat> so, so in order to ensure that the students find this and know this, we, as I said, uh, in the class have a lot of exam preparation. So we'll actually use this uh, actively in class to do this at the end of some kind of period where we are discussing one given topic. In this case, as, it's, as I said, it's discrete mathematics. So it could be uh, induction proof techniques or something like that. This looks like um, counterposition or whatever it was. Um, this presentation here, then we will use that as enabling them to actually talk about uh, mathematics or critique other persons uh, talk about uh, mathematics. So coming back to the exam, when the first student has uh, finished his or her presentation, then we'll just rotate, then the presenter will be the first reviewer, the first re reviewer will be the second reviewer, and the second reviewer will be the presenter. And then for the third time, we'll just rotate one more time. Um, so this, this gives uh, the students a way of actually talking mathematic and us a way of evaluating whether they can uh, critically or uh, judge the, the quality 
of, uh, of mathematical uh, proofs and mathematical arguments in, in general. So we wanted to have kind of something live where the students, where their review was something that we could evaluate live. So that's a, that is why we came up with this form of, uh, of examination. The course, as I said, is a, uh, is a flipped course. Um, it typically has uh, two weeks uh, of uh, teaching, giving one uh, topic. We start with uh, us, the teachers, highlighting what is uh, going on, uh, and then they will uh, work with the hand in, as I said, in class. So this is where the students actually have a chance of, uh, of getting help and talking to us and us being uh, guides and, and helping the students to, to work with their hand in instead of them sitting uh, on, on the night before and uh, taking up all their hair. Um, then we uh, also give some uh, feedback on the assignment. There are, uh, for kind of the evaluation of the course, there are seven mandatory assignments that the students have to um, hand in and also get um, uh, approved by us or our teaching assistant. They also have to do some feedback on other students. We'll get back to that a little bit. So, of course, we'll, we'll give them or the teaching assistant, whoever it is, we'll give them some feedback on, uh, on the assignment, some general feedback, and then they will have some individual feedback. And then we also, as I said, have some uh, workshops. Um, again, the idea of working with the hand in uh, on the first day of the two week period is that that's where they get started. And then we typically also work on uh, kind of the last day uh, of the period. They have typically two weeks to do their hand in. So that's where they can have all the uh, all the other questions that they have had. And then uh, at the end of a given topic, we uh, have this as I said, preparation and discussion about the exam question related to this week's topic and then a student will present and two other students will review that presentation. So that was what we traditionally did using the uh, the exam format as a way of the of having the students to reflect back on that topic and figuring out, well, what was the main message to take home here? How can I communicate something about that? How can I uh, give a proof uh, using that proof technique or using that particular mathematical uh, subject that, that we are talking about in this two week uh, period? So all the students were sitting in class and preparing uh, an examination uh, or an exam presentation these 12 minutes. And they were, of course, uh, collaborating in class uh, about, well, how could they do that and, uh, and, and what, was, what was that? And then we had one student presenting before class. We're talking about about 50 students here uh, and two students uh, doing the review. Of course, the rest of the students were also reviewing. And, and then we at the end had some kind of discussion about what, we, what to do. And then came Corona, as we said. Um, so we were, as, uh, as everybody else, of course, forced to move online. Um, this was not a big deal because it was already a flipped class. Um, so the lectures, stuff like that, that was not a big deal. We had all the materials set up for them. We are using a book, which is very suitable for uh, them doing work out of uh, class, stuff like that. Um, we could, of course, uh, facilitate the workshops, the, uh, the feedback, uh, the small kind of us giving an overview lecture thing in Zoom, which was the tool that we used. But we also found out that, well, the exam was a little difficult because, well, it was difficult for the students to actually do something. So instead of them uh, sitting and preparing the stuff in class, we asked them to prepare a video on beforehand on their presentation of this given uh, prove or this given topic. Uh, so it could be um, either a proof technique or it could be some kind of a topic like graphs or something like that. So then they prepared a video, a 12 minute video, like mimicking the examination format. 
And then all of the students, uh, or actually two thirds of the students were asked to do that. And then we fought the students into uh, trios uh, where two students have made a presentation on beforehand. And then the, the third student was one who did not. And then they showed in these breakout rooms or these three person groups, they showed the video and then the other two students were kind of uh, doing their review and thereby also trying to be these uh, people who are uh, improving their critical mathematical skills, trying to critique the mathematical uh, things that we have done. So, so using videos for this has really been something that instead of just being possible of one student standing in front of the classroom of all the others, now they can do it prior to this and they can actually do and have a lot more engaging operations or engaging teaching going on in their small classrooms or in their small groups where they watch uh, each other's um, video. Of course, it's, um, it's difficult for the students to figure out what to do and, and how do we actually make this critique. So we start, on, uh, start off slowly. Uh, first of all, it's a video made by me with, uh, with, uh, with some kind of problems in it and stuff like that. So there is something to talk about. And then the students review that and we do that um, in, in the first um, week or two. And then we start slowly talking about, well, how do you do actually, what do you do when you make this uh, critique of, of other students? So what do they do? Well, they just, um, as I said, prior to the class hours, they make a video presentation about the subject. And they have been doing it on uh, using their mobile phone on a piece of paper, filming like the picture you have there. They have been using uh, their kind of tablet thing. They have been using a whiteboard uh, on uh, when they actually could go into uh, the university to just uh, filming that stuff like that. They're, they're super creative in, uh, in making this. Uh, and then they upload to our learning management system on beforehand so that all the other students can actually watch it if they want. And then, as I said, when we have the class hours, the students are split into groups of about three uh, and they will watch these two videos and then give feedback. And then we found out, well, it's also value that I do something as a teacher and give feedback on the feedback. Um, so we do that in plenum. Um, because it's very difficult for me to go out into the groups and actually follow stuff up there. Um, so we do that in plenum. So when, when they have seen the two videos, we come back uh, and watch one in, uh, in plenum. And then we have two giving feedback, just like we did before. And then I, as a teacher, give some feedback on the feedback, because this is really something, as I said, that students find it difficult to, uh, to do. If we look at uh, how the students actually found this, um, we have interviewed the students and, and tried to figure out, well, what, what, what was it? Um, they found, as I said, it difficult to, to give feedback in the beginning. Um, it took some time to figure out what good feed, feedback was, stuff like that. Um, then, as, as I also said, they, they found it difficult in the beginning to, to see what you should comment upon when they do the presentation. Uh, then we have something additional, some, some peer feedback that they do on their hand-ins. Um, and that's also something they, they did, which is pretty, uh, also what, what we see in literature is that, well, they learned more from actually doing the feedback rather than uh, from, from reading the feedback. So the students actually found this uh, beneficial for, for their support of being this uh, critique. As I said, we had some additional support for uh, this evaluative judgment or them being able to critique something because they give uh, feedback on three other students' hand in. We use um, a super nice system called uh, PeerGrade where the students uh, can hand in their submission uh, either individually or in groups. I can set that up as a teacher and this is set up so that they can hand in in groups of two. Um, then we have created 
a rubric uh, where the students give some kind of feedback. So this is what they do, and the system automatically distributes the uh, the the uh, assignment. Sorry, or the uh, sorry, the hand-ins to the other students and stuff like that. So they will uh, they will write some kind of uh, feedback on on what the other students do. And this is of course also trying to evaluate the quality of uh, of other students uh, work what we'll like to do next year is also trying to incorporate uh, feedback on my own uh, hand in because that's kind of evaluating the quality of my own work so that will be an additional uh, task we are thinking about uh, giving the students the possibility to do so what did we learn um, well First of all, you need to, as is as written here, you need to curate the dialogue. Um, students find it uh, difficult to, to, in the beginning, to critique other students. They, they have some kind of a little, well, I don't want to say something um, not so nice about uh, my fellow students. So you need to curate that dialogue. You need to make sure that you actually are creating a safe space where the students are feeling safe and saying, well, we are not talking about you as a person. We are talking about this product that, of course, you have made it, but we're actually talking about this video here. We're not talking about you. We're talking about the video and we're talking about the content of the video. The student find it a little difficult to focus on the mathematical part and not the style. So, so we have in the beginning a lot are commenting on, well, you should write a little bit bigger or you should present with a louder voice or something like that. And that's not our purpose here. The purpose is, of course, to talk about the mathematical content and how that the quality of, of that is. So, so that's something that we slowly try to build up using the videos in our class time. A lot of students um, are saying, well, I feel, I think I would like, and, and that's not what we're trying to actually achieve. We're trying to, to have them, well, be professional. So it's not about feeling and, and liking and thinking. This is actually something about the this piece of work here is it actually a valid mathematical argument and stuff like that um, the videos take time for the students to make uh, in the beginning we had the idea well they should all make one uh, each week uh, or each second week sorry um, that's too much it, it 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 takes time for them to uh, to make them and and they we can see a little decline in the number of videos that the students make uh, over time this kind of examination is new to the students, but, but it's actually seen uh, fair by the students and it actually seen as something that evaluates both their uh, mathematical capabilities in, in, in the sense of being able to present something, but also in the sense of being able to, you know, evaluate whether uh, a mathematical argument is, is fair or not. Um, we, as I said, both are focusing on oral and written critique, um, and you also need to correct the written feedback. Uh, so in the beginning, uh, when they hand in their first time, we spend some time in class actually talking about, well, what is good constructive feedback and what is not. Uh, and as I said, we have found a lot of good material on the, on the internet, so, so you do not need to do your own. So this was, just trying to give you some kind of idea that, well, you could hopefully in your course focus a little bit more on what we call evaluative judgment by making that a more active part uh, of your course. So any question, comments, stuff like that? Thank you very much, Jens. <clears throat> I will definitely be referencing to this presentation while preparing my fall courses. Uh, Not only yeah. you get Eminas, I should say that I will also try to employ <laughs> very similar methodology because I believe it is easy to apply it for various disciplines, uh, even though I teach English language. So I believe yeah. it should be useful. That's interesting. One maybe short question. I just wanted you to maybe elaborate a little bit on the 
you know, making uh, that uh, good atmosphere for students to, to speak and communicate. Because from, from, you know, discussions with my colleagues at Vilnius Tech, we say, you know, ah, engineers, the introverts, they don't want to speak, you know, just give me a problem, I will solve it and hand in the paper. I don't want to, you know. <laughs> How do you break that barrier in the beginning of Well, first of all, it show a lot of passion, show a lot of love, show a lot of uh, enthusiasm, show a lot of, um, of goodwill, and also make sure that, well, you, are, you also do some errors and stuff like that. So, so as I said, the first thing that the students evaluate is a video made by me. Um, and, it, and it contains errors, something that I made uh, on purpose, and it also actually contains errors that I did not make on purpose. Um, so, so I also address that and say, well, some was actually made on purpose and some, some were not. It's, it's just like uh, another example when, when I do teach programming, I teach also the programming process. And, and that's also, you know, finding errors and, and sitting there thinking a little bit. Uh, so, so it has to do with, with doing that. And then also uh, when in class, when we, when we actually could be in class, I found it a little more difficult here in, in the digital world. But when we are in class, walking around, talking to the students, making sure uh, to know their names and, uh, and all these kind of um, elements that, that makes up kind of a good connection um, between, uh, between you as a teacher and, and the students. All right, thank you so, so much for your answers and for the presentation generally, great. it was great. Excellent, yeah. So from one flip side to another flip side, I guess that uh, we are already uh, ready to invite the other speaker. Uh, Petri, are you here? Yes, we we'll see you. So I believe that we may give the floor for you. Hello. Thank you. Hello to everybody and uh, nice that you are here. So I will share my slides and uh, then I think we are ready to go. Let's see. Okay. I need to reopen. Okay, we lost uh Petri for a second. No, no worries. We can, we have one more question Actually, for Jens, if you're still there. So we use that time. Yeah. So the question is as following. I tried students to students feedback, but the, the activity is lost. If the student given feedback is not evaluated, you mentioned not to evaluate except to grade the students feedback part. Please give more details how to motivate students to give feedback. Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, well, I think a, a couple of answers here. Uh, one answer is, of course, we make it mandatory. Um, so, so it's that's the stick. Uh, so they have to do it. Um, and then the other answer is is actually um, telling them that well, this is what you do when you come out as an engineer, uh, because well, I have been out in industry and I've been making presentations for people. I've been discussing to with people. I've been doing whatever with people. And it's always about being capable of evaluating the quality of something uh, that I have done. So, so trying just to, you know, make the students aware that, well, this is a definitely a competence that you need is something that I have found uh, helps a lot. So, so motivation here helps a lot. Yeah, motivation always a key word in education, I guess. Okay, Petri, you're, you're ready. Go. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. I had to restart the session, but uh, I think you can see my slides now. Yes, we do. So greetings from Finland. And um, this uh, study is conducted in uh, quite new Tampere University, which is a merge of three universities. And one of them is a technical university. So uh, this study uh, involves technical uni university students who have uh, compulsory engineering mathematics courses, four of them to be taken care of, usually within the first study year. And now we wanted to in introduce uh, quite a new teaching method for us uh, in this, uh, in this uh, context, which is uh, flipped learning and flipped teaching. 
and uh, we decided to make an intervention study so that uh, uh, the students were divided in two teaching groups. One group received the four engineering mathematics courses during time span of nine months with the flipped teaching method and the, the other half received the courses with the traditional, more or less traditional teaching method. method. So actually it's a, a bit wrong to speak about traditional teaching method because we, have, uh, we, have, we don't just have mass lectures and exercises, but it's, it's also containing individual aspects. But uh, this is for, just for the sake, sake of simplicity here, so that I will speak about flipped and rad uh, teaching groups. Of course, the annual intake is something like 1,000 students. So we had also other tracks, but we excluded them from this study. So we have two student populations based on their majors. And, uh, and uh, one received the flipped and the other received the traditional uh, engineering mathematics courses, pedagogical uh, implementation. Now, uh, actually, we had quite large research design, but here today I will speak about three factors. And first of all, we were interested in finding out if the uh, examination score points from four uh, mathematics courses uh, were related to this pedagogical implementation, flipped rad. And of course, we wanted to see how the final grades from these courses might have been related. And uh, the second um, uh, dimension we investigated was uh, self-assessment of their approaches to learning. And uh, we used the quite well-known categorization or dimensionalities of deep approach to learning, surface or unreflected, both, well, both are used for that, and then organized approach to learning. And finally, we also wanted to investigate how the basic psychological needs satisfaction um, uh, relates or not to this, uh, to this uh, uh, longitudinal development. And uh, uh, today I will uh, basically speak about the survey results combined with the objective math skill measurements, but uh, the whole design also included electrodermal activity measurements and a diary method. So, so to speak, like experience sampling method. They are not discussed here. Uh, this, uh, this was a large uh, scale study for us. So we had two collaborating research groups. First group is, is about mathematics lecturers and quite many of them, and they were the teachers in these two implementations. And uh, my group was responsible for data collection and, and uh, uh, we did joint analysis and, and so on. So this was very nice collaboration between the two research groups. Here's the overall design that contains everything. So you can see that there are four courses and the courses were given at the same time. So first course with the flip design and track design took place in late August 19 to early uh, November 19 and so on. So this was like a roughly nine month time span. There was Christmas holidays in between the course two and three. And we follow the normal model of seven weeks teaching. And then there is one rest week when there are some examinations and so on. Uh, also, what you can see that we focus in this presentation only uh, par part of this, uh, this uh, evidence. And we use uh, the blocks one and two with it, with our, with the, within the magenta colored uh, squares or rectangles. And, uh, it shows that we had a survey that was repeated several times uh, in the beginning of, of course, and sometimes a bit later in the course. And then uh, we had, uh, had the data collection of mathematical skills, so final examination, and there were some, some uh, uh, tests that they had to complete. And also uh, 
uh, we use uh, Matt's ability test here to see that uh, when they came into university, do the two groups, FLIP and RAT students, differ in their initial uh, mathematical ability level. Okay, so like I said, I have here three questions and I try to <laughs> answer them as well as I can. So first of all, uh, do uh, students in one or another implementation perform better? And uh, first of all, the final grades, the magenta line is a traditional and the orange line is a flipped implementation. We can see that, uh, uh, that there is a statistically significant difference over time. If you belong to, to flipped group, you tended to get a bit higher, higher final grades. On the other hand, more interestingly, because there is this all kind of uh, uh, activity related components when you give final grades. So we wanted to see how the math mathematical performance actually actually is, is going. And, and you can see that there is no clear indication. They are switching uh, best, performer, best performance titles. So, so um, at the pretest, here uh, was a bit higher, uh, actually statistically significantly higher for flipped students. But then after these courses and we get to the final uh, examination points, we can see that uh, there is no clear trend. After each, four, if each of the four courses, uh, we cannot determine that uh, flipped or trad students would do better. On the other hand, uh, what if we control the pretest score and then rerun the analysis? We can see that still uh, the uh, flipped group is getting uh, that higher final grades, but the statistical significance is not uh, a trend anymore. Of course, we can see that the, when the COVID starts uh, in, in, the, in the first phase of the last fourth course, we can see that the, uh, the final grades tend to drop on traditional group. And if we look at the shared exam, so the examination score points without any phase validity and, and other issues, we can see that, uh, that the tradi traditional group is performing better, slightly better than the flipping group. And that is uh, statistically significant. Uh, um, result here. Okay, so that was about math performance. And then uh, what about uh, the math performance and gender? So in, in, in uh, traditional teaching, we can see that there were the four courses and uh, we had the pretest score here. And, uh, and uh, then uh, we can see the shared exam score here. So we can see that the males tended to perform uh, on a, low, a bit lower level on traditional group, but not that much lower level in all time points when we go to flipped teaching mode. And uh, when we look at the examination score points, we can see a, a bit similar trend. So the males tend to perform a bit uh, weaker, what comes, what comes uh, to uh, second, third and fourth course, course uh, points. But uh, then the result is mixed when we go into flipped teaching group. So we can see a similar trend with the final grades and examination score points here. So um, uh, it would be tempting to say that the males might uh, prefer or benefit more than, than female students from a flipped approach. But then once again, we can look at, we need to look at the frequencies and we can clearly see that this, as this is a technical area area study, the males are dominant class here. So we can find uh, differences, but uh, I wouldn't be too too excited to pronounce that males do better in flipped teaching than females, perhaps. Then we asked about their uh, self-assessment on three scales or dimensions of approaches to learning. Deep approach, I have sample items here. I don't know if you can see them, but uh, deep approach measures your interest 
uh, towards what you are going to learn and you really want to learn the topic you want to make it part of your competence profile and use it perhaps in the future and so on then there is this uh, surface or unreflective approach where you perhaps your goal is to get a good grade or or uh, then you feel that you are not uh, certain that you can learn all the topics and then there is more like a self-regulatory aspect of learning uh, the organized dimension so how you can reserve time and resources and uh, be per perseverant towards the studies and uh, here we can see the trend uh, so the solid lines uh, al always the black color is for flipped uh, groups so the solid lines are for deep and we can see that the solid black line is uh, for flipped student is higher uh, than uh, for the traditional teaching group students in, in five time points. And then we can also see that the uh, very uh, uh, dashed lines uh, are showing the unreflective approach and uh, it, it goes uh, below, uh, below the average values of deep and uh, and surface approaches and uh, there is no trend and then when we look at the organized approach we can see that there is also tendency that uh, that the students who took part in flipped teaching uh, um, self-reported higher higher scores there over time and also uh, uh, here is a more specific snapshot focusing on the COVID issue. So we can see that the course number three was fully before the COVID episode started. And then the fourth course started and roughly uh, after three weeks, the COVID pandemic restrictions hit. And so we fortunately had one measurement just three weeks prior the restrictions and then we had the last measurement five weeks after the restrictions or, or four weeks. So um, we can see that the, the deep and organized levels uh, drop for both groups, but uh, they are not dropping uh, faster or so, so that the difference uh, remains the same. So the flip group, deep and organized self-reported uh, uh, dimensions have higher average scores. Uh, quite uh, uh, interestingly, uh, when the restrictions uh, started, the unreflective, so the one that we really don't want to see in our students perhaps, uh, was getting uh, higher scores by the end or in the last measurement, so, so the trend was the opposite and that, that was quite expected. And the last question is about basic psychological needs satisfaction. Uh, we used scale only to measure the satisfaction and not frustration, uh, because this was repeated uh, measure study and we didn't, do, didn't want to make uh, the repeated surveys too long for students to fill, because we had also other, other theoretical components there. So uh, this is only... Uh, fulfillment or satisfaction of these three um, components. And uh, here are also the sample items. And uh, uh, we can see roughly if we look at the whole data without any time point uh, differentiation, we can see that the, uh, the highest median and perhaps the, the highest uh, values are for the relatedness so that you can see sample items so that uh, you feel that uh, students or teachers care about you at the university and then the second uh, highest was the competence so that you feel that whatever you do in your studies you are getting more competent and, and increasement in your feeling of competence and also the autonomy is that uh, how you feel where the con control what you are going to do comes from whether it's uh, inner control so that you decide what you do how you focus your attention on studies, what you learn, or is it like an externally uh, controlled operation or, or that kind of a, uh, more uh, specifically guided. 
And now, of course, the hypothesis here was that uh, the flipped teaching model would support at least uh, the development of autonomy and, and competence. And of course, uh, the relatedness, because they work more in a small groups and they had uh, this kind of a teacher led weekly sessions more often so that uh, no mass, mass lectures. And what, what we can see here is that uh, the COVID um, seems to be uh, quite, seems to have quite fierce effect on traditional teaching group, but not that kind of effect on flipped teaching group. And uh, we figured out that this might be due because the flipped teaching mode was actually a good preparation for pandemic restrictions. So no live meetings and a lot of online learning and, and uh, utilization of virtual tools like Teams and Zoom and so on. And also build up, building up of small student communities and groups that operate together. So that was the basic idea of the flipped approach so that they use a lot of collaborative components in their learning. On the other hand, the TRAD group, uh, it was quite a shock because uh, they they weren't, the teachers were not that prepared for total, uh, total uh, distance learning mode and uh, uh, they had to rush to put materials online and give instructions uh, how, how they will proceed when they're when when they cannot conduct any more face-to-face -face teaching for a long period of time but uh, you can see that the uh, statistical significance was only present in the last two measurement points but the overall trend was not statistically significant now um, of course if we would have chance to continue the measurements for a longer period of time, I, uh, I think that would be an interesting, interesting data too. And of course, the male-female comparison here. Uh, so, in traditional group, we can see that the autonomy, competence, and relatedness of male students tended to be a, a tad or a bit higher, uh, almost all the time than uh, than for the for the female students. And uh, in the flipped implementation, we can see that the difference is bigger for the males. So the same trend is repeated for both groups. But in the flipped implementation, it seems to be clearer that, uh, that uh, me females self-reported higher satisfaction levels of autonomy and competence. The difference was not uh, significant what comes to relatedness. Okay, so I think uh, this was this was my message for today, and I think we have some time for for discussion and for questions. So I thank you for your attention, and I wish that you found this uh, this uh, study interesting. So thank you. Thank you so much, Petri. We kindly remind all the participants that you are welcome to ask your questions in the Q&A section. And thank you for a great, great presentation. So we have the very first question <laughs> from the audience. Yes, yeah. Dimitri. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Petri. It was really nice. You just put it all our methods into numbers and we can see. So a, a little uh, technical thing that we didn't catch, I didn't catch. What is the, what's the difference between shared exam grade and final grade? What was that? Because yes, the, yes. The, the difference was that the final final grade was the teachers uh, from zero to five grade for each student that involves the course activity, the face <laughs> value issues, and also how you perform in final exam. But it contains. Um, uh, the, the, the data in order to dictate that final grade is a longitudinal. So it's like a cumulative, uh, a cumulative uh, show of your uh, presence and skills over the seven week period. So you do your weekly ex exercises, you participate in the small group actions. So it's not purely an indicator of mathematical ability. But on the other hand, the shared exam score 
is the score from mathematical assignments that you do and you get zero points or you get 100 points and those are fully comparable between the flip and trad group so they both groups of students uh, did the same mathematical uh, tests so in order for allow this kind of a, a comparison we have to use these examination scores instead of final grades and of course there is a teacher effect so we had seven to eight teachers and they were perhaps mixing across the implementation so one of them was teaching only thread the other was teaching only free somebody was teaching both and so on so it was a bit mixed and and we haven't inputted inputted or implemented that in our statistical analysis that would be one option to to make this kind of a uh, cross interaction so that each student would be connected to all all teachers that he or she might have during the courses but uh, that that adds one additional level to the analysis and uh, it's a, it's a bit more complicated in order to get the analysis work because we don't have that big sample and we have many measurement points and variables but yes so i hope this answered to your question so so yes yeah yeah thank you so we couldn't find uh, objective evidence that in our case the flipped uh, teaching mode was actually producing higher mathematical skills or ability for students in all cases if we take snapshots we can get from one course to another that they perform but it's it's a as you saw it it is like a, a bit mixed results and now we are replicating the study so we have another round going on right now ending uh, on, on this month actually so we get another set of data a bit bigger plus 700 students this time so i'm eager to see on that data whether this finding will will replicate so that there is no difference between yeah yeah that was my follow-up question so of course like a in a in a scientific research you wouldn't say you know the brave claim that there's no difference but maybe you can say it for now because from what i've seen is uh and there's no actual difference in the results in the in the mathematical capabilities but it seems like students well feel better about the course about the flip one they mm -hmm. they just feel better about their own performance even though they get the same grade could that be your conclusion yeah you are right so all the psychological dimensions that we studied clearly uh, quite clearly showed improvement in flipped teaching groups so uh, i didn't speak about self-efficacy but that is one we also measured goal orientations so mastery uh, performance uh, approach and performance avoidance and then we had the emotions uh, and then we had this i talk here about the approaches to learning and uh, basic psychological needs but the overall trend is that the flipped group tends to start from the same same uh, initial measurement level but over time the distance between the track and flip <laughs> group self assessment uh, tends to increase so that the flipped students self report higher values in the end so i think that is so we speak about the soft skills or attitudes towards towards learning mathematics or whatever your self esteem and i think that flipped, uh, flipped uh, implementation seems to support that kind of uh, development. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your answer. And we have one more question from the audience this time. So thank you. Nice presentation. Did you investigate Did you investigate the time used for studying in traditional and flipped settings? In the meaning, did students in the flipped setting use more time for studying compared with students in traditional setting? That's a good question. We have some, uh, some uh, indicator data from our system uh, that shows, uh, for example, video watching time. And uh, that, that's not a very good indicator because the flipped students were instructed to watch a lot of videos, but they were all also available for the trad students. Uh, so they watched many times more videos. And now uh, the total uh, number of hours or minutes uh, spent on studying we have a qualitative interview data. And based on that, we can definitely say that the students who were in a flipped group, 
they felt that they had to work harder and work <laughs> work more. So it's more intensive way of, of learning. And especially when you come from upper secondary school or gymnasium, where you are, you have quite, in Finnish model, you have their quite structured studies and you don't have to make that much plans on your own. And then you jump to the university studies and as it is internationally shown in, in many, many countries that when you start as a freshman in, in university, the first year is the hardest because you have to learn new things, learn uh, self-regulation, self-monitoring assessment and so on and so on. So that uh, perhaps the, the measurement points that we used here might a bit mix that results. But yes, answer to that question, uh, I don't have a specific uh, numeric data that I could use, but uh, definitely the flipped students had to spend more hours on, on learning. Of course, there are trad, trad group students who also spend a lot of hours on learning, but they were not uh, in that sense, I won't use word forced, but <laughs> encouraged to do so. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Jens had another one. Jens, are you there? Yeah, sure. Um, I was just wondering if you have done any other kind of the cluster analysis on, on your data, because, well, you, you have done this gender, uh, trying to figure out, well, whether gender was, uh, was something that, that uh, where flipped kind of was um, more favorable for, for one gender over the other. Uh, it could also be that, well, if, if it was more favorable for kind of the students who scored low on the entry uh, evaluation that you had on their mathematical capabilities or other kinds of, of cluster analysis. Have, have you done any, any, any yeah. of these sorts? Yes, we actually divided the students in three groups based on their uh, math, math performance over time. And uh, the problem with the, with the pretest with this uh, data collection was that the flip group students were more instructed to self-study uh, with the existing online material before taking the math pretest. So the math pretest was based on upper secondary school mathematics. And uh, we believe that that was the reason why the flipped group students had statistic higher uh, math pretest score. And actually, when we examined the actual uh, examination score points after the courses, the, the, the difference disappeared. So yes, but we composed a variable with three classes <clears throat> and uh, then we have run also all the analysis with that one variable or, or performing the analysis. And interestingly, uh, I can only now uh, speak about the self-efficacy analysis, which I'm doing right now, is that uh, the self-efficacy tends to stay on the highest level across all measurement points, except the first one, which is the initial measurement point, across the measurement point, if you belong to the highest math performance group of students. So you get something like 66.7% correct out of the uh, course uh, course assignments. And secondly, the intermediate group, uh, which score from 33 to 66.6%, uh, .6%, they will get the second place and they will go uh, steadily on self-efficacy <laughs> throughout the time on that level and they are not intersecting. And the lowest performing group will all the time go on the lowest level. So these kind of results we are looking right now so very good question and uh, unfortunately i don't have the data here but uh, yes definitely that is what we are going to use in our analysis all right thank you so much petri unfortunately uh, time is not on our side and we are supposed to proceed so this time uh, we're giving the floor to you, uh, associate professor hans peter uh Christensen, I hope that the pronunciation wasn't wrong. So uh, you are welcome to continue. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, we still don't hear you. Just could you turn your microphone on? Oh yeah, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. So I'll share my screen. Um, yeah. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. 
there it should be. Yes, perfect. So I will talk about the umbrella courses at the, the Technical University of uh, Denmark. Uh, but uh, first, I'll just say a few words about my background. After having jobs in universities and industries, I came to DGU Learning Lab, where I designed the uh, teaching the training for new teachers. And during that time, I became involved in the international network of active learning in engineering education. So you will see I'm very much into active learning. But after some years, my focus changed more to curriculum development and I became head of study program for Arctic engineering. That means that I spent nine years in Greenland and then I returned uh, and became head of study program in the professional bachelors in civil engineering. And it's in civil engineering that uh, we have this um, umbrella uh, courses. So to give you an overview, the two first semesters at the civil engineering program, we have umbrella courses and umbrella courses are big courses. They take up uh, two thirds of the time on both first and second semester. And what we will focus on uh, here is the uh, is an umbrella course on the first semester. So <clears throat> what is the background for the theoretical learning background? As you could expect, then the, I think that the most important thing is activation. So this um, gas station uh, teaching where you try to feel knowledge in the head of the student does not work. So you have to listen to grandma who says it's the one who works that uh, learns. And during my time with uh, teaching and learning, I became more and more uh, convinced that motivation is the main thing. If you are motivated, you can learn everything. If you're not motivated, you cannot learn anything. Unfortunately, not all students are very motivated, so we have to help them. So now come some different uh, learning uh, methods and need-based learning. That means that you have to set the students in a situation where she has to learn something in order to do uh, something. And could also, uh, take this situated learning because what you learn is very dependent on the context you're in. So if you want the student to learn something they can use in later life, then you have to put them in an environment and situation that looks as much as possible to their further job situation. Of course, it has this problem that transfer is very difficult so when you learn in a given environment, it may be difficult to transfer your learning to other environments. You probably have the experience from mathematics, what you, the students learn in math class is very difficult to use in applied uh, courses because you change the names of the variables and so on. So in some way you have to also to try to do a little generalization even if you put the students in a special environment. Then you have sp spiral learning. Uh, it's not possible to learn everything at the beginning, but in order to get a, an idea what you're doing, you have to have a kind of overview, but the overview doesn't tell you much unless you also know some of the details. So you know a little bit of overview, a little bit of details, and. <clears throat> in the first uh, spiral and then you put more and more on. And this is in um, accordance with the CDIO framework, which uh, we use at DTU. Uh, so CDIO stands for conceive, design, implement and operate. In this first course, we don't have time for operate, but we 
So I, the first three spirals, conceive, design, and implement. And luckily, they correspond uh, really uh, rather good with the phases that you have to go through when you are building a house or do all kinds of construction. So the last thing here is just in time teaching. If you have to teach your students something, you should teach it to them at the time when they need this teaching. It's a kind of difficult thing to do in practice, but uh, that's what our goal is. So <clears throat> what is the methodology we use? Well, it's group work and the group work is not that uh, strange anymore. There's a lots of group work going on. But uh, what we uh, have tried to do is to add some focus on the individual learning. Many uh, are afraid of free riders in uh, group work. I'm not that uh, afraid of that. Uh, but there is some tendency to uh, surface learning, as we have heard of surface and deep learning uh, previously, and in group work. So in order to make sure that the students uh, also got the deep learning, and we also focus on the individual learning. And uh, I think that may be the thing that different uh, this uh, umbrella courses from other courses that could look like the structure we have here. I'll come back to this individual learning checks. So how does an uh, umbrella course uh, look like? Yeah, it's uh, built around a project. <clears throat> and then we have theory modules uh, included, built in in the course. And this uh, theory modules ideally should uh, come when the students need it uh, for the project. So the module uh, modules uh, should uh, prepare the theory when it's necessary in the project. And at the same time, the project should uh, help the students to understand the theory they are learning. It should be kind of illustration. So we think this uh, two-way um, interaction is uh, very good in this uh, course. So the project is an illustration but it's also uh, a way to make a need for the students to learn these theories, theory modules we have. As you may <coughs> could see from the illustration, there's many theory modules in the beginning of the course. At the end of the course, it's a pure uh, project work. And you can see it's a long course, it takes uh, 15 weeks, all in all. So what is the project? Yeah, the project is to design a house, design a one family house. It may not be so advanced as uh, this on the illustration here, but still it has to be in two floors and has to be some holes and floor heating and have to be a mechanical insulation system. So it's not that uh, simple, but um, on the other hand, we uh, uh, limit the students' possibilities when they design their house. So we don't want round uh, circular houses or something that they cannot uh, do any calculations on. So what uh, do they need in order to design this house? Uh, well, so what theory modules do we need? Yeah, of course, we need the thing that you need in order to build a house. That's about construction. And of course, energy is very important nowadays. And you need some pipes in and out. But a very important thing, uh, which is more or less the 
the biggest uh, theory module that's about the digital construction uh, building information uh, modeling and nowadays it's uh, much more than just uh, making a 3d drawing it's uh, also about all the calculations about heat transfer and so on is in this model so it's a, a, a big thing in uh, designing a building that uh, it has all be so build this digital model and we also have a little bit about planning but that's not that much because it is still is uh, on the first semester and then we have a special learning object in group work because uh, group work is uh, very difficult so uh, it's not uh, something that the students can they may have had it from high school but uh, the way you use group work or teamwork at the university is uh, different so we have to focus on group work since this is the first uh, last uh, course they have so we work in uh, groups of six. Uh, it's a maximum number of people in a group which has to function probably for may even be more uh, better, but we have a lot of students uh, under and up to 150. So it uh, becomes a lot of uh, groups to keep track of. So we start with groups of six and I call them permanent groups because as no group hopping uh, between groups uh, when we have formed the groups in the beginning. And I should say a little bit about room forming because uh, as they students don't know each other very well, we are forming the group. And uh, a couple of years ago, we started with a new way of forming groups from uh, their study habits because some of the problem that arise is in groups. Uh, often when they want to work, some want to be uh, working in the morning and some in the afternoon and some have work to do. And it's important for group work that they uh, have time together. So <clears throat> this uh, course starts three weeks into the semester. So in the first three weeks, uh, we ask the students to register in a spreadsheet when they come to the campus and when they uh, left and then based on that we made those uh, groups unfortunately the next year the covid came and then this uh, study uh, habits uh, was quite different so we could not really use this method any longer so we only really tried it for one year so we don't have any much experience with it but it looks as if it was a a good way to form the, the groups. So the permanent groups, they have to stay the same groups all the way through the semester, through the course for 15 weeks. If some groups uh, break up, they cannot uh, join the other groups, then they have to continue as separate groups. So that's a pressure on the groups to try to get it to work. And we help them in different way uh, we make some tools for them and one of those who we have introduced is a weekly planning uh, spreadsheet for them so uh, in, at every week they have to fill in this spreadsheet and uh, deciding who is going to do which work in the next uh, week and then the next week they have to go back to the plan to see if they actually have done what they have planned to do. So I think that's a, a good uh, tools and many groups like this uh, uh, spreadsheet in order to keep track of their work and how it was progressing and if all the students were doing what they were uh, supposed to do. And uh, to help them further, uh, each uh, group as a teacher, as facilitator, and this uh, process facilitator uh, has 
<clears throat> meeting with the groups every second week and they're not supposed to talk about the project but only to talk about the process how the group is working group work is difficult so you need to help the students at, very much uh, at the first semester so what about this individual work i was talking about yes um, in order to make sure that all the students are really studying and learning uh, the theory and so on we have some uh, what we call learning checks it's a multiple choice check one hour with around 20 questions i would have preferred that it was with closed book but my colleagues they didn't agree with that so it was with open books but the questions should be about understanding so it's not about calculating or looking things up but uh, uh, try to answer the questions uh, from what they have learned and of course when it was an open book lots of students used a lot of time looking for answers instead of thinking themselves unfortunately and we had the same experience as some people before us when they start to test the students understanding they get disappointed because uh, you have to make very simple questions uh, in understanding in order to get a good response so mm -hmm. this is a simple question and that's uh, actually the level the question should be here at first semester and the question is well, you have four forces that uh, engage with this uh, metal plate here and it can uh, evolve around the O and the question is uh, which uh, force will give the max torque that's a simple question but uh, not all students can actually answer this question <clears throat> the uh, learning checks are not part of the final exam but they have to pass the test in order to be able to uh, participate in the exam but the grade is purely uh, determined by the, the final exam so uh, here is uh, the whole uh, overview of the semester typical semester how it would be in order to uh, understand this uh, diagram you should know how the weekly schedule at DTU is organized they are organized in four hour modules you have four hours in the morning four hours in the afternoon every day and it's up to the, the teacher how to organize the organize uh, those four hours if they will do it traditionally or flip classes or whatever they will do in those uh, four hours uh, periods so all the colored boxes here in my diagram is uh, four hour this four hour teaching blocks and we have, as I said, we go through different uh, phases. The first is the idea phase where the students have to come up with suggestions, ideas to the house they want to design. And then they have design phase. And the third phase, they have to make a detailed uh, description of how the different uh, thing for the house should be uh, constructed. And in the end of each uh, phase uh, we have a presentation and this presentation is a uh, feedback to the group uh, to see how they have been doing and also to give them some comments how they should proceed uh, what thing they should maybe correct to <clears throat> before they go uh, start with the next phase we have a peer uh, presentation in the second phase where the students do a presentation to another group uh, so they can have some feedback from the other group and maybe 
had to change a couple of things before they do the uh, presentation for the teachers. And the presentation at the end of the third um, phase is the exam. And as I said, uh, uh, all the grades are given based on this uh, final presentation. It's a group presentation, but you also uh, make sure to ask the different uh, students in the group uh, some questions because we are required to give uh, individual grades to every student. So we organize this with all these uh, uh, theory modules, and you can see there's a lot of teachers uh, involved. And uh, here we also have to go to compromise with the uh, spiral learning, because ideally they should have a little bit of all those uh, different topics in each phase. But uh, we decided that uh, it would also be uh, too much for the students if they have had six six uh, different topics every week. So uh, in the beginning, in building techniques modules, they get a little bit of everything. But then in the next phase, we focus more on the construction, the mechanical construction. And then in the final uh, phase, we uh, focus on energy and installation. So it's a kind of compromise. This also has to be a practical uh, implementation. It should be possible also with coordinating with so many teachers. And then we have these learning checks. And uh, we have three learning checks. And the learning check, they uh, function as uh, individual feedback. The group presentation is feedback to the group, but here they have a chance to get uh, individual feedback. How are they doing? Are they able to answer the questions or are they something they should uh, read up on? And in this course, we have a learning check with questions for all the different topics. This uh, umbrella course on the second uh, semester, they have a learning check for each uh, individual theory module. We also have some exercises. We would like to have more, but it's difficult to make exercises uh, with a lot of students in civil engineering. It takes up a, a lot of uh, space. So we have only few uh, practical exercises, unfortunately. So at the end, uh, how did the students like this? Uh, so we, of course, made a lot of evaluation and <clears throat> they had a high learning outcome. Most students thought they were have a good learning. They learned a lot from this uh, course. Uh, unfortunately, the student didn't think there was a very good coordination between the different uh, elements in this uh, course. And of course, that was one of the idea with this uh, umbrella course that they should give an idea of how things uh, were connected. So I mean, the pessimist view of this is that um, the teacher didn't actually coordinate rather well, and there may be some truth to it, because uh, many of the teachers came from industry and they had uh, their own way uh, of doing things. Even if you spent a lot of time trying to coordinate, they still uh, told the students uh, in a different way. And that's also OK, because the students have to realize how is uh, real life. But it's a little hard on the first semester to not be given exact uh, the same instruction for the uh, two different teachers. We also have the problem that uh, there was a lot of <clears throat> digital design in this course, as I said, and the digital design teacher was very ambitious. So he was flying very high, and but many of the 
teachers coming from industry, they were not that much uh, into digital design. So it could also be there that there was some uh, differences between the different teachers. The positive optimist view is that the reason why the students uh, gave low score in coordination is because we were uh, giving them too high expectations. We were telling them that this will all fit together. And in a normal uh, course, uh, normal semester, if you had six different uh, courses with each topic, they wouldn't expect them to have very much coordination. They would hope that this uh, coordination will come later in uh, the uh, story. But uh, here we were trying to give them uh, the beginning of the first semester and uh, maybe they were having too high expectations of how this will work out in reality. Okay, I think that was my presentation. Thank you very much, Hans. Uh, we almost used up all time, but I have a quick question. Maybe you mentioned about uh, uh, forming groups of students and that you didn't worry about those free riders, uh, etc. How do you approach that? How do you make uh, a, a group of students, you know, just uh, do you have a strategy like the best ones with the, the low performers or? No, uh, as I tried to explain, I, um, we uh, were trying to form group based on the groups, uh, on the individual students' study habits. So we would like to put students in, uh, together in groups, those who like to work early in the morning uh, and those who do, wouldn't mind being late in the afternoon, they could have their own group and that's uh, what we, we, we try to do and I think it it works rather well but uh, unfortunately uh, the COVID came and then there was some quite different uh, conditions for the groups. Actually I think even if this course was not at all planned for online teaching it actually uh, the students and the teachers adopted very well uh, if they uh, have some tools uh, for uh, we're making group works uh, at the distance, we uh, uh, had the SharePoints uh, where they could uh, share uh, their files and we used the Teams where they could communicate and communicate with their facilitator. So it's always a, a big question how to make uh, groups uh, when the students don't need, uh, don't know each other. Later in the study, they have some say themselves how they want to make groups. But I don't believe that it's a good idea to put all the good students together because normally it makes a bad group because good students are normally not interested, they're not interested in working with other students. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, we'll leave other questions for the final discussion. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. As we are running out of time, yes, that is entirely so. And that means that this is a very high time to you switch to another topic of online learning environments. So let us welcome two speakers this time. And if you are ready to start, we are ready to listen. Sounds great. Yes, great. <laughs> Hi, and welcome to the part of online learning environments. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are connecting to the earlier speakers because it has been so interesting listening to the earlier speak and speakers. Um, we will build upon this active learning and also learning in communities, but we will maybe we'll also add something personal. And who are we? Well, should I start? Uh, I'm Lars, uh, working as an education developer in Meladal and with Lotta and also Linköping University. Been working with this for well more than 20 years and and it's been a lot of networking, international networking, national 
when I worked as a teacher, I, I worked with problem-based learning, and that has also been a core of my kind of educational mission after that. And, and for 10 years, more and more interest in, in the online world and, and how we can kind of bring this into and connect the online and the campus uh, in, environments with each other. And I'm an educational developer at Maladolin University at our Hari ed Education Center. Uh, I will work with online as an online learning designer. I help, help teachers to design their learning online. I also have a master's degree of education. So that's me. And, and I'll share a little, little bit more personal later. Uh, and now it's time for you to start sharing something personal. Because we'd like to ask, start off by asking you, uh, what is the, what roles do, role or roles does the teacher have in creating good online le learning environments? We have been discussing this, but it's also very, uh, uh, COVID has put the point on this is, has um, been a very uh, active discussion about the teacher role. So I think Lars has shared the link. So if you want to give some words for the teacher role, uh, we have been discussing pedagogy a lot and the teacher role a lot. I'll put it up and we'll see what we get here. It's so interesting to learn something from you all here. Dropping in, we're about 57 here and we have six answers, so please. <laughs> Coordinator, facilitator, motivator, guidance, support, trust, mentor, good humor. Yeah, interesting that it's not only subject related, it's a little bit emotional also. Initiator for new ideas. And the facilitator is a big one here. Yeah, maybe we can go back to that later on, because now we have some answers in. Great diversity, and I think and you can also, there was someone said that it's changed, and I think we need to discuss that a lot. Yeah, yeah. Would, if we have asked that question uh, one and a half year ago, what would everyone have said? It would have been interesting. So, a facilitator or... A guide and um, also the, the um, personal emotions what you thought was important. So uh, what about this community? Well, I'd like to start off by sharing something about my personal journey uh, as the role of the teacher. Uh, because when you share something personal, you start by start belonging to a learning community, as you have shared something personal now. I started off as an engineer, a system developer. I worked for an engineer in 15 years. Uh, then I became a teacher, an ICT teacher also and also an educational developer since 2015 in higher education. And when I started this, 
as an engineer, I saw uh, the reality as much as true, true and false at a more object, objectivist point of view. I thought about gamification, individual learning, and that there was one true path that we had to follow. When I educated uh, and became a teacher, I got more interested in who is the student? How do the students learn, want to learn and needs to learn and what is le good learning activity? So a more constructivism point of view. And then when I'm uh, this educational developer, I have a more of a uh, social constructivism point of view, where I see diversity as an asset, that we challenge each other together, that we can go beyond the path, that we can learn wider from each other and then investigate together. And this is connected to both long, lifelong learning and also learning for a sustainable future. Because I believe that these are the essential skills that students need to create a sustainable future. Uh, and then I participated in a course, uh, a course for educational developers and teachers in higher education. Uh, it's about open network learning. It's called open network learning. And there I experienced that you can create a real learning community online. Because we were in, in groups, problem-based and inquiry-based. We met only in on online meetings, but also in asynchronous communication between meetings. We were trying out things together and exploring together and creating a joint understanding. We had very, very much fun, even though we have never met. I know what languages they, they know. I know who had a cat that sadly died. We had a, a sad moment uh, in the course. I know what instruments they play. And this was so interesting to experience that though we have never met in person, we have met very much in person online. And this is what many people I think have experienced during COVID. Uh, I've listened to Anne-Marie Ferrell at Eden, at one Eden webinar. And she described that before COVID, uh, a lot of course places were just a file cabinet. But when COVID hit, the need was to create an alive, vibrant space where teaching and learning is ha happening. And how do you construct this vibrant place? Well, you have to have, I think, <laughs> both synchronous and asynchronous parts in, in building this joint community. Because when you meet uh, synchronous in meetings like this, it's more social. It is less demanding. Uh, you can uh, say, say questions and so on. You don't have to think them through as much if, if, if you would write them. Uh, so the synchronous create a more social environment. It's easier with the synchronous anyways. And the asynchronous is more flexible in time though. Uh, and you can use it to collect information before you meet in a meeting or discuss after meetings in between. Uh, you have more time for reflection and it also requires more reflection. So the best vibrant learning community is made up of these two in combination. So what did I learn more then? 
uh, well, I learned about learning by inquiry. To have a challenge, to have a critical discourse and reflection, that, as we have heard from previous speak speakers. Uh, but also the meaning, the motivation part, uh, which I think Hans Peter talked about, uh, choice and there's diversity of perspective. And we also strived for a shared understanding. And I also learned about the theory behind this. Uh, and also to more focus on on what the student does, and as many have pointed out earlier. And in this uh, community, we can challenge each other to go without, outside our borders. And I also learned that social presence is important for the learning. Uh, in this model, the community of inquiry framework, uh, there are three different parts. We have the social presence on the left, uh, where it's emotions, it's the feeling of belonging. It is the cats and the language and so on, the, these discussions, but also built when you learn together. Social presence is built along the ride. The cognitive pet presence is more about the subject that is on the table. You have a triggering event, event and then you explore the, the subject together and create a shared understanding. And the teaching presence, uh, it's all about setting up the course, of course, designing the course and uh, instructing in the beginning. And that, but then it's a joint shared responsibility uh, to, to take on uh, responsibility for your own learning and for the group's learning. So it's not teacher presence, it's teaching presence because it's a shared point of view. Um, okay, I should go over to that one. Uh, and there are categories and indicators to, to see what kind of communication there is. And this framework community inquiry is widely used to investigate communication and see the de degree of community that is on the table. Well, community inquiry is one framework that I have learned to appreciate. Are there more concepts and frameworks, Lars? Yeah, so I can share a bit. Uh, so that's fine, now you can see my my screen, can't you? Um, I would like to you know, connect to what, I mean, what Lotta has told her journey and, and, and experiences and, and also I think just widening uh, all the great examples we've heard in this session on, on uh, how to work with flipped classroom and so on uh, and, and just widen it into to, uh, the whole uh, larger context of education development. Uh, I think there's a lot of frameworks and concepts that we already already know about and and more or less. I mean, we have problem-based learning, collaborative learning, challenge-based learning. Uh, and, and I think all of these concepts or, and methods of, of working, I mean, depending on how you view it as a concept or, or, or framework or, or, or method, it's, it's all about uh, creating an engagement activity uh, authenticity into the learning process for students. Uh, and we have a lot of, of, of frameworks also coming in that, that kind of tells the same language that the whole education for sustainable development framework from UNESCO 
and the way they think thinking about education uh, talks about kind of problem-based learning and, uh, and collaborative learning. We have the community inquiry that Lotta showed, but also all concepts like learning a community that, that kind of from many years ago has been uh, a, a way of thinking uh, about changing education. And then we have network learning and connectivism that I think are more related to, to the, the digital era. Uh, and I think what's common for this is the recognition of that a social dimension is learning uh, in learning is needed and to create learning communities. And, and how do we do that in different ways? And I think that was also in the presentations that we've heard uh, before uh, that, that was always trying to do group work getting groups together and so on. Uh, and if we look back at, at this from learning communities in educational context, it's about organizing students and faculty into smaller groups, encouraging integration of curriculum, which will, I think the spiral way of thinking is one way, but uh, connecting different topics and different subjects to each other. Um, it's about helping helping students to establish a, uh, academic and social support networks and, and socialization into, into the expectations of higher education and what the education is about and bringing faculty together in more meaningful ways. It was also shown that you need to work together. You cannot have your own course. You need to uh, work a lot more collaboratively as teachers as well. Uh, and that's both faculty and students are focusing on the outcomes, the learning outcomes, and, and what is this to lead? Why do we do this? Uh, and I think it's offering also a critical lens for examining the first year experience. We need to start already from day one uh, to introduce students and to invite students into learning communities. Uh, and if we look into the, into the digital era, we have this network learning concept, I mean, which is about openness, self-directedness. Uh, we have that's a, the purpose in the collaborative and co collaborative process, support, support, but also a lot of assessment. How do we kind of, we not, maybe must need, meet, need to change assessment that we work with this in, in different ways as an ongoing learning process. And the connectivist idea that the network is of learning, the way we connect with each other and different nodes of knowledge uh, uh, is important and the connected network learning and knowledge building. And, and as you can see, it's all about self-directed learning, inquiry-based collaborative learning environments and using digital learning media in different ways. Uh, just connecting, learning communities and connectivists from, from what Siemens says. Uh, uh, it's about participation in communities. It's about social networking. It's about working with groups in different ways. Um, and that learning is really consists of, of uh, retrieving information from self, others and machines, bringing in the, te the technology. And the collaboration in creating knowledge is not individual creation of knowledge anymore. Uh, it's about applying information to current contexts. And that's where we have the authenticity, for example. And what we ask for students is that we need to, they need to support them in developing how to cope with compl complexity, contradictions, uh, larger quantities of information, uh, and, and to seek out various uh, sources of information, but also how to sustain a learning community and network. And this relates very much to, to I think, the sustainable development goals uh, and, and the competences there. Uh, and I think we might be, need to reconsider how much should we instruct and, and, and organize everything for students so it's easy to learn. Uh, we need to involve students in this complexity. Uh, just like you, as Lotta mentioned, uh, um, an example of, of an net open network learning course, uh, it, it, th this was created in 2013-14. Uh, we thought that we need to uh, have a course for teachers to experience and to learn about uh, how to be in the online world. Uh, so open network learning. So it's a course, it's community and an approach where we try to 
uh, where we started to experiment on how can we apply these principles of, of pedagogy from problem-based learning, network learning, connectivism, and so on. And how can we create a community that is solely online? Uh, and how does this work? And it, it has worked out fantastically uh, in different ways. So I will just briefly show you different aspects of this design as an example. Um, if we have the ONL community, we have it's a collaboration between several different uh, universities, and this, as a course, is offered for teachers at at these universities. Uh, so here you can see they have a lot of Swedish universities uh, where where teachers join the course. We have from Finland, we have from uh, other countries in Europe, uh, Switzerland, Germany and also from abroad, from Singapore and South Africa. Uh, and the open part is that we also invite open learners, anyone in the world who is interested and would like to kind of join the community and the course, we offer places for that. So in that sense, it is an open course. Uh, and all of these institutions provide resources in form of, of uh, facilitators uh, and participants into the course. So. Uh, it, it, it is kind of placed outside each of the universities. So the ownership is, is collaborative in, in its way as well. So the way we organize it is that here you can see all these small circles with an eight in, that's PBL groups, what we call them. Uh, PBL groups with eight participants uh, and mixed from all these universities, which means that we get uh, interculture and international uh, aspect of the course all the time. Uh, and for each of these uh, groups, we have a facilitator, which is the square hair. And the facilitator comes from any of these universities. Uh, and we also have the triangle, which is a co-facilitator. Uh, anyone who's done the course can join to get the facilitator perspective on it. So in, in pair with the facilitator to work with this. Uh, so that's kind of organizing for it. And I think just breaking down large group, we can, as you can see here, this is about 120 participants. And, and the whole group of facilitators is about 30, 35. Uh, so it becomes really communities, uh, a large community, but also small communities. Uh, so just briefly about the design, if you see the overview, the course runs over 12 weeks uh, and you can see here, we have started with a lot of uh, getting started and connecting. We know the importance of social connection in the beginning. Uh, and um, so therefore it's already two weeks for these things. Uh, and then we have four main topics, two week topics uh, with a similar uh, layout for each topic, which means that you recognize once you've done topic one, you can improve your process for topic two and so on. Uh, we have a reflection week where you kind of stop and see where am I as a group and individual. And we have a lot last topic, topic five here, which is uh, about kind of what have I learned and what will I bring with me to my practice. So the, the, the components here is a large community space for everyone, facilitators uh, and participants here. And each PBL group have their own learning space with uh, collaborative documents uh, and uh, discussion forum and so forth. And, and only the individual, each individual participant writes a learning blog. So this, these are the main components. And then we also have common course activities, webinars and tweet chats with invited experts from around the world on the different topics. Uh, I will not go into the topics, you can read more about, about this. Uh, the topics are about open network learning. Uh, and the example structure for a two week topic is that, that PBL group gets a topic introduction on the, from the main page, a scenario, and then decide on group meetings, synchronous. Uh, the group has their own space with discussion and collaborative documents. And at the end of the topic, 
each PBL group shares a presentation to all the other groups about what, what kind of questions did we uh, in, inquire into and, and what did we work with and what, did we, what were our answers to these questions. And on the individual, you have an individual reflection into a learning blog with peer commenting. So th this is just an example where we try to put these more general pedagogical concepts into, into play, into a completely online environment, and many wants to come back. So anyone interested, uh, we are still interested in international collaborators. Uh, and I, and I, can, I can see that we have several here also on, in, in the Nordic. Uh, so we have already from a lot from Finland and so on. So this is uh, the course starting again in, uh, in September. So anyone interested and you will have the link, maybe you can paste the link uh, Lotta in, in the chat uh, and so on. So I think creating here yeah, some personal takeaways, community building, we must do that a lot more. Inviting students as co-owners, co-creators of learning and knowledge. We need to reflect and rethink teacher and student roles, I think. And that's been on the agenda looking many years back, also in the, for example, the Horizon Report, where the, the roles uh, are needed to discuss, be discussed uh, and to balance the role in different expert designer facilitator and to organize so this possible for good communication and interaction. So uh, thanks a lot for, for listening and uh, stop share and see if we can, we have any questions and. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars Slaughter. Just in time, I should say one minute <laughs> left. So maybe uh, we could switch right away to the questions. And uh, if there are any more of the questions, we might proceed uh, during the discussion session. So uh, Lotta, just uh, one thing from my side, uh, you have posted the results for all of us. And uh, well, you have asked the question, what is our opinion? What is the role of the teacher in that online learning? Uh, what about you personally? What do you think is the role of the teacher here? Yeah, I think I think your your picture, all of you, about this is very relevant because uh, to facilitate learner learning is the the main point. I think. And how do we do that? How we how do we keep student engaged, motivated, and active? That that's our goal. Not not to lecture only. Maybe we have to lecture also. But we have to keep the students active and what, how do we do that and who are the students? That's the important thing. And I think to succeed that we need to think about, think about it as learning communities where we really invite students to, to uh, have their own um, oh, the ownership of their own learning and being co-creators. Uh, why shouldn't we? Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. So you showed a lot of this uh, uh, educational theory just reminded us of a few things but uh, then I was thinking and remembering uh, I think Ryder just mentioned the research of what happened during COVID and what what has changed so you, do you think you need to rewrite some of those books you you know citing Shapiro 1999 it, after COVID does does it just proves those theories or or things actually changed something changed I think everything that's come with COVID in, in all reports, all webinars, all everything that's written in, in, in for example, the, the university, uh, European University Association uh, vision for, uh, for 2030. I mean, all of these pick up these basic pedagogic ideas uh, again. And we, we need to kind of, uh, and that's what's interesting with the open network learning course, it hasn't, the COVID hasn't affected the course at all. No, and it, it enlightens also the climate crisis, which is made the big crisis ahead of us, that, that these are the kind of education that we need for even for that. Yeah. yeah. yeah great. True, thank you. We have just one more shout out from Jana. Just he, uh, you probably could read it, but he, he, she's, she's saying, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that he, she participated in the ONL uh, several years ago and she highly highly recommends it so yeah we will we will look into that uh, 
website. Definitely. Yes, oh. definitely. <laughs> and that is something for the audience to consider. So no, oh. one more time that we are giving only the useful information. Here. Okay, now smoothly transitioning to the session discussion. I uh, give one word to Professor Essa to generalize our discussion. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. This is Esa Rasanen from, from Tampere University in Finland. Um, I'm the Vice Dean for Education in the Faculty of Engineering and uh, Natural Sciences. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the NordTech uh, colleagues and friends for putting this together, and uh, especially Gedi Minas and, uh, and Alisa for this, uh, for this excellent work you have been doing. And um, yeah, so uh, just to remind everyone, uh, we, we might have some new uh, people in the audience. In the first session in the morning, we heard what technology has to offer in engineering education. And uh, now in this second session, we had uh, really a very diverse and deep palette of different aspects that are really becoming mainstream now in, in, in teaching and engineering education. So we heard about online learning environments just, uh, just now, and then we heard about flipped learning, uh, utilizing group work. Um, and then uh, in the beginning, Jens was describing a new implementation based on, on, on uh, intensive use of videos and, and uh, peer review of the students. So all these aspects are, are really becoming more and more popular. And I would also ask the panelists to reflect on each other's findings and ideas, because there are many, many connection points. And I have some specific questions here, but I would first like to encourage the audience to, to start. Uh, if there are some immediate questions, am I able to see them here in the? Yeah, yeah there are. Yeah, I see no. no questions so yeah, there are no immediate questions. But now I have the I have the window open here, so please feel free to to post any questions. Uh, do we have all the panelists present? Excellent. So let me first start uh, by asking Jens. I mean, I was really impressed by the fact that you are actually evaluating the evaluation skills. I mean, if, if, if a student is evaluating a presentation of another student, uh, this is not against the student who is, who is uh, presenting. I mean, but it's really the evaluation skill that is evaluated. And I haven't seen this before. And, and this is very, very... Uh, Nice idea, but did you did you also use self evaluation of the students in the course? Uh, that's something that that we will uh, we will like to pursue, as I said, in uh, in the next implementation of this course. Um, <clears throat> we have they have been able to do it on a voluntary basis, um, and and that was for their written uh, feedback, so they can evaluate on the feedback that they have gotten but not on their own feedback capabilities. Um, so that, that's something that we would like to, uh, to try out next time. Um, still, um, it is second semester students. Um, most of them, they, they are a little kind of new to the university. So, so we're also trying to balance how can we design this in a way so that they are not too kind of uh, scared away. They're not too... Uh, afraid of, of, of what they are going to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, then also, it was interesting that you are really using an oral exam. And, and, and at least in Finland, this been, it's been something that is not, not common at all. And um, I, I would like to hear a bit more about your experiences. I mean, what, how do students take that? Uh, um. <laughs> It, it's it's I think it's more common in Denmark. They they have also mm. been to oral exams in their high school, so so it's not something that is completely new to the students. Um, <clears throat> I think they they are um, four or five of their exams from their high school uh, are actually done orally, um, and and it's also a, a pretty common practice uh, in Denmark um, that, that we have oral exams at uh, university courses as well. Uh, I remember when, when I was uh, studying back in the 80s, uh, we had a course with 400 students and an oral exam. So, so the, uh, the professor back then, he had uh, 
three weeks of our exams. So, so that was something. Um, yeah. But, but, but of course, it's it it is um, it's it's costly. Um, but I still I think well, in our case, it has a lot to do with with aligning the learning outcomes with the examination method. So if we want to to actually focus on alignment, and 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 that's something that that we try to to do is that well then we need to have some kind of exam that actually is aligned with the goals where it is being able to also orally uh, discuss and critique and stuff like that the the a, a given argument yeah uh, and yeah. then then the, this specific exam is definitely something new to the students uh, so so at the beginning they are pretty whoa what, what, what are what, what are you talking about um, and then then later on um, that, that's why we practice a lot yeah, yeah. It somehow seems that I mean, as have been discussed, uh, teaching is moving away from this mass lecture type of, of of implementation, but also examination is moving away from this big final exam that 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 is that is at the end of the course. So the evaluation is becoming more and more continuous. So and of course this for the workload this is optimal. I mean from uh, and it should reduce also stress of the students that you are. Somehow you are constantly evaluated, but not in, in, in smaller chunks. So I wonder if this has been actually studied, how, how students, how the stress levels of the students <laughs> behave. If anyone has a comment on this. Petri, you have been using these uh, devices to measure the students. Do, can you share some experiences? I think we lost Petri. Oh, we lost Petri. Yeah. And okay. Hopefully it's just, just the connection, but uh, <laughs> and Petri yeah. is fine. Yeah. Okay, um, then we have a question um, here uh, from Lena. Uh, uh, I would like, uh, I want to discuss how universities educate faculty to, all, to use all those new approaches and, and how actively uh, faculty members are actually participating in these courses and, and seminars to learn from each other. Um, who would like to start um, to describe what kind of practices you have um, to share experiences locally? So or also in collaboration. Yeah. I, I can start and maybe someone else can build upon it. <laughs> um, because this is so important. How do we keep the, the community building uh, within the, the teacher community? Like we are here. So we are learning from each other currently right here. And how do we bring up the discussion? Uh, we're trying out uh, different approaches, but, but it's a difficult one to include all teachers also. Uh, we, have a, we could demand, uh, firstly, uh, pedagogical uh, education for all teachers, of course. But then, what, what happens then? And what ha happens when we transform learning as we are doing currently? And how are we evaluating what we do as we go? Uh, scholarship for te of teaching and learning is one example how you work with your own teaching development. Uh, but it's a difficult one. So I'd like someone else to add, please. I think it was uh, interesting to see at DTU when we had from one day to the next to change to online learning that to most of us, we didn't know somebody was talking about Zoom and everybody was saying, what is Zoom? So, but they suddenly they started to, uh, becoming a lot of traffic of mails and so on, where teachers, they were asking each other and teachers were telling each other what they were doing and how their experience was with that. And, it uh, actually continued for, for some time until well, everybody was uh, starting with doing their own with uh, very different tools because nothing was uh, planned. But I think there was a lot of community exchange and learning very uh, not planned in any way. Uh, I don't think that came much uh, planned uh, teaching of, or learning opportunities from the from the university, uh, except there was, of course, some uh, workshop of uh, how to learn special uh, tools, but uh, a lot was uh, impulsive 
help to each other. And I think that was interesting. Yeah, I could continue on that in Vilnius Tech. I mean, it, previously when we had like uh, workshops of, and educational methods, we you would meet, you know, maybe 10 people out of our thousand teachers. But now when it's online and suddenly the COVID hit and it's everybody's interested in flipping and online tools, they were really active and we would, you know, collect 100 people on Zoom and then we really discussed uh, several things. So we were actually surprised that our our uh, uh, faculty is so interested and so in trying to be engaged so yeah and uh, i i also think this uh, i've seen this revolution started quite a while ago but then of course this <laughs> acute situation has made really this total shift in the minds of, of the majority of teachers so uh, most of the teachers are very responsible for students i mean they they want to engage them and and, and teach effectively and now when this uh, pandemic came uh, a year ago, I mean, the, most teachers, they were trying to find alternative methods to engage the students better and better. And it, I mean, at least in our university, we had these uh, platforms where we collected experiences and, and most teachers, they were very eager to get information, what to do, how to engage, how to evaluate, how to do exams now in this situation. And it was somehow very organic. And um, now what we are seeing is that we have some quantitative information of learning, uh, how learning has changed. And we, uh, But now there's a comment from Lotta, please. Well, I think Lars is before. Uh, no, I was just thinking oh. when you relate to, to the yeah. pandemic, what happened really? I mean, uh, if we look at teacher, teachers learning, <laughs> Uh, what happened really was that we were forced to get the experience of, of being there out. And I think many teachers has many, maybe kept it away, kept it on distance, it might be coming and so on. But suddenly you were forced. And, and I think the, the essential thing to, to think about is that the experience of being there is the driving force for learning. And, and what also happened was that you, you discovered that you through the digital media also easily can connect and collaborate uh, with others. I mean, there are a lot of forums. We created a Facebook forum nationally in Sweden. Uh, for example, that about just over, over two weeks, we had 2000 teachers in there and it's still going on. We had webinars, but I think the experience you need, and we can see that in the open network learning course, a lot of the, what benefits is that as a teacher, you experience the reality of what it is to be out there. And as also from a student perspective, now I understand how the students feel. Now I understand how it feels to be in a Zoom meeting or, or collaborating in, in online documents and so on. So the experience part, I think uh, you cannot learn about it. You need to learn through it. Yes, this is a very, very good comment. And we, it's, it's the same thing with these new methods about which we heard in the morning, like VR and, and extended reality. So it takes a transition phase. I mean, first, it might be very inconvenient to use these gadgets, yeah. uh, but then it becomes a part of you, like these Zoom meetings and Teams meeting. We are getting very, we are getting more engaged, even though we are not getting really more, more <laughs> closer. But somehow we are still getting closer. Yeah. Now, Lotta, please. Yeah, and I'd like to add to, to Lena's question, really, because uh, how do we keep on discussing these, these issues, but also how do we deepen the discussion? Uh, how do we keep the discussion not about tools and new gadgets and new functions and the technology? How do we deepen the discussion ask, and ask ourselves, how do we improve the learning? Yes. Another question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. And can I just add a lot to that? I think, but I mean, uh, someone asked just after our presentation about do we need to rethink the pedagogical concepts and frameworks? But I think it's rather the other way. We need to really pick them up again because they are still very, very relevant, but with new conditions. 
So, but it, it's very easy to be overwhelmed with, for example, the community inquiry framework and so on. Oh, there's so much here that I should be doing or could do. So it, we need to kind of start somewhere. <laughs> But I think we need to have the, the broader understanding as teachers of the pedagogical different aspects and then make a choice. What can I do in my context? Uh, yeah. So we, we cannot just pick one without getting the whole picture. Uh, so we need to work on both. Yeah. But that's a challenge with education development because, oh, this is so much, this is abstract and so on. But you need to get, dig deeper into that. Yeah, exactly. And the students are changing as well. I mean, we are getting new generations who are getting used to new methods already at school. And an interesting finding in flipped learning was the fact that if, if there's like a third year student getting a flipped course, typically he or she will evaluate the course a bit worse than one might expect because it's, it's new and it's really putting more work yeah. uh, to the student. And, and it's, it's, it's simply... Uh, yeah, it's simply more work. But then if we compare what happens with the first year students, they immediately take it, they adopt it and they, they like it because they don't know, they are not used to this old method of going to the lectures and feeling good about going to the lectures passively yeah. and then meeting friends. And it's, it's a completely new approach and it takes, it takes some adaptation. We need to involve and discuss it with students from day one. Yeah. <laughs> And, and of course, well, I'm, I'm glad that, that you find that, Asa, because when, when I interview students, they have, they have a very traditional view on what university teaching is. Um, and of course, there's also, well, first of all, your comment on, well, teachers want to do it well, yes. So, so let's stop uh, picking on the teachers and, and they really want to do it as good as possible. Um, and a lot also has to do with the structural uh, elements that, that they have. Well, our uh, timetabling, for example, well, you're put in a lecture theater for two hours. So what can you do in that lecture theater? Well, you can lecture uh, because that's kind of the layout of that lecture theater. We're not all having nice lecture theaters like, like the one they have at NTNU. So, so I think there's a lot of, of structural things. We also need to, to incorporate teaching more into the appraisal talks that that we have every year and stuff like that so so it's not just trying to you know put it individually on the individual teacher but but we need some kind of uh both top down and bottom up approach where where of course we inspire the the individual teachers by something like this and and other examples but also make some structural things that that well you can actually ask for your teaching being done in, a, for just as a simple example, a flat room instead of a lecture theater or something like that, which is something that we cannot not accommodate at least at all university currently. Yeah. I also posted in the chat a model for in Swedish though that we are trying out currently uh, about collegial discussions about in this topic and to get everyone on board circular model for but based on the dig compete edu framework is this kind of a national network or or no no just tr some some universities trying it out currently well uh, we have created a, a, a national sub network to the information technology in higher education network uh, where we also have finnish uh, colleagues from uvescula for example mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean, and that, that sub-network is, is just to support each other, how to work with pedagogical digital competence in our universities, how to. Yeah. Start networking on the topic. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have one more session on networking and we are kind of warming up already. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In Finland, we also have a, a, a network of all universities in engineering education. It's called FITEC fitech.io you can check if you want so that's that's an idea where each university can put uh, courses online and then students they can be degree students so they can be students from uh, from work life so it's continuous education they can pick courses 
and every university can focus on 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 uh, its own strengths so so this is a way to build a, like a national platform and i think this is the way and i think we we can agree in north tech that this is the way how how that this nordic collaboration could evolve as well that we can really offer uh, courses online to to all students in all the countries we just have a few challenges in finding a, a, a solid platform and but that's should be doable Yeah, so we have one more question from the audience. Uh, Elizabeth Keller is uh, talking, so you are welcome to, to respond to it. Yeah, if anyone has an opinion about how agile engineering education curriculum is. So this is uh, reflecting on, on Jens um, comments on, on structural changes. What is, what is the unit that we should me measure agility on? Just a very brief reflection on that, because I mean, focusing on, on engineering education uh, and just through my experience of working as an education developer at different universities with different disciplines, uh, there are very clear cultures within, uh, within each of the disciplines. And, and we can also see that in the Open Network Learning course where people come from all kinds of disciplines. And, and you can quite easily identify that, but well, here is someone that comes from techno technology or medicine through the way they uh, have experienced teaching practice and education practice, and also their way of thinking about education and their own role. So I think we, we can benefit from sharing across these uh, yeah. these quite strict disciplines. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think that, that that's uh, in, in many of the educational development courses that we have at Linship University, I, I, I can see that that is happening in small groups where you have some teachers from, from engineering, some from medicine, some from other, other parts. And that discussion when they kind of um, break perspectives and, and share completely different ways of thinking about that practice. Uh, yeah. That's where a lot of learning happens. Yeah, the, the curricula in engineering education are typically extremely packed with uh, oh. quite little flexibility. And, and this is somewhat understandable in the sense that there is always and there should be a strong mathematical uh, uh, base and uh, base of natural sciences and some, some uh, generic content and I think would be very interesting to go across the, the universities in Nordic countries to check what kind of what kind of elements there are and maybe we can find some joint uh, ideas please yeah they're thinking about Hans I mean you, you talked about the spiral curriculum and I, I recognize that a lot from problem-based learning in medical education and, and and the whole idea with that is that you kind of integrate things and what students work with are authentic uh, situations, problems where different subjects uh, are integrated. Uh, yes, any comments on that? Because it, it, how is that developed in in year education, like a spiral curriculum, which is another way of thinking? Hmm. I think most curricula are linear, right? Linear. No. Um, well, the, the civil engineering curriculum, um, we have something similar on the second year as we have uh, in the first year, but already in the second year, we start to have electrical courses, not all courses are compulsory, so we start to get a, <laughs> already there a little bit messy, so we don't have uh, umbrella courses, but we in some way still try to connect the theory with the, with the projects. But um, well, uh, otherwise, I think it is rather linear. You start with new topics and refer to new topics and, and so on. Yeah, this could be a nice topic for further seminars within this network how to uh, assess the curricula that we have and how, how to maybe, I don't know, standardize. But there must be a standardization there 
Okay, it's a topic of its own, but interesting to to hear this. I think I, it's time to uh, turn back to Alisa and Gediminas. as we are we are getting close to a coffee break. Let me thank again all the panelists and speakers for for excellent and inspiring presentations. And uh, we still to... have a few minutes, Essa. Yeah. Well, I th I would uh, maybe extend one more question, just your general impression, because you mentioned a little. What what will be the benefits of this Nortec? Uh, uh, what would be the benefit uh, in all these, in terms of all you, all that you said uh, that we collaborate in this region? Is this any specific, or you know, maybe it's too broad because two universities usually have you know enough resources to do things. I don't know. How do you see that? Is it useful? I think it would be be useful because we have some. Uh, master uh, programs which is uh, come with uh, but it's only uh, Denmark, Norway, Norway, Sweden and, and Finland but maybe we could uh, extend those kind of uh, international uh, master programs uh, so that will be a very direct way of cooperate. Yeah, it's a, it's a pro provocative question, of course. For me, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, I'm so happy to hear all of your thoughts from different countries. That's, and as I mentioned, you know, those what we call mapping activities, maybe in our Nordic engineering education group. Mm -hmm. So just gathering data and then maybe making some conclusions there, what, uh, what can be learned. Yeah, I think that would, would be very valuable for this network to find out the, the practices in, in actual teaching. What is the content and why? What is the base of engineering education in different countries? Yeah, yeah. And then sad Petri didn't make it <laughs> to the uh, discussion, but he would use that data. He, he just used two, two well, four courses in two years, right? So for his analysis. <coughs> yeah. You like well, they... a Nordic analysis of flipped versus traditional, that would be a good meta metadata right yeah and i think what what what, what I, I know this i know petris work rather well because we are we are colleagues in the same university and, and the nice thing is that this was actually a really mass course with hundreds of students and 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 everyone knows who is who has ever done any flipping activities if you want to flip for hundreds of students you really need resources i mean because you there is a lot of one to one interaction and um, it's 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 very interesting to see the statistics of the learning learning uh, experiences. And there are some details. I, I I had some questions because I hadn't seen all the all the latest results. But sadly, we lost <laughs> lost Petri. <laughs> Yes, uh, sadly, another thing which I am supposed to announce right now is that our time is approaching to its end and most probably everyone, not only, uh, let's say, the panelists, but also the audience are looking forward to, uh, let's say, get another cup of coffee, maybe tea, maybe some refreshments already. So uh, let us get back in 30 minutes from now on and uh, we'll switch to the session number three, which would be uh, focusing on networking. So thank you so, so much for participating, not only with your uh, presentations, but also in the discussion which was arranged here. Thank you so much and see you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Just a question before I leave. Yes. Uh, what about uh, sharing presentation and so on? Uh, should we send anything to you, or do uh, we you... will arrange it in email? I think, but it's it's all recorded. We'll sh share the recording so everyone will see. Uh, but I mean, uh, both re the recording and the slides, I think, might be valuable. Sure. Uh, sure. And, yeah, okay. we'll find out the way to share it. Thank you, Lars. Yeah. Okay. And also, we have a question from Peter. Uh, yeah, Peter? Yes. Uh, just, uh, hi, I just logged in. So I just came in the break, I can see. Um, um, I'm ready with my presentation. I was wondering if I could test that it works uh, in sharing mode with a video. Sure, thank I believe you yeah, may yeah. do so. So I'll stop sharing the screen right now. And uh, you are welcome to test what you have. 
I'll just try, I think I, it's probably safer to take the entire desktop and then I'll just find this and see here. This is not a problem, but uh, there is a video coming. Yeah. Here. Do you see that and hear that? Yes, we yes, see we it do. and we hear it. Yeah, there's also an option uh, when you're sharing, there's an option to optimize for video and audio. So you, if you choose that, it uh -huh. might improve a bit, I think. Where, where do I see that? When you click on sharing uh, uh, the screen and then yeah. probably advanced and then uh, or no, just on the bottom, just uh, optimize. Oh, optimize the video clip and share sound. I'll, I'll do that. Perfect. OK, right. thank you. Thank see you in a bit. See you.
Okay, do you hear my voice? Yeah, yeah. Hello, Larry. Hello. Perfect. Good. And do you see my slides? Yes, yes. Okay, great. I will start like in five minutes, okay? Yep, that's fine, fine. And you will start the video app, app, apparently. Well, but I'm, I'm showing my, my slides, of, 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 of course. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Yep.
Hey there, welcome back to the third session of the day. Still very exciting. The, net, the third one is networking, right? Yes, Lisa? that is true. And they actually say that lunch is the best part of the day, but I believe even as for us, the best part of the day is listening to our dear panelists. And as I see, <laughs> Laura already has his um, slides uh, on share. So most probably uh, we may start up uh, very soon. Yeah, Lauri Malmi from Alto University. Thank you for joining us. Uh, oh, hey, yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, okay, because there's still no video, video, so, so, okay, now I'm gonna start, start my video so you can see, see, hi, hi, yes, see from, you. hi. from Alto, Uni Alto University and I'll share my, share my screen again, okay? Great. So, um, um, uh, uh, my name is Laura Marmi uh, from uh, the Department of Computer Science uh, at Alta University, uh, and I'm here uh, as a professor. Uh, and my field is uh, had computer and education research, uh, mainly focus focusing on uh, advanced le learning environments uh, uh, for programming education. Um, so uh, uh, today I, I uh, uh, discuss. Uh, my experiences and visions of uh, networking in doctoral education. So, uh, uh, first, first, starting uh, sounds, uh, briefly of the need for networking for PhD students. So, why is it so important for them? And then I discuss a couple of uh, uh, forms of uh, uh, activities so, which provide opportunities for PhD students to network with others and senior seniors. These include uh, doctoral consortia, uh, international working groups, uh, and, and there's a specific, uh, um, specific virtual conference and study groups uh, uh, for uh, doctoral students in my field, and then the uh, former uh, Nordic network of engineer education, which currently is not active anymore, but it was a uh, successful uh, activity by its time. And, and then well, finally, uh, CEFI, uh, engineer education research working group. So if you think about that, what are the goals of PSD studios uh, st studies? So it's very obvious that they, they need to know their own research topic in depth. Uh, and then and they should have uh, a broad understanding of their wider uh, research area so that they, they can contextualize their work within the wider scope of research. And obviously, uh, they need to um, be able to uh, apply research methods uh, uh, and, uh, and appropriate tools uh, or theories used in their area. And the goal is to generate new scientific results. Well, this is the generic goal of PhD studies anyway. And then report the research in a scholarly way. So these are kind of natural things. But also, what is important here is that the, uh, the goal of the phase when one is doing one PhD studies is to uh, learn to act as an independent researcher and start building one's own network. Uh, and why this networking is, is important? Uh, um, uh, well, of course, I mean, most PhD students have their local research group as their home, ba pay, home base. Uh, and, uh, so learning to know local peer, peer PhD students in the same area, of course, so, uh, supports them in many ways to provide more communication uh, and sharing ideas than they would have. Uh, uh, this busy supervisor probably cannot have time for, uh, for personal discussion so much as, as their peers. But uh, the, uh, uh, in smaller areas like uh, my, uh, my own area, computer education research or engineering education research, uh, the challenge is uh, that uh, often there is no uh, group in one, one's own university and uh, one is too lonely there, there uh, perhaps having only uh, infrequent meetings with, uh, with one's supervisor. And it may, might even be that the supervisor is not actually working in the field, but is formally just supervising uh, yeah, the work. work. Uh, another uh, situation might be that one is working outside academia uh, uh, or in another in institute than uh, one's uh, uh, supervisor. And then, then learning to know uh, other, P other PhD students and other seniors elsewhere, uh, that's more than valuable. Um, 
uh, because then they can get wider feedback and reflections on their work. Uh, and then planning some joint research tactics, sometimes they are just uh, tar target to uh, call out publications that both sides collect some data and analyze it and then uh, um, create um, uh, or write a joint paper. But it's also possible uh, that uh, they uh, they seek to uh, find part their partners for future funding applications. Uh, well, they, perhaps this uh, applying funding is not the mainstream work of PSD students, but many, many of them uh, uh, do, do that uh, uh, to get funding for themselves as or they participate their uh, supervisors funding applications. And anyway, that's something that they should learn for future work as postdoc or uh, academic. So, uh, what kind of opportunities there, uh, there are that, prior, uh, that uh, can support networking? One of these is the Dokla Consortium. Uh, uh, this is a very traditional form or organized in many con conferences. And there are many different forms how, uh, how this can be org organized. So, uh, what, from my own experience, uh, I've participated in a, a Dokla Consortium, which have been actually just half a day special sessions. Uh, 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 and also, I've uh, participated in uh, a Dokla Consortium, which uh, lasted four full days. And during this, uh, and, and extensive and work workshop, it was really uh, uh, possible to uh, get an in-depth view of uh, PhD students uh, by work and they, they could fo focus on their uh, research uh, plan and develop it by getting feedback and, and discuss with many seniors. So that was really um, a really good uh, ex experience. But of course, few seniors have time for use, using uh, using four days for that kind of workshop. Uh, the participants there who are include uh, typically many PhD students, perhaps 10, 20 uh, PhD students and a couple of seniors uh, who uh, discuss and give feedback. And uh, one form is that uh, it's just a mini conference where the PhD students give a short presentations of their uh, current work and then, uh, uh, then uh, get, get, get feedback. Uh, in many, many of those which I've been participating, they present their holistic research plan for future and get feedback on that. And I think that is a very good way of organizing the, the doctoral consortium. Uh, uh, there might be a component of poster session um, uh, in, in the con conference and, and typically small group sessions with discussions as to get detailed feedback and then lectures or tutorials. <clears throat> on various various things. Uh, the advantage there that because it's a small audience and mostly their peers, so PSD students with our. Uh, 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 in different phases, and that allows uh, them to present early ongoing work in a safe environment instead of giving a full conference presentation um, uh, for, for, for more critical and, uh, or audience. And uh, because it's a doctoral consortium, the critique is mainly constructive, uh, so, and that is the whole goal of there, uh, having a friendly environment uh, and, and getting to know each other and encourage each other. And it's valuable to meet peers who have similar, who may have very similar challenges in data collection or writing papers or finding co-authors and so on. So, so, on. so meeting, meeting international colleagues is, is very valuable. And also meeting PhD students in different phases to understand what kind of challenges there are in the beginning and late, later on. Uh, but then possible problems there are uh, 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 that the other research topics might be uh, very narrow and not, uh, not close enough to one's own work. So actually you are presenting your own work, but otherwise the others are doing something too much different. And then, of course, uh, 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 the feedback you get is often on a quite general level, level and, and that is, of course, a challenge. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, it's understandable that for uh, both uh, the, the peer the PhD students and the, the seniors, uh, it, it is challenging to get an in-depth view of, uh, of one's research in a very short time. Then uh, a second type of uh, activity which uh, 
from my personal experience, it has been highly, uh, highly successful uh, in networking. Uh, there is uh, a special activity uh, uh, which, carry, which is carried out uh, in my field in, in a major conference, uh, Innovation Technology in Computer Science Education, ETC. Uh, uh, it's a ma major international conference organized in Europe annually. Uh, the, uh, it's organized by the ACM uh, in the ACM organization. Uh, from US and typically it has 200 to 300 even more participants, mainly from Europe, but lots of people coming from US and other countries as well. And one regular part of this conference from the very beginning and I have made it from mid 90s has been working groups. And these working groups, they, they are small uh, expert committees which uh, uh, work uh, in advance uh, before the conference uh, to tackle some um, some specific top topic uh, and then write the joint report to that uh, and uh, the, the the whole process goes so is so that the uh, uh, proposals for working groups are submitted as one category for the conference as Two page abstracts, and uh, this is written just the working working group chairs who uh, make the proposal, and they are typically recognized seniors uh, in, in in the field. And then, uh, uh, when uh, uh, the proposal have been reviewed uh, um, um, uh, and then accepted proposals, they will be announced on the conference website, and then interested participants can apply uh, for membership. Uh, uh, and then the work, we, we, working group chairs they accept the applications. Uh, and the typical size of a group is five to twelve uh, members in in total, including the chairs. And uh, the work continues so uh, that this uh, was the pre-conference phase, uh, uh, which begins some two months before the actual conference, typically collecting and analyzing data uh, uh, and, and then reviewing literature uh, and drafting the re re report. Uh, Typically, not all party members are active uh, in in uh, in all their phases because uh, because the conference is organized late June, early July, and and these or uh, uh, these two months of uh, the end of semester uh, time very busy for many 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 seniors. But there are there are few people who are uh, who are active already in this phase and 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 they start doing the work. And then uh, the whole working group convenes two days um, before the conference uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, two full day working sessions uh, to discuss the report uh, goals and content, uh, analyze the data and writing, uh, start writing the report. And the uh, work continues uh, during the three, uh, in the three days conference and then a complete draft report will be submitted at the end of the conference. And, and then the draft that will be reviewed by as a journal sub, uh, level submission and later published in the uh, working group proceedings series. And this has been uh, roughly the model uh, for many, many, many years. And uh, uh, well, but during this pandemic, uh, um, this has been uh, an online, um, uh, on online event and online uh, activity, and that has had a different schedule because um, because uh, it's, it's possible to start working more intensively here when you are start ha having meetings uh, early early on. And what are the adv advantages concerning networking here is that uh, uh, when you are working together, in addition to this pre-conference work and, is, and during the conference, you are working together with a small number of people uh, uh, on site uh, uh, intensively uh, the five days um, with a number of experts uh, and uh, typically some PhD students there. They're there. Uh, so you, so you, you learn to know the people much, much better than uh, uh, what, what you typically no, uh, learn uh, in, in a conference when you uh, discuss some, someone in coffee breaks uh, uh, and uh, lunches and, uh, and social e events. So when you work together, you really, uh, really learn to, learn to know people. And I, uh, I've participated half a dozen working groups my, myself, uh, chaired once, and uh, I've recommended uh, my own PhD students to participate and build their networks in this um, uh, 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 by participating in these working groups. It's it's it has been very valuable. 
Uh, and then uh, later on, often there will be some spin off activities uh, which result in further research on joint papers with some of the team members. And um, actually, some of these working group papers are highly cited. So, my most cited papers, uh, several of them, are from these working groups. Uh, uh, the most high, uh, highly cited has over 800 citations over the 20 years. Uh, so, the disadvantage there that you often miss some of the conference because you are working so intensively, but I think it's worth, uh, worth that effort. Uh, then uh, here, uh, CSA grad uh, is a novel activity st started, I think, to one or two years ago. Uh, uh, it is actually a funded project uh, uh, in the US to promote building a community on computer science education researchers uh, and especially targeted to PhD students. So it's, it's an online community uh, and well, of course, because now the pandemic, uh, it, it, is, it must be uh, an online community. Um, um, uh, uh, but any, anyway, uh, even even without the pan pandemic, this it, it worms, uh, forms an online um, uh, venue for meeting people, and uh, 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 they call it uh, joint resources for, for PhD studies, and they organize events uh, which are targeted specifically for CSA uh, uh, graduate students, and. As one uh, one example there, uh, that, uh, that uh, two years ago there was a public, uh, published by Cambridge uh, Handbook of Competent Education Research, which is an extensive research, uh, uh, extensive resource uh, uh, cover covering the whole field, and uh, they organized the reading circles. Uh, um, uh, where PhD students uh, could discuss uh, the chapters, and uh, and uh, uh, often there were some seniors uh, also also um, who had been writing uh, these chapters. They could participate uh, and explain the reasonings and I think thinking in in more gen general. Uh, and I think that. In this kind of activity, uh, uh, the online community it brings together people from many institutions, and because it is specifically targeted for PhD students, it's highly valuable for them to get support from each other, uh, uh, and building the really solid, solid network uh, and, um, with with those ones who are active there. and uh, And I think there are more than hundred uh, participants at the, at the moment, and uh, getting e encouragement from each each other. Uh, the challenge what I envision is uh, uh, that what will happen when the project funding ends. Uh, this is this is a threat uh, for many of many of such ac activities, uh, and that uh, <coughs> it all work, you know it works nicely uh, when you have the funding, but then then uh, when activities should be done with the regular voluntary work, then people get too busy with other uh, other stuff. And this is actually uh, uh, what was the destiny, uh, des destiny of a Nordic network in engineering education research, which uh, was running 10 years ago for uh, four, four years. It was funded uh, by Nord Forsk. Uh, um, it was a joint activity to build a community of Nordic uh, researchers in engineering education research area. Uh, and mainly it, the motivation was there that uh, many researchers in this small area uh, were very lonely. Uh, there were few uh, a few research groups which had several PhD students, but many of them were working just alone in the institute. And so this provided an opportunity to meet seniors and meet other PhD students who are interested in engineering education research. Um, and uh, what the activities, the main activities uh, was uh, organizing annual one to two, one to two uh, days workshops for uh, faculty members and PhD students in the area, and their representations of on ongoing work, keynotes, joint discussion, planning funded projects, and, and so on. So they were intense, intensive, but also very, uh, very positive uh, meetings. I uh, I participated all uh, participated all of them and and was very happy of that. And the advantages there, as I mentioned, is that it brought together uh, single lonely researchers from many universities, thus providing them a community where they belonged, and uh, which encouraged their work. 
Uh, and certainly, certainly for PhD students, getting to know others uh, uh, and the international um, seniors was certainly a valuable asset. So they are not just the names in papers, but they were they were uh, living living people uh, who, with whom you could um, um, you could discuss and uh, and uh, explain your ideas and get valuable feedback uh, during the seminar. And obviously. The seminars pro uh, provided the also visibility on the rich variety, variety of work uh, that is carried out in Nordic countries in engineering and educational research. But the challenges there were that the annual se seminar was a rare event, it was once a year. Um, and then uh, um, uh, some joint activities were initiated in these uh, uh, e events, uh, uh, but uh, not all of them were, were completely finished as they were voluntary work, mainly driven by the seniors. And then uh, when the funding period was over, the activities in Nordic Network uh, gradually ceased. That's unfortunate. Uh, then finally, uh, one former activity is the CEFI Engineering Education Research Working, uh, working Group. This is a different type of working group than the ETC working groups, which I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, so CEFI is uh, a large European community of engineering education, and it also organizes an annual uh, conference in engineering education, which brings together uh, something like 300, 400 uh, uh, educators, uh, <clears throat> and uh, developers of edu education, uh, some uh, administrator pe the people and, le and, and leading, the, uh, the leading people in the field. Uh, and very much in, from, um, uh, from Europe uh, by, and uh, from Western Europe countries, um, but uh, uh, also, also internationally from, um, uh, from US and from other countries uh, uh, outside Europe. And uh, one of the activities uh, uh, of uh, forms uh, in, in CEFI is uh, that they have what, what, uh, what they call working groups. They organize sessions and other activities in specific sub areas in engineering education. So one is this uh, engineering education research, but then there are a working group on, um, on ethics in engineering education. Um, um, uh, there, there are many, many, many others. Uh, uh, and uh, these working groups, uh, <coughs> they uh, uh, they focus on their own areas, organize organize their own uh, own events and activities as uh, their uh, their boards uh, decide, decide. And the uh, engineering case working group, uh, uh, the board uh, for, uh, has decided to focus on supporting research in engineering education. And uh, what this has practically meant is that it has organized special sessions uh, uh, in engineering education research in the conference, and then it has supported the review process for uh, papers uh, in engineering education research, and then has collected various types of resources for the. Uh, um, uh, for, for ER researchers in the field. So the advantage is there that uh, this uh, working group has brought together uh, people interested in engineering research from the whole Europe, uh, uh, mostly from uh, West, Western, uh, Western Europe, uh, um, but from other countries in Europe as, as well. And certainly it has increased uh, um, the visibility of, um, uh, of this research area in Europe. And as Nordic Network, it supports lonely researchers because engineering research is a small sub area uh, within the broad engineering education community. Uh, the challenges, uh, what I've seen uh, being, being a member of the board uh, for more than 10 years, is that the board is uh, a team of very busy seniors and, and because there has been no significant funding, it has been not been possible to, uh, to recruit, uh, uh, recruit people uh, to do some practical work, so everything has to be done um, by, by the seniors. And, and then we have the challenge that this voluntary work uh, for the community is hard to prioritize uh, because people have so many other pressures uh, uh, to use their time. time. Uh, 
And then uh, my personal experience is that because this is such a broad community um, um, uh, that compared to Nordic Network, uh, uh, which had, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 30, 40 people participating in these uh, seminars, then uh, the CEFI conference itself is very, very large. And, and then uh, people are participating in these uh, activities. Uh, it is a couple of dozen, by, uh, but they are not the same people or every, every year, but there is a much more variation uh, over, over the years um, when these events have been all organized. And so there's a little bit less uh, feeling of community compared, compared with the Nordic network. So as a conclusion, I would say uh, that international networking is highly important for PhD students uh, and especially in small research areas such as computational research and engineering research. So it's much easier if, if, uh, in, if you are working in an area where there's a lot of research locally and you have your own, uh, uh, own local uh, strong research group where you get support from peers, uh, uh, then th things, are, things are different. It's still important uh, uh, to, uh, to network internationally, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's less important than, than in cases when you are working alone. And uh, there are many opportunities for this networking, uh, which require from, from PhD students only travel funding, uh, or actually uh, they can be almost free due to this COVID pan pandemic uh, and these uh, on online events. Um, the conference fees uh, um, uh, have been very low uh, on the, during the pandemic, and we will see what will happen in the future um, uh, with hybrid uh, con conferences, where some people are participating on site and some online. We don't know how this will work out. Uh, and definitely the supervisors uh, should be aware of the opportunities and encourage their PhD students to participate, even though uh, they wouldn't be presenting a research paper in the conference, but just participating in a doctoral consortium or, um, uh, or, or a working, working group or some uh, other, other activity is valuable for them. But the challenge is uh, that the, uh, the activities with low funding and driven by busy seniors, uh, it, they, they have challenges um, uh, to, to maintain the momentum. Uh, and, uh, and there are all, uh, of, often more plans than can be realized. But still, I would summarize uh, that for PhD students, that working together with someone is the best way to network. So, uh, so any kind of activities which target to joint publications, uh, uh, joint activities is, is, is good. And uh, participating in organizing these kind of events as a PhD student is also very valuable. So that summarizes my, my presentation. So thank you, thank you for listening. And if there are uh, any, any questions, I'm happy to, uh, happy to answer. All right, so thank you so much. What a start of the session number three. And uh, to be honest, while well, I am myself a PhD student right now, and I can actually relate to everything what was mentioned there. Of course, networking is, is essential at that point. And uh, the best feedback and most probably the most precise feedback you tend to get is uh, from your peers. That was definitely and for sure. Yeah, that's true. My question would be, uh, well, about funding again, as you said, you know, it's hard to do anything, something without without good funding, and maybe you say mobility is, is just what you need. But usually, as you said, you need seniors, you need supervisors to do work, uh, to collaborate, mm -hmm. and probably yeah. they have to be paid a little. So, uh, how do we promote that? How what is the motivation for universities to fund that? Or is it always like a network, like a Nortec maybe? I don't know, but how do we, uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, universities, uh, case by case, some, some universities can provide some, uh, some funding uh, for, for this, but then there are these uh, uh, various uh, other funding uh, um, funding organizations, like uh, uh, in case of Nordic Network, there was a Nord Forsk, uh, which regularly funds uh, 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 funds building, uh, uh, maintaining research networks, and then of course there are European uh, uh, EU level uh, um, uh, in instruments. Uh, 
uh, and some foundations can can also provide funding. Uh, um, so opportunities are there, but then somebody ha has has to make the hard work of bringing it all together. Uh, and 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 then uh, when this funding is just for these networking at activities, and uh, then it doesn't support salaries uh, for the uh, some someone else. And uh, so. Uh, the funding is not for the seniors even to get, get an extra salary, salary and, and most seniors actually don't need that <laughs> they they need more time <laughs> that's that is a scarce resource um, and 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 so uh, i don't have a good good solution there um, uh, but if psd students are willing to support making uh, preparing the applications and following that what is available and then uh, uh, they could uh, uh, yeah, yeah, support them uh, they seen seniors who, of course, have to uh, uh, have to give their names there and do some fine final tuning. But uh, I would encourage PSD students uh, and, uh, to help help in uh, identifying sources of funding and uh, and and then um, preparing the applications. Thank you so much. And as we are running out of time, most probably maybe the Lena. Better... Lena had a question or. Yeah. No, this, yeah. oh, okay. This. All right. So the very last question from our colleague. Uh, so do you have any lectures in educational science area? Uh, my, myself, uh, uh, educational science. Uh, science. Uh, uh, well, that uh, I haven't been working in that area uh, uh, my, my, myself uh, because uh, my background is in computer science and I uh, I approach uh, this this field from computer science where, where I have colleagues, of course, uh, working in educational and then uh, educational science, sciences because this is a cross disciplinary field. Um, but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, people from there they are more uh, uh, more appropriate people giving talks in educational science events. Events. Uh, so uh, I can reflect on uh, from my own experience as uh, what it means computer, what educational sciences can provide for research in computer education or edu engineering education. That's that's certainly uh, uh, something I can share. Of course, thank you so much. And as we are restricted in time, I'm really sorry to you cut this conversation uh, because we are just uh, are supposed to move on forward. So the muse. So give me the what do we have next? Yeah, Peter. He was he was there already with us. Thank you, Lowry. And we move to Peter Gorm Larson uh, with his presentation. Uh, Peter, you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh yeah. And I'm trying to share. I share my screen and in a second also my video. It needs permission to share the So yeah, we can see it now. We can see a video. Uh, your and, uh, slides. The presentation. Can you uh, let me move this? This right. applies perfectly. Very good. So my name is Peter Gorm Larsen. I'm uh, with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Aarhus University. Um, I'm a colleague of uh, Jens Bennison that you have heard earlier today, I believe. Uh, actually, we have for the last three days been examining students. Um, but today I'm here to talk about a summer school that I started up uh, many years ago. Um, and it's in, in, essentially in order to create a network, a network for young students, younger than the PhD students that we just heard about uh, in here. So um, in this presentation, I, I'll first try to talk a little bit about the background. Why did I go and start this? And I'll try to explain how we did this. And then we have also uh, recently, uh, a few years ago, published uh, uh, a paper about the impact of the summer school measured based on on uh, responses of questionnaires for, for some of the uh, former students participating in this. I'll come back with uh, site, uh, sites of the papers later. So uh, the reason why we started up these summer schools is that uh, I spent half of my career in industry and competitiveness of companies really depends upon being able to create new innovative concepts faster in a more globalized world. And this also means that you need, you see companies doing more outsourcing of different tasks to different countries. 
need to have precise requirements for the development team and time to market is really essential. Complexity is raising constantly and you need to understand the different design constraints for the different disciplines and try to understand cross-disciplinary collaboration. So, so I feel there's a need for, for new competencies that we are typically not educating at our silo organized universities. Maybe your university is not like that, but mine certainly is. Um, so, so this was a matter of trying to understand how we can kind of uh, do distributed organizations and have virtual things and try to understand the cultural differences and be able to maneuver in the innovative fields of uncertainty. So uh, we, we, I started this as a pilot thing in 20, 2007 with only nine students. Uh, the different acronyms here indicate this, the kind of, uh, um, let me just put a point on here. Uh, take a laser pointer. So, so the different initials here, this is from, from the last of the papers, um, is indicating the kind of disciplinary background of the students participating. And so here, for example, was G, uh, electrical computer engineering students and one mechanical engineering student, and then so, so vice versa. But you see, this was not just at university level. It was mainly bachelor students, also uh, over, the, over the year master students, also a few PhDs. And uh, as you can see down here, also high school students came along. Um, so it was a mixed reality in a sense a show where you actually combine students with very different kind of different kind of discount background. I only organized it from 2007 to 2010 and then I was busy with other things so I carried it over to some other people and this has been going on uh, together with a company called Bang & Olufsen. Uh, they produce uh, audio and video equipment. You've probably seen uh, some of their high-end uh, products um, and, and they are they are placed in a very rural area of Denmark. So there's nothing to do there when you're done with uh, work. So you'll see a lot of engagement with students coming from all over the world. And as you can see, this is a network with people coming from different universities. And in later years, things have also moved to China, which I'll come back to later. So of course, this was a course, it was a three, three week summer school intensive. So it has had learning objectives. And, and I was particularly interested in this multidisciplinary thing, instead of having silos, and then trying to enhance the interpersonal skills uh, in, in doing teamwork. Uh, typically, at least at my university, most courses are not really good at trying to um, enhance those skills. And therefore, we try to kind of say, how, how can they propose and justify value of new technical solutions that have innovative uh, aspects for them. And then be able to, of course, conduct their own disciplinary thing on a real life industrial problem, but be able to present it to stakeholders who have a different kind of background. It's similar to the kind of dissemination that PhD students uh, need to have, but this is uh, something that was quite fruitful, I think, uh, in, in general here. So uh, this was the initial background for the summer school. Now I'll try to give you an overview of the summer school as we have organized it. Um, and as I said before, it's, it's organized in teams. So it's very much kind of CDU-like kind of thing, very little kind of uh, lectures. It's also a multidisciplinary approach where the team is composed of students with different disciplinary backgrounds and also with different cultural backgrounds. So they came from different places, typically in Europe, but later also from China. So it was very problem-based learning uh, and it was very intensive schedule uh, where there was kind of uh, five working days. I'll show you a schedule for it in a minute. Uh, long days and the people all lived at the same uh, place. So we had breakfast, lunch and dinner together every day. There was no real things you could go and do uh, meaningful uh, otherwise. And then it was industrial oriented. Now that motivated many of the engineering students. It was really closely connected with Bang & Olufsen. So the, the program was divided into three stages. First state where the students were really uh, enhancing their creativity and teamworking skills. Uh, in Denmark, we have a lot of teamwork. so it was not so uh, frightening to them, but in particular from students from, from Eastern Europe, 
uh, they were really new to how do we work together uh, in this way. The second stage, the students were collaborating on the idea of a concept that was chosen after the innovation for the first stage. And in the third stage, the students was working on a product, primarily on a, on a prototype, designing it, and then some technical documentation. So this is a week, this was for 2009. Um, you'll see some photos now and then where you see, see students doing different things. In this case, uh, playing with Lego bricks to uh, try to prototype something. Um, here, you see the first week was really uh, innovation kind of thing with a con divergent and conversion phase. Um, in the second week, we have different, had different lectures at the early stages. These were removed later because lectures are not really essential. Uh, it's really having them working together. Even weekends, uh, social events and stuff like this was, was planned. So the physical layout of this was actually kind of in, in small cubicles, four times four meters. And then in the middle area, there was kind of a, a scrap area where you could actually do some prototyping. You could sit down, you could do things. This was, of course, prior to the pandemic uh, situation. And then there was uh, an area for presentation with a big... Uh, uh, screen and then an area where the teachers could gather and they could of course come and consult the teachers on a needs basis whenever they, they felt uh, like it. But uh, the assignments they were getting were assignments that were genuinely interested from a company perspective. They were interested in seeing what can we do and they also projects that were selected that would require a mix of engineering input, like later also uh, business input. Um, and then a balance of, of openness and constraint, having some constraints, but also openness uh, in terms of some opportunities to kind of invent things. Um, so here is a, a list of the three projects that the six groups worked on for the, for the first year, the first real year. Uh, the, the 2007 thing was only a weak uh, prototype in a sense. Uh, and these are the things for the second year. Uh, so rebirth of a, of a portable stereo was one of these. It looked like this. So it's a, it's the background is that if you have a radio at home, probably now a DAP radio, it's standing in your kitchen or somewhere else, and it just stays there. In the old days, you had this kind of handle for, for the radio, so you could take it around and move it. Uh, and, and they were interested in trying to see how can we actually develop a new where it really makes sense to me that it's a portable stereo. Uh, and you can see it's an old thing here, it's mentioned 3G. Uh, this is long, long ago, because this was in 2008. But to, to give you an idea, if you give an open assignment like this to a group of five to six students, I'll show you the end results we got out of one of the groups doing this uh, as a kind of a video. So what I'll show you here is a video from one of the groups trying to concept for a portable stereo and we had discussion designers as well to get things and of course he was the one who was responsible for the video you see uh, concepts coming up uh, being drawn uh, and then you will see in the moment uh, kind of a, a concept they had until the real thing that they ended up saying that's what we're going to build the product on concept forms that you see here uh, have never been produced by Van Olufsen. Whoever Van Olufsen had most of them is actually one case of another. You see here a way of being able to control uh, the uh, different play things, a way of expanding it so you could kind of have a touch screen uh, charging it, uh, and at first also having possibilities of external But this is uh, like uh, a whole order kind of uh, chocolate bar. They also went into uh, how do we establish um, How do we kind of put the electronics together? Um, where do we have different parts? Actually, the things that you see in the of uh, the things coming up here at the end uh, is actually uh, a patented Because the students also got access to uh, information from the company because we're having this kind of open innovation. 
But I hope this gave you an idea of how high these kids come. The best of these, the best of students before their thesis that actually uh, made a progress. Now, now I'm jumping from what happened when I started it, and now uh, for the China team assignments, which is even more intercultural and also interdisciplinary, because uh, they wanted also to kind of see, well, how can our products fit into China? So the business aspect became uh, a part of it as well. And they had to kind of uh, prototype the experience. They went out and visited uh, potential customers from different uh, layers in the society, very, very, very rich people and kind of middle, uh, uh, middle people uh, down to uh, younger people who would uh, be able to kind of uh, purchase these kind of uh, markets. So it was more business and market oriented in China, um, where there was both a business model as well as the engineering and design uh, things uh, that I originally started with. And this was also successful. Um, of course, I didn't take part in this, but it's, it's an interesting concept of trying to marry the technical side as well as the um, business side like this. So here are just a few photos where you see prototypes of different devices being constructed. They also did, did a physical prototype where they had access to the prototype lab workshop that they had uh, at Bang & Olufsen and people who would be helping them there. Uh, you can also see when they had to kind of sketch uh, ideas and come up with posters of potential customers of their product. Um, why would it be a good idea? Down to kind of uh, uh, scopes where you kind of cook it up to electronic devices or mechanical things that they are putting together. Uh, look at the jaw chainsaw thing that you have in, in here. So that's kind of a very intensive environment uh, with networking. Uh, and actually many of the people uh, have con kept contact uh, since then. Now, this all ended up with final presentations where they had to make a stand like this. And typically there would be up to 20 manage management people from the company uh, being there. And there'll be uh, uh, the guy who was over here was uh, responsible for the engineering college of Aarhus where uh, I was working at the time. Um, and then they all got a diploma and got a handshake. Um, from, from uh, different people. I hope this gave you an idea of what really happened at such summer schools. Now I'll, just, I'll give you a little bit about the impact of the summer schools as well, because we tried to give them a number of questionnaires in order to measure how were their professional skills acquired. Um, and, and some of them described it as transformative experience, essentially really, where it really transformed themselves not a big percentage, but still, and uh, almost all of them saying this having a lasting effect on their professional development uh, thing. Um, in case you're interested in kind of seeing the details of this, uh, you can, uh, of course, uh, take a look at the, the papers that we have written about this. But, but some of the students actually gave us uh, quotes, like the, the camp gave me, an, gave me insight in our areas I've never worked with before, the entire process from idea or need to prototype is the hard work that is before us software engineers take over the project and start developing the products based on specifications, et cetera, et cetera. But these specifications are all derived from the kind of work we did during the camp. So it was enlightening for me to take part in that process. And, and other students have actually uh, ended up pursuing uh, the, the business uh, aspect of technology that we were introducing them to in, in this kind of setting. So professional skills uh, was required as, a, as well as interpersonal skills. That's all networking things. Both the cost, cost cultural thing and the cost disciplinary thing um, are things that I really feel strongly for and I think is really important. And then the ability to communicate, just like we heard about before for PhD students, it's really important to be able to communicate the knowledge you have at different levels to different kinds of stakeholders. And that's what we saw uh, here uh, as well. And then in general, the personal, personal skills, um, how to utilize teams creativity, how to in innovate around product concepts are things that they don't learn about in many courses, at least not at Aarhus University. You may be uh, more fortunate where you come from 
Uh, but the thing that you have to kind of understand the concept development, the balance between the, the solution, the user needs, the technical feasibility, and the economically viability really is, is interesting. And here's another quote where this guy was a uh, uh, guy or girl, I'm not sure. Uh, they're able to develop a number of the personal skills that's been invaluable to professional development. And this is just one five ECTS course, uh, but he gained or he or she gained experience in dealing with a number of situations which have been applicable in interviews and day-to-day -day, uh, working life. The concepts we were introduced to such as user story and design have been fundamental in my career and provided me with basics that I've been able to develop on. So that's the kind of statements that I really am proud to see. Um, now, this is also from the Chinese, Chinese side, um, whether they improved or not improved uh, things, you can see the numbers are rather high in different areas in terms of problem solving, uh, self-management, uh, interpersonal, um, and in a sense, cultural. Cultural skills are really the essence of networking in my view. So in case you are interested, uh, there are two papers uh, that uh, we have written about this. The first one uh, essentially tried to explain uh, the concept of the summer school, which was published kind of in 2009. So it was after the first summer school we wrote that. And then uh, in 2016, we actually tried to follow up and see how can we enhance the non-technical skills by means of such an engineering, multidisciplinary engineering summer school. Uh, and both of them are, are published in the same uh, journal of engineering education. But that one is the one that has um, tried to do interviews and uh, questionnaires for the students as a whole. So I'm only, I'll close with uh, a couple of uh, pictures. So you see, this is the 2008 crew, uh, mostly uh, male dominated. Uh, that's also changing when you move move on in a more business uh, setting. Uh, here we have the 2009 team, uh, obviously other students. Uh, and uh, then uh, if you move to uh, China, uh, here's the Chinese uh, combination. And here you'll see more, more females also because they are more apparent in the business side than in the uh, technical side. So with those words, uh, I'd like to close the presentation and uh, then take some questions. So I have, I think I've spent some time, I'll sp spare some time for enabling that. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you so, so much. It was a pleasure to listen to you. And even before you have finished, uh, we already received a question from the audience. So this time, uh, Lena is talking to you. Uh, and uh, she was wondering, uh, well, generally, to quote her, you mentioned in the beginning that universities do not work interdisciplinary, and therefore summer schools is a good complement. Is there any chance that we can integrate this kind of course in curricula or, uh, or to or do we lose most probably some perspectives by doing that? That's a really good question. Actually, it's something I have been trying to do myself. Um, the, the, I, I think it, you would lose some of the intensity and you would lose some of the intercultural thing by having it at the one institution. However, I think that it should be possible and it only requires that the different let's say faculties of mechanical engineering, faculties of electrical engineering, they actually are able to talk to each other uh, and it's possible to plan courses across that. Unfortunately, that's not the case at all University. I've tried it and uh, uh, people planning, planning courses, they're planning courses for their own cu curriculum and they uh, really do not um, kind of, uh, let's say, understand um, how can you, um, how can you kind of couple courses into between different faculties? Uh, that's that's been a, a struggle that I have been facing, but I think it should be possible. But you would lose some of the intensity and some of the uh, intercultural uh, thing. I think. So, as I understand, uh, the the funding and the initiative is mostly from the the company, the Bang and Olsen, and yeah. So it's a mix. Um, I managed to find some funding from Erasmus Plus. Um, 
So uh, I had funding there for three years, I think, uh, plus some funding from the company. Um, and, and then after that, we got funding from somewhere else. I can't even remember, the kind of Danish foundation, I think. Uh, and I think that as time has passed, uh, the company has actually funded more and more of it. But that's only, the only cost thing, really thing, is that you, uh, it's because we had to stay somewhere, we had to eat something. Um, and uh, that's, that, of course, is the intensity that you get when you're living in the same place. Um, what is the motivation for that company? Like, is it, is they, do they really expect to get some ideas to implement later or it's just, uh, you know, uh, they, they have, they have been getting ideas that they have implemented later. And, uh, actually most of the years, they actually also, uh, managed to, uh, get ideas out that they have patented. Wow. Okay. That's right. impressive. So, uh, regarding all other presentations that we had today, uh, was this continued in the in the pandemic? Is it possible? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's been closed down while the COVID uh, situation has been in here. Uh, but uh, I don't know, honestly, because I'm no longer involved with it. I have a, well, a rather busy schedule uh, on a day-to-day -day business as, as well. All right, thank you. Another question from Professor Edmund. Uh, how would you define conceptual design? Well, to me, uh, the reason why I call it conceptual design is that um, we would like to both design things in the physical world, but also in the virtual world. Um, and that's where you kind of have, like the one you just saw before, that uh, thing was never built, uh, actually was considered to build such a radio um, at Bang & Olufsen, but they decided against it in the end. Um, but, um, the, the point here is that it's, it's conceptual in the sense that you have a chance of experimenting with things before they exist. Um, and and that's, that's really a cool concept. And it's a way to be able to actually get, um, get a feel for whether a product will have be marketable uh, and be uh, possible to use. So you can stand with maybe a prototype in your hands and get a feeling for that, but being able to see like the video I showed you, uh, is actually uh, typically more meaningful and give you more impression of what would it be like, both to manufacture as well as uh, to uh, use. Mm, thank you so much. So somehow you got lucky today to receive lots of the questions, and that is not all. Uh, we also have one question from uh, Jens. Uh, so uh, to quote him, uh, many says that he needs to be monodisciplinary be uh, before being multidisciplinary. How do you see this balance? Yes, so I, I actually agree that you should be strong in one discipline. However, I think that's what you... Uh, what you often find is that um, the studies, the curriculum that we put together for our young talent are really monodisciplinary. And I think that's a big shame because I think that um, you can actually gain a lot from being able to interact between the different disciplines. If you educate people purely to be, uh, let's say, having no place where they have a, fund, a, base, a basis that they can build on, they become too weak. In, in, in this kind of uh, uh, competition of where, what they can actually do in terms of, uh, uh, from a company perspective, what does he deliver? Uh, so so I, I strongly believe that we should have people who are, have a basis, but they, kind of, they have a, a learning of things, but they could take, for example, at a master's level, um, kind of their interdisciplinarity and kind of go wider there, as long as they have the basis to build on. So this was uh, master students or mostly bachelor students actually. Bachelor students. Yes, kind of like one year before their thesis was ah, the okay. main target. We had applicants uh, from the all the universities involved in the Erasmus uh, uh, setting, and then uh, we chose the the ones we thought were best for doing this, uh, because that would be going away in case you were uh, having it as a as a normal course. But I really would love to have it as a normal course in a, at, at our, our university uh, as well. So I just hope like just of... three weeks. I mean, it, it, it seemed uh, like very impressive results in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> if that would be normal course, would you that, do that in three weeks only or? 
No, no. I mean, I think the reason why it was they, they could go so far was that if you have people who are engaged in things and you don't tell them you need to pass this bar, they just jump. They just jump and they jump high because they get inspiration from each other. And, and when you have talented people, they, they get a lot of inspiration. Of course, they were not all six groups were as impressive as the video I showed you every year. But every year there was some, some of them you said, wow. And the people from the company would kind of go back and say, why don't our own people suggest things like this? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Probably so they hired some of the students later. Do you yeah. know about that? You have to have this. I know about that. Wow, great. Thank you very much, Peter. That was very interesting. Thank you so, so much. And I see we're left with only one minute. So this is a signifier for all of us that we should move on. So let us move on to another topic for today's speech. So how to change education? Most probably the question which we tend to ask each and every day. So let us hear the answer finally. Hey, Anna, Vigo. Hello. 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 Thank you so much. Before we start, we just would like to give our compliments to our fantastic moderators, Elisa and Gediminas. You're doing an amazing job and uh, keeping a really high quality of this conference. So thank you very much. And secondly, before we start, we would like to share a Google link uh, so that uh, if you would like to keep discussing with us afterwards, we have created, as we always do, a Google document. So I'm right on it to copy and paste it here. And uh, there you're welcome to uh, share your ideas and thoughts. And uh, let's stay in touch, hopefully, after this and uh, before the next time we meet again, hopefully in a year. OK, so uh, I will share a screen and both me and Viggo will talk. So. Uh, so that you know, but you will hear from Vigo very soon. So. so I will do the ordinary and ask you if you all can see the screen. And I think you can. Yes, let me know if you can't. Okay, so we are here today, Vigo and me. I work at the Department of Learning and Engineering Sciences at KTH, and uh, Vigo Kahn is a professor at the Department of Computer Science, and he also holds a part-time position at our Department of Learning in order to support faculty and education to develop, and he's doing a tremendous job on the percentage he has doing this. We would like to share how we structure networks and arenas for influence and development and knowledge, knowledge exchange on current and future education. And we are in this session talking about all the arenas that we have that are open for all academic students, management, administration, and, uh, and with students, mainly student representatives are involved. So we will do this by firstly talking about why we do this and so sort of the background to why it happened and also how they have emerged before the pandemic and what happened when the pandemic came and how we work with trying to make continuous improvements and also what we think about the coming steps when we come back to the new normal. So the background is for sure exactly what Elisa mentioned briefly, that it is very complex and we dis discuss this daily, how can we work with continuous improvements and enhancements of education. And we know that the overall ideas that the central management or even the policymakers globally have is hard to, to make actions upon in the everyday life of a teacher or a student. And we know that there are several barriers, and these have been explored and researched upon throughout decades. And we know that there are things that are really important in order to contribute to better change, and that is, among other things, competence development, a good infrastructure, good support, and a good dialogue in the organization. We also know from Bendermasher for instance, that it's very important that we have a cohesive quality culture that works with continuous following up and changing. But this rigid structure must be combined with a really good bottom-up uh, culture that embraces new initiatives. 
So that's the background. And then I hand over to Viggo, who will talk about the emergence of the arenas. Yeah, so let's talk about the different networks and arenas that we have uh, uh, created in order to develop the, the education at KTH. So there are currently eight of them listed here, and we will talk especially about three of them, uh, three open ones. Um, so here you can see uh, the arenas, but also how often they meet and when they were started. Uh, so we have from the top the program directors network, which uh, is a cross uh, department uh, network. Uh, well, all these networks are of course cross departments, but uh, all pro program directors are invited to this network and it started in, in, in 2012. And we have the KTH Sotel conference uh, every second year. We have Stor Treffen, which is uh, our big meeting. Uh, more about this later. We have prioritized topic groups. We have the Directors of Studies Network and uh, the Third Research Education Network. And we have what we call the Open Networking Meetings started last year. And uh, uh, well, a very new, brand new arena uh, called the Forum. Okay, but let's go to Stor Treffen. So in 2016, uh, we started this. It was an idea to, to establish a, a fully open arena where current and long-term questions can, could be raised, discussed, acted upon, and anchored in the whole organization. So this is a meeting for everyone, for uh, all teachers, the management, board functions, and the student union linking uh, the other networks and arenas together. So here's have see two pictures from the um, physical meeting that we had uh, the first years, and last year we, we got digital. So this Stor Treffen uh, is an event uh, in November and May each year. So we started with uh, 60 people, and you can see the uh, development here during the years. So last year um, in May, we had 262 in the meeting. And so we had to have a, an extra um, meeting, an extra Stortreff just in, one month later in order to um, cover all the interests of, of people who wanted to talk about this new situation with the digital um, teaching. And then, we have had meetings online since then in December last year and in May this year. And this is good because you can, you don't need uh, a huge room to, to fit every, uh, every person. You can use the Zoom instead where we will meet together. You can also see that uh, uh, what we have done in this different stuff. But let's look at uh, more in detail what how a Stortreff looks like. So this is a typical organization of the Stortreff. Uh, this is a four hour meeting uh, the whole afternoon. Um, so it will start with uh, about 45 minutes of plenary talks and information, uh, short talks from uh, the president and the vice president and some other uh, persons, invited persons. Next, we have pitches by discussion leaders. So we have um, uh, about 30 different discussions that we will uh, have in this Stortreff in the middle. And for each discussion group, there is uh, an appointed discussion leader who will pitch the discussion in 40 seconds. And then we have three rounds of discussions in parallel groups. So there are about 10 parallel discussions uh, at each slot here. And uh, I'll give you some examples of what the discussion topics could be. Uh, we had uh, in the last Stortreff, we had assessment that can replace large written exams. We had support for hybrid teaching, pedagogical courses, teacher training and faculty development, student influence at second and third cycle, and 26 more. Uh, so we uh do this so the each uh, participant will be in three discussions and they choose uh, uh after 
uh, listen to the pitches, which discussions they should uh, participate in. And during these discussions, we use these uh, Google documents or open shared documents where everyone in the group can uh, contribute. And they are also used in the summaries afterwards. So after the three rounds, the discussion leaders will make a, a short summary on 60 seconds. 60 seconds, uh, summarizing the, the important points uh, discussed during this session. And we have these uh, uh, documents as the documentation afterwards as well. And as the last uh, event, uh, uh, the vice president of education uh, will give his concluding reflections uh, on the discussions this day. So uh, this will take about four hours, as I said. Uh, and then we have discussed at least 30 different topics. So this, of course, needs some organization. So Anna Karin and I are um, uh, organizing this. We use um, a registration form for where all participants may vote for uh, discussion topics uh, and sub suggest new discussion topics, and they also may volunteer to become a discussion leader. So we need uh, 30 or uh, in fact 60 discussion leaders because we have two leaders in each group. Um, so before so some days before this uh, meeting, Stuttgart, we have uh, a discussion leader meeting to plan the discussions. After Stuttgart, all participants are invited to fill in an evaluation survey, and uh, you will uh, soon see some results from this survey. And this, based on this survey and the discussion leaders' um, experiences, uh, we have a discussion leader meeting evaluating the Stuttgart. Uh, about one or two months after Stuttgart. And uh, then we go to the KTH Educational Board to, um, to report what happened and uh, uh, some important issues may be raised there. So another arena is the PREU groups. So they are prioritized issues groups. Um, meeting between uh, Stuttgart. So they are meeting more or less regularly, uh, about every third week, perhaps. Um, and they discuss a, a specific topic. So there are currently eight preview groups, and you can see the names of them here. We have one about premises, schedule, and planning, internationalization, sustainable development, digitalization, work life and collaboration, equality, diversity, and equal rights, methods of assessment, and the student's perspective and influence. Uh, so and everyone uh, could be a member of such a group. You, you don't have to apply. You just go to a meeting, and the meetings are announced publicly. Uh, there is one appointed leader to the group, and they usually become a, 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 a core group of members of the group uh, between uh, 10 and 20, uh, consisting of staff, uh, faculty, um, educational developers, student representatives, uh, and so on, interested in that specific topic. Uh, and in order to um, link this to the KTH management. Uh, each PE group leader will visit the KTH educational board once a year. So here is also the schedule for when the different groups uh, are meeting the educational board this year. And the third type of arena that we are going to present today is the open networking meetings. And they started when the pandemic started. So in uh, the 1st of April last year, we had the first open networking meeting. So uh, we realized that there was a big need for uh, teachers and staff to meet and discuss uh, this new situation. So here you can see uh, which meetings we had uh, last spring, 
So we had meetings almost every week. And to the right, you see the, the number of uh, participants in these meetings. So these meetings were shorter than Stu Chefen, just uh, uh, two hours. Uh, in the first meeting, we had 346 participants because the uh, need was uh, enormous to discuss the, the situation. Uh, in all these meetings, the Vice President for Education uh, is participating and also uh, the digitalization support. So we can give good answers to the questions that uh, the teachers have. And this have, we have continued with this uh, uh, the whole last year. So we are still uh, uh, holding these uh, open network meetings every second week. And I think we will continue with this also after the pandemic. So they are, of course, fully digital. And all our arenas and networks have been able to uh, move to the digital world without problem. All right, and then we come to our third part of our presentation, and that is how we try to work with the continuous improvement of the, these arenas. And as Viggo mentioned, there is the Stuchef and survey, and we didn't start with that immediately because we didn't know what would happen immediately. And then we realized that, oh my, we need to follow up, and uh, uh, this is becoming more and more formal. People are coming. So from spring 2019, we also have table leader follow ups, and as you can understand there are quite many table leaders. So that will be like 40 or 50 sometimes even, and they are faculty or admin staff, etc. And we gather uh, all who can to follow up in discussions. And we also have uh, recently made interviews with new participants in order to understand how we can um, invite and include those who haven't really found this place to Jeff and to be for them. And uh, that is something that we think is more and more important the more people that come, because more and more decisions are actually made even at the meetings. It's like people meet and they say, OK, let's do this. Let's make a pilot of that. So then it's really important that people know that things are happening here. And also, uh, we also received results from the national audit in Sweden uh, on the quality assurance system that uh, talked a lot about these arenas. And we will just briefly, briefly look at this feedback. So what is consistent throughout in the survey were almost all questions are consistent through the years. So we are just showing one example of one of the question, which is important, what, in what ways have it been fruitful for you to be here? And then you can see that overall uh, they get new ideas they have possibility to share their experiences and they know more and more about KTH. And they say it's a nice afternoon and they get some good specialization knowledge is lower, of course, than the new ideas and the abroad and the new contacts. So this is something that we see comes every time. And uh, we have set up the other groups in order to and also market the other groups that Vico mentioned, that they can deepen their knowledge between the Stuchefar, because the Stuchefar is mainly the broad, getting an understanding of what's happening, knowing who's doing what, etc., finding your place in the system, and feeling that you can contribute to this, not just knowing about it, but contributing, instead of sitting and complaining at the office or at home, as we do now. Another question that we would like to share, which we can all, we have the, uh, sorted all, all the surveys here. So that, that's the common question of, are you generally satisfied or dissatisfied? And if you look at the circle shorts, then you can see that the dark blue is the best to get. And the red, dark red is the second best and the, yellowish orange is the third best. So you can see that that dominates a lot throughout the years. The first chart, we had a different um, survey system. So that, that responds to other colors, but it's in the order from above and, and down. But the, as you can see, it's really, uh, they feel satisfied. 
very much. And the, the final one is still open. We had our last stool check last week. But we follow this. Uh, and um, we actually had some disappointed, uh, may, maybe students or maybe faculty, when there were some tricky issues about cheating and discussions like that. Uh, so we could see that there were some who added um, some remarks about that. And then we have decided to make sure that the table leaders are inviting all student representatives, very welcoming them and saying that they are here to represent the whole student group. So they should not be treated as individual students like, oh, so you cheat or things like that that can happen. We really want to have an inclusive atmosphere. And this is pictures, these are pictures from the table leaders follow ups. And as you can see, we work with the questionnaire, we read the comments and we sit together and we plan what should we do and act upon. And uh, we also have summarized here that we can see these are the good aspects and this is what they want more of, more depth, more ideas and more awareness. And this was the last one we had before the pandemic physically and then of course we do it as uh, we could have continued this but in zoom the interviews the results from that that we, i mentioned is that uh, what they all found was that if they found that it was relevant and that they contri could contribute they felt it was inclusive and they were surprised that there were many there and especially in the zoom era and uh, they thought it was good to be able to choose that we had lots of topics, didn't bother them. They found, oh, but there's something important for me. So many out there are not interested in all these topics. So they are not so concerned about there are 30 topics. That, that's just us in the core of this. We are interested in everything. And they felt uh, less loneliness in the problems facing. And it can also be that they have critique against top management decisions. They find that they can share that there, that this is not the place where you cannot raise critique. This is the area, this is the area for critique. And uh, these comments below, there are different comments that came from various voices. Yes, and also from the discussion leaders, we have summarized now the follow-ups in 2020 since we had this, uh, this pandemic coming over us. And we saw, because it was surprising that people wanted to gather, because we first actually decided to stop the program directors network and because they would have too much to do. So we actually canceled the first in March there. And then uh, we got the feeling, no, we're not supposed to do that. They need to talk. So we opened. And then we said, but we should open for all because there are so many voices needed. It's like almost we need Stutref uh, mentality on this. And boom, as you saw in April, when we talked about the re-exam period, that over 300 people attended. And we could see that it works well online. And uh, we also find that we can broaden that a network to other universities as we do today and we find that uh, well we opened our networks meetings nationally uh, for a couple of months ago and that was also nice we didn't uh, do much more about it but uh, i mean uh, but it could be very nice in the future we would love if you would be interested to have an open networking meeting together with your universities we find that it's very good to document and to have it in online documents so you can share it easily, you can go back. We see that many go into the documents if they don't have time to come to the meeting. They go in, they comment, they read, and they refer to it in different ways. But we miss meeting for real, of course, so we shouldn't only be online afterwards. But we need to think about how to work on also because KTH, as many universities, is spread out in campuses all over Stockholm in a very broad sense. So this has meant that faculty, teachers, etc. can come and visit these meetings much easier. And... In the beginning, when you start doing these types of meetings, it, it, you will feel the complaints. What will happen now? 
And, and, so, and they are right. It's so difficult to make it continuous, to be persistent. But the, that feeling is gone now. We don't hear that any longer, what is happening, because it's a good combination. And the management has realized that they need to be there. So the vice presidents actually show up and realize that it's really good to be there and to anchor their ideas and to change and improve their ideas based on the feedback. Yeah, and also I mentioned the national audit and they actually bring up, if you look at the quote in the middle here, that they say that uh, it has a great importance they find in order to increase commitment and participation. That was one of the quotes about it. And we felt that this, con this contributed for us upwards to say that, look, they say that this is important for the quality assurance systems. So we need to... Um, you know, put resources into this and, and support the table leaders so that they will feel that as a teacher, when I do this, I get compliments. My boss will think this is a good priority to do because, you know, the merits and everything. So we will keep on fighting for that, of course. And we are more and more doing it together. So a brief look, and I'm just going to look at the time, so it's not much, but we are just mentioning that when we come back to the new normal, we think that we should, as Vigo said, keep having these open networking meetings. Maybe not so often all the time, but we know that there are tensions when we come back that we need to solve and need to keep discussing. And we have a list, but you know all of this, of course, so it's just that what we see will be strange when we come back is that we have so much experience. Some have good experience, some have bad experiences and all in between. And of course, people will push the front now and the management will want us all to push the front and be the best in hybrid teaching, assessment and lifelong learning. And this will stress the system and, and, the, and all the community members and we are very exhausted. So we think there is a place for these networking to keep holding us together and not running too fast or just slowing down and going back to the same old either. So we hope that we can be a support in that as well. Yes, and we are very thankful that we were invited to speak here today. And we have also listened to many interesting speeches today. So we hope for future networking. And we also have a link there to, uh, and we will share the link to our Google Slides if you are interested. And the, the link down here is to, to the different arenas. And also a thank you from our team that we collaborate with when we do this uh, research on the Stortreffer, et cetera. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, Vigo. Thank you so, so much. It was really very uh, pleasant to listen to you. And uh, most probably at certain points, we could all relate at least to something uh, what was mentioned during your speech. So once again, you got lucky to receive the questions even before your speech has ended. Uh, so most probably we'll start with the one on chat, which was proposed by Lena. Okay. How do you decide what issues to bring up in your uh Start. Meetings, yeah, we, I, I cannot pronounce yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we kept the Swedish word because is it, is it's somehow it? easier to Google, but it's not yeah. if you don't have those. Yes, but I think Vigo can say that, but he, because you already explained it a bit and he will emphasize a bit on that, how the topics are brought up. Yeah, so we do this in several ways. So we have the preview groups uh, who have their specific topics and they are always uh, represented at Stortreffen. Uh, and then uh, we collect um, is, uh, IDs to, to discussions uh, from uh, different uh, uh, areas. And we look, for example, in our uh, continuous assessment, uh, yearly assessment at KTH, uh, there are uh, reports written by every school. And we look there for what is what are the current important topics to bring up. And then uh, any uh, participant may um, suggest topics also in the uh, registration form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you said it became uh, much more relevant uh, in the start of the pandemic, right? So everyone had multiple questions. And after a year of that, you still, you still continue. And did you settle? Do you have the system now working 
perfectly in the distant learning. <laughs> I think we have a, a good working system and we will continue with this. Uh, and also the, the uh, teachers and staff at KTH, they, they know about this system and they they like it and, and they turn up. Mm, thank you. So uh, Audi asks, uh, who decides on prior, uh, prioritizing the suggested topics? So we mainly use the votes uh, from the participants in the registration. So the topics that uh, got the most votes will be be present, but we have a very low threshold. So, so uh, almost all of the suggested discussion uh, discussions will be at Sudchepen, even if there are only uh, uh, quite a few people interested in that topic. So, it, it might be enough for for uh, a discussion. All right, I see. So one thing is definitely clear that you are going to continue with those meetings. Uh, but the question from my side, aren't you afraid that the uh, amount of the participants is going to drop? Because, well, you know, once we are at home, it is easier to connect. We may do a couple of things at the same time. Uh, don't you think that once uh, the participants are asked to participate actually physically, uh, that would be a challenge already? Well, Anna Karim, what do you say? Yeah, but definitely we will need to be relevant in order for people to show up. And we shouldn't be too stressed if it goes down and up. So I think for all communities of practice, it they are only there if they find it relevant and useful. And because we all faculty all over the world are busy. So you can measure the relevance by the number of attendants almost directly, I think. So yes, afraid. No, we will probably figure out new ways of establishing arenas for change. Maybe they will, yeah, we, we can throw down some top-down decisions and then they will get angry and they want to discuss and they will show up. <laughs> no. Absolutely. You so. should buy more cake, you know, because you lost that socialization. You're right. Part. Yes. <laughs> they will move that. into the universe, yeah, to the big area where we used to meet and just right. camp there. Mm. Thank you, thank you so much, so much for, for, for your informative um, uh, speech and thank you so much for uh, those answers which you provided us with. So most probably uh, this is the high time for us to move on and uh, this time we are happy to welcome uh, Professor Edmund. Hello. Hey, Laba, Srita, Sliotova, good morning, <laughs> uh, Worldwide Consortium. I just uh, had a cup of coffee here in California Good morning. Um, the good morning. So it's nice to see everyone. Thank you, Gedeminai, for inviting me. Uh, I don't know if I have much to uh, contribute, but our story is complicated uh, and it's fragile. Uh, so I will share my screen, I think. Yes. And then um, we can um, jump into the discussion of what what we're doing here at uh, California Polytechnic State University in conjunction with um, uh, Vilnius uh, Tech. And I'm calling it a fragile connection for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, I am teaching an interdisciplinary studio. Those of you who have done any of thing like this know that it's not an easy way of teaching. Uh, teaching two different skill sets that are united through building design. Yet, even at the undergraduate level, the two groups already feel differentiation. They feel specialization. And that's because we teach them specialized skills. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is that we ask the students to design a glass house in the desert of Palm Springs, which has a lot of sun and a lot of earthquake seismic loads. It's fragile because we asked them to put the columns of the building on the mid sides of the roof, which is not intuitive and very, very challenging. Um, I'll explain why we did that. And then finally, it's a fragile connection because we invited six Lithuanian students to join us and two Lithuanian uh, professors, Gedeminas is one of them. 
and I am co-teaching with an, a professor of architecture. So all of this is designed to fail. And uh, somehow, uh, maybe we didn't fail completely, but obviously you, you can see that it's difficult. So why are we doing this type of studio? I will answer that uh, because the motivation is not as pure as you might think, uh, at least initially. Why are there international students involved? You might recognize my last name as being Lithuanian. Uh, what were the expectations of this studio? I think it's very important for you to know who I am teaching and what goals we have for the class, the challenges, and then the rewards, of course. Now, the picture that you see in front of you is not a glass house. It's a 100 meter long pavilion that was designed by my hero, Myron Goldsmith, uh, for the 1964 World's Fair in New York City. Uh, it was never constructed, but it also has this provocative four column arrangement and the columns are not at the corners of the roof. Now, Myron Goldsmith is a hero for me because he was Lithuanian, his father was born in Vilnius, and he was also a registered architect and a registered engineer. And he was a very forward thinker about integrating structures and architecture. So why are we doing this type of studio? At the most basic administrative level, this is a senior project for my students. I teach a four year undergraduate bachelor's degree in architectural engineering at California Polytechnic. And each student in my university must do a senior project, an independent type of thinking study. So this studio fulfills that academic administrative responsibility. So checking a box. It also checks a box for the fourth year architecture students. Now at Cal Poly, my university, we have a five-year bachelor's degree for architecture so they can get licensed without a master's, master's degree. So in the fourth year, this is a studio for, for the architecture students. So you could already see the tension here. Here's an engineering capstone experience. And in, in, in the United States, that's typically design a parking garage or something like that. And then a fourth year architecture studio. Uh, I must say that without an architecture professor, it would be uh, extremely difficult, even more challenging to do this. I am not an architect, I'm an engineer. So my colleague, uh, Professor Meredith Sattler in the architecture department is currently co-teaching with me. I have taught with other professors also. I'll try to mention that uh, at the end of the talk. Why are we doing this type of studio? Another more higher level idea is that interdisciplinary experiences are very, very much valued by our industry partners. My students get job offers by Christmas, uh, multiple job offers. We had 50 companies come recruit my students and we only have 35 graduating students in my department. And why do they want, love our students? partly because of these kinds of experiences. It's very important on a resume and it's very difficult to teach. Those of you who have done it know exactly what I'm talking about. This is not an easy way of teaching, partly because none of us experienced it as students ourselves. So now why uh, do I wanna say, don't think that this is too uh, lofty and noble of me that I did this, it actually started because I was forced to do it. Um, we have uh, an accreditation agency called ABET, A-B-E-T, and they give the stamp that says we are an accredited program. And one of their requirements was to have an interdisciplinary focus uh, for uh, our students. And we are in a college that has architecture and structural engineering. 
And that's very rare in the United States. Most schools of architecture are linked with the arts uh, and they have very little to do with uh, quantitative technical skills. At my uh, university, the architecture students take 50, five zero weeks of structural engineering. Okay, so it's a very unique uh, environment. Um, why are there international students involved? Cal Poly and Vilnius uh, Tech, it used to be VGTU, Vilnius Gediminas Technical University. We have a long standing relationship. 10 years we've been uh, partnering together. And typically we go to Vilnius uh, in the summer. So we've been doing that uh, for years and years, but now we cannot do that because of the pandemic. So we said, well, you should come over to our house. Just come over to our house. So it was just a goodwill gesture. They hosted us for many, many years. Gediminas himself was involved from day one. So we said, come over to our house. And we said, oh, by the way, our house is a glass house. Come on, come on over. Our house is a house in the desert, a glass house in the desert. Come. And they came anyway. So here is Mies uh, looking at his precious model of the Farnsworth house, one of the most famous houses in America at the time of its construction. The, the house that you saw in the previous slides is based uh, by Mies van der Rohe and Myron Goldsmith. And this house was never built. It was a theoretical uh, conceptual exercise, which is why I asked uh, Professor Peter about the conceptual design. This was never built. It was a conceptual design. This house, Farnsworth House, of course, was built. Uh, and it was a disaster on many, many levels. So everything is fragile in this presentation here. So what were the expectations of the students? We have, right now we have 40 students, four zero, and uh, they are redesigning a glass house in the Palm Springs desert. This was a project that we just saw on Wednesday, brand, uh, just, just two days ago, we saw this project where they reinvented the house, but you could still see that they followed our rules, our Miesian rules of corners only at the midside of the building. Um, we also did an extremely deep theoretical dive into literature surrounding glass architecture. And I don't mean just uh, architectural studies, I mean literary studies. We, we read Zamyatin's novel, We, Mass, uh, Lietuviške, and um, I have a copy of it, Lietuvių uh, Kalboi in Lithuanian. And we also studied Eisenstein's film, Sergei Eisenstein's film. That's a wonderful story about why Eisenstein is important to my studio, but Gediminas will have to invite me next year to tell you that long story. Um, what did they do? They did a lot. They did a site analysis for a fictitious client, but a real site including slope studies, vegetation studies, natural ventilation studies, solar thermal studies, structural design for gravity loads, structural design for earthquake loads, and then the design of the glass to the steel. Very, very complicated, plus foundation design, preliminarily, very, very, very preliminarily, in 10 weeks, 10 weeks. So the Lithuanians call me the tsunami, uh, the tsunami, everybody calls me the tsunami. So 10 weeks, uh, actually nine weeks, because we're done, we're just presenting right now. And then they did a final fantasy where they reinvented it one more time. So they really did two design projects in 10 weeks. Uh, and it's, uh, kind of astonishing as, as we saw in the previous lesson what students can do given an opportunity uh, to create. What are the ch challenges? Obviously Zoom is exhausting and notice I said for the students it's not exhausting for the professors whatsoever. We could do this all day every day and get the minimalist is living proof. He after this he comes to California for four hours. We go from 8 a.m. till noon 
Uh, you may think that's a funny challenge. For architecture students, 8 a.m., they don't know which 8 I'm referring to, 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. Uh, is it 8 or is it 20? They don't know anymore. They're completely upside down. Uh, three times a week. So that's a lot of contact hours, 12 hours we, where we are together, 12 hours, and they are with each other outside of class. But collaboration is very difficult. In a typical architecture studio, they stay there all night and eat donuts and listen to music and they keep each other awake. It's very, very difficult to do that on Zoom. And consequently, the biggest complaint we're getting is communication, communication, communication. They don't know what I want. I don't know what they want. They don't know what they want. Nobody knows what anybody wants. Even though it's in writing, we say it 10 times. Uh, and I get it. It's very difficult um, to communicate clearly. Here's a little lesson. You can never be clear enough. Everybody should just write that down. You can never be clear enough. No matter how clear you are, it can become more clear. Okay, what are the benefits, the unique rewards of a pandemic Zoom environment? And I must admit there are many. Uh, one of them is that I'm drinking a latte right now that I just made for myself uh, at an academic conference. You know, it's, it's very unusual, right? Um, uh, a more practical one from a student point of view is that we get world famous people to visit our little studio. So we had Bill Baker, the chief designer of the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building on planet Earth. He came twice to our studios. We have Inigo Manglano Ovalle, a MacArthur Fellow, the so-called genius grant in the United States. He came twice to our studio. Edward Windhorst, the leading Miesian scholar in the United States, an expert on Mies van der Rohe and Myron Goldsmith. He came twice to our studio. We had um, a fantastic um, array of intellectual input from guests. We've had curators. We've had scholars of film. We've had scholars of literature come in. Why? The Glass House has about a 120 year theoretical history. It's very, very unique. And what happened is that we unleashed this tsunami of creativity in the students. And yet, uh, it is very difficult to teach conceptual design. And I'm finding that it's very difficult to even define the word conceptual design. I think what uh, my colleague, Professor Peter, said was really theoretical design, which I would argue is not quite the same as conceptual design. So what did the students do? Well, uh, this was from Wednesday, uh, circulation diagrams, solar studies, thermal studies, and structural studies like you can't believe. Um, also very, very professional drawings. This is a section perspective drawing of architecture and structure, uh, highly unique uh, opportunities to dazzle our jurors, literally dazzle. We had um, people say it was 100% professional what they've seen, even in a 10 week experience. And then here's a very interesting thing for the engineers in the room. Um, my students did lots of deep, deep structural design, but more than one student said to me, this is not how I was taught to design. And I said, what do you mean? And the answer always is the same. We are given a set of constraints, like a beam with some loads, and we have to design. Here, you're giving us a desert, Palm Springs desert. And when you say, go design, right? And I just nod my head and I say, yes, that's exactly it. They don't know how to do that because they haven't been given the opportunity to do that. And they will have to do that in July when they start their jobs as professional engineers. So here's an interesting little fun story, really brief. Just this, uh, this in plan view, this is the, a swimming pool that goes underneath the slab of the building and a very tricky design idea. Um, 
about well what's even the implications of the footings on the swimming pool the swimming pool on on retaining walls um and they don't know how to do this uh uh, and it's super fun to see them struggling and explaining to each other, okay, architects, how, how, do, how, long, how long should this pool uh, be open versus covered so that the sun doesn't hit it? And how do I design that uh, overhang? Or it's on the other side here. How do I design that overhang and they say, I don't know, I've never done this before. Um, so it's it's a it's a wonderful interdisciplinary uh, experience. And then there's other unique challenges uh, and and unique uh, rewards. But one of the most fun rewards that we got was um, working with so many different people. Um, uh, Thomas Lenkemas from the world's uh, premier glass manufacturing factory, which is in Lithuania. Uh, we've had a professor from Portugal speak about his theoretical work on, on Eisenstein. We had an Eisenstein scholar who wrote the book on, on Eisenstein and Disney. And of course, we invited the president of, the, of your country, Lithuania. It's very uh, common for uh, presidents to visit my studio. So I said, why not? Um, they said they could not come, but they were very grateful for the invitation. and. Uh, uh, and the students got uh, a lot of uh, joy from, from seeing that kind of uh, recognition. Uh, and I always uh, close by saying, it's not me that is making this magic happen. It's not uh, Mies van der Rohe that's making this magic happen. It's Myron Goldsmith. I, I feel like he's whispering over my shoulder all the time. And um uh, and he's saying, good job, keep going, which is exactly what he told his students when he was a professor. Okay, so that was about 20 minutes, I think, which is what Gedimenos told me. So that was that was really short, like a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> tsunami. <laughs> Thank you very oh, much. Oh, yeah, tsunami. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my first follow up question would be the results seems to be very pleasing, probably to you as well. And I've seen some of the results. So, and but the the format was dictated by the pandemic. So, would you do it again like that if COVID ends? Hopefully, of course. Or what? What would you I, learn from that? Yeah, you know? yeah. I I actually think that the format uh, has the benefits of the format outweigh the drawbacks for sure for me. Um, and I would do it again, but the problem is I have three uh, parties involved. I have uh, structural engineering, me, architecture, which is my colleague, uh, e either Meredith or I've worked with other colleagues, and then you and, and Lutauras. Uh, and three is too many, <laughs> I think. I think with two, we could do it, you know, because we never get in the same room at the same time, all three of us. It's impossible. But with two groups, I think we could do it. So I think the answer is yes. And Konos wants me to do it. You know Konos wants me to do it. And I said, well, I'm a Vilnietis, so I don't know. Yeah, Maybe. Right. So Maybe. could you expand on those benefits from international group yeah well the pro the fact that i get these guests to come in i mean you know we've had world famous people come in and it just raises everything you know when i and it starts with bill baker of course bill baker the chief designer of the burj khalifa the premier structural engineer on planet earth when when i can tell guests well bill baker came would you mind coming to my studio they say oh okay you know so it's like uh yeast mieles right it's like yeast and it just makes everything grow and i would not get bill to come out to california even though he likes he likes california he's been here but it's just too difficult right so um so I think having now imagine if the president would have said, yes, this is a perfect example. It's not far fetched. Why did we invite the president? The president lives in a glass house and there's a very important symbolic criteria because my students have realized now that all presidents, all heads of states should be required to live in a glass house. 
as a symbolic gesture. This is a beautiful idea. And we wanted your president to discuss that. So now imagine this, if he would have come, what that would mean. Suddenly, every, everybody starts to get excited about my little studio, right? And that could not happen in person. He's not going to fly out here in person. So the answer is yes, the benefits are enormous. So that's very good advice for, for our colleagues, teachers here to, to get that star star uh, guest. You need the star power. You, I, I, I'm pretty sure you need the star. You also need a good project, you know, uh, and I, this is a, I, I've been teaching studios like this. This is my seventh time teaching an interdisciplinary studio, but I've never had 120 years of history, you know, starting with Bruno Taut. And, and Paul Schierbart in 1880, moving through Zamyatin, Mies van der Rohe, Sergei Eisenstein. And then we're in 1950, right? We're only at 1950 then, Mies van der Rohe, Myron Goldsmith. And then we move on to 2021, where desert architecture is a very important idea in California. It's not a pure fantasy. Yeah. So you need a good project, you need good people, <laughs> And you need a tsunami. It's very easy. That's all you need. Just those three things. Yeah, maybe Peter could, could, could join in as well because he mentioned uh, another aspect is inter, international, inter, intercultural students. So you didn't, uh, you didn't say about that, Edmund. What, what's, do you gain anything from that? From well, yeah, you, you know the answer to this, but your colleagues don't. I would not be doing this without the international students, uh, without them in my classroom. In the United States, many professors take students abroad to Spain, to, to Italy, to Japan, and they stay in their classroom with their friends from California. When I go to Vilnius, I insist that I have Vilnius students in the classroom. And that's why we are there. You are the essential part of this experience. Having your students see me is important. Having my students see your students is important. And, and without that, I'll just go to Barcelona, you know, and, and I don't, I don't, I could go anywhere, but you are the key. You are the key. Yeah. Splendid, I should say. Splendid and very impressive, uh, even from the listener's perspective. This is what I could say for now. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions from the audience, please, or from the panelists? Uh, while we wait, uh, I'm going to go uh, and expand on that conceptual design. I mean, yeah. again, as, as we said, uh, students have to have that uh, strong basis, right? But then in the fourth grade, you really, you're really trying to push that uh, that boundary of conceptual understanding. And I know from civil engineering studies that it's really hard. It's really hard. How does it work? How, how your uh, engineers take that? I, I think the engineers are very confused by it. Um, the architects are much better at it for sure. Um, uh, in, in the United States, uh, we have this term called uh, the, the little hand sketch at the cafe on the serviette, on the tablecloth. You know, that, that's conceptual design. But where does it end? At some point, it becomes numerical for an engineer, right? And then I think it's traditional design. Conceptual design must look at the client, must look at the site, must look at materials, and must look at various solutions, wildly different solutions. Without those four things, it's not conceptual design. The client, the site, the materials, and varying designs. And that is where conceptual design transfers to traditional civil or structural engineering design. Given a site, given a client, given a, a material, given a configuration, now make it work, right? But it's that first part. We don't teach that. We don't teach that at all in engineering. Zero. And there's a conference devoted to it at ETH Zurich uh, in September. Uh, oh. Professor Josef Schwartz is, is organizing it. I also see that Peter wants to step in uh, regarding the topic of conceptual design. And he is quoting Wikipedia here. 
as we see it uh, saying that it's an early uh, phase of the design process but most probably that is also something what could be subjective to judge and uh, mm -hmm. we can all perceive the terms and uh, uh, certain things uh, according to our own manners most probably that would be true yeah another thing i'd like to touch is the critiques from external jurors i don't know if peter does that I, that's my follow-up for him but for you edmund the, well uh, we heard you you wasn't there you were probably asleep in california <laughs> but there was a presentation about uh, mathematics and how we you know critique and evaluate the teachers do that the lecturers do that but yeah uh, can you explain why you invite uh, outside jurors and what what they bring to the studio right yeah so i was asleep during the mathematics i came in during peter's uh talk with my latte um um uh, i insist on having professionals come into the studio to critique the work. It raises the expectations for the students. It links my university to industry um, so that the industry sees my students as potential hires. Um, it also promotes uh, financial support. Some of these companies give large amounts of money, enormous amounts of money to my department hundreds of thousands of dollars of donations to my department, hundreds of thousands, I'm not exaggerating. And um, it links, you know, the customer with the client, right? So, uh, and the customer and the client for me is, is really, the customer is my student and the client is the industry that's going to be hiring my student, right? And the customer that I am serving right now is the student, but that becomes um, a customer for the, for the subsequent party. And, uh, and it, you will also try to include diversity. So we have women uh, come in yesterday, or for, on Wednesday, we had a, a woman architect paired with a woman engineer. We had underrepresented uh, students, Latino students, former students of mine who are now practice practitioners. And then we get world famous people to come in, presidents of company. We had the president of the Structural Engineering Association of California come in to critique these student work. The president of the, of, of the whole uh, organization. <laughs> and he's looking at, yeah, that's a nice glass house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Edmund. I know you have to, to run to your last Last yes. Time. Yeah. But thank you, Achu. Achu, thank you, everybody. It, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Gedimele and Alyssa, for uh, organizing this. Thank you so, so much for joining us. And bye bye. And right. then we move to session discussion. And I invite Lena to join. To, to, I'm going to moderate the yeah, uh, and, section. And, and the panelists, if you could uh, turn on your cameras, we might have some follow up questions. Hey, okay. Yeah. Okay. So now we move to the last part of this uh, very good day, uh, and it was an, an energetic uh, speech in the end. I enjoy that a lot. Um, but now we 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 want to discuss a little bit about this session, which is networking, and I think we have heard quite a few examples of how important it is to network in any levels, I mean, both between students, uh, between PhD students, between faculty. Uh, and uh, I was thinking that we heard you, Lauri, mention the challenges in establishing networks, that it is difficult to continue to have them and so on. And I was thinking, hmm, but why, why don't he say anything about why, how you establish a successful network. So I, I just want to start out with, at, by asking you all, can we generalize and uh, just find some things that are important for creating a successful network? Hmm. Well, that, <laughs> that is a, that good is it's a difficult quest question uh, uh, that I've been pondering. pondering uh, uh, so obviously a, a successful network uh, 
is something that people are looking forward to, uh, to uh, maintaining it and keeping the conduct so so that it's not something uh, that uh, one is doing because one must do do, do it so it's as a part of duty but <clears throat> but it's something that you find it rewarding um, and uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, and uh, well, uh, giving us an ex example, uh, uh, as I uh, participated in several doctoral consortium uh, um, uh, uh, as a discussant, and I, I found those events very rewarding uh, because uh, the, uh, the opportunity of getting to know new eager um, uh, PhD students uh, uh, and uh, trying to grasp their whole research. In, in a short short time, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity, and having very very many interesting uh, 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 interesting discussions there. So, uh, um, but I cannot do it very often then, because uh, being busy with so many so many things things, and uh, and so and someone else has to organize it. <laughs> so so that it's, it's the organization is it takes time, uh, as, um, and and uh, who who takes care of care of that. Um, uh, that that is a challenge, but okay. They are, typically, they are um, they are organized yeah, just once uh, in certain uh, location, and so it's one time slot for the um, for for them. Uh, um, but if we have uh, if we have organization which tries to maintain, uh, uh, like let let's say the Nordic network uh, in in uh, education research, so. Uh, who takes over, over over the responsibility here so, so that it, it doesn't rely on the same people for too long time. Uh, um, so if, if you commit something uh, with, let's say, two, three years, fine. Uh, but if they're kind of, there's no process of ending it. Uh, uh, so, so sometimes people get, it's not tiredness, but just uh, you don't prioritize any anymore if you think that, okay, new, no new people are coming in. Uh, 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 to, who, who would like to work and, and do the do the work in a, instead of you and keeping the moment momentum. Um, I think that's that's one of the cha challenges and and partially this is that because there is no regular organization of doing this handover uh, 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 to um, to the next uh, ne ne next uh, uh, p p people. Mm. Um, so, Lauri, what I have written down is rewarding and not relying on just one specific person or one specific uh, mm. uh, funding thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Funding always help, helps because then you are committed to, to some, something and you have some resources to do uh, do something, uh, so something extra. So, so certainly it, it, help, uh, it helps. Uh, um, but often this fund, uh, the funding for these kind of instruments uh, is, is, is quite low uh, uh, so, so that you can organize the events. You have some travel funding, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you might not have uh, any, any funding for recruiting new hands. So yeah. you have just your own hands there. Uh, uh, with, uh, so that's, that, that is one challenge. Mm. Peter. Peter. Yeah. Yeah, so so my, my reason for raising the hand was that to me, networks are very personal. You build them up because you have a genuine, a genuine interest in the other person's work or personal life or whatever. So you if if you don't give each other things, uh, they will die out. Um, and I think that to me, it's a matter of when you kind of get to certain states in your career, you need to make sure that the people who are following you, they also, you, you, you kind of open up a network that you have to them. But if, 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 if it's not that they have a genuine interest in the other person's work, then it just dies. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. So it is difficult then to mm. contain the networks uh, who are building especially bottom up maybe where somebody has a, this interest that you want to deliver or give to someone else. 
Yeah, Anything, yeah. Jan? Any any other comments? Yeah, but I think I think uh, both answers here are really really good. And but I, I I also want to add that it must matter. But I think you already touched upon that, both Laurie and Peter. But you can make it matter as well. So if you really want the network to exist for some reason. It is very peculiar because the network should want to exist on their own. So, so, so it's, but of course, if you want the network to exist for some reason, then you should make it matter to be there. Um, but looking at from the other side, I think you should be able to take care of and nurture those who have feelings for something because they will naturally be uh, like the champions or the drivers for this type of those who really are keen on um, improving something. No, I'm good, Nova, thank you for asking. It's <laughs> going to the store. Um, uh, improving things or are disappointed at something or know, have heard about something that they want to know more about or that you, if you're a leader or if you're whatever you are, uh, you have to take care of those who have these feelings. You have to have, um, so that's some kind of, taking care of the bottom up or the innovations or the ideas or feelings. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, as Lauri said, then you need to have someone there organizing it, uh, monitoring it and fixing it. Like I think from, from our side, me and Vigo are very administrative. Even if you are very into education, we, we know about teaching assessment, et cetera, et cetera, but we're also very administrative. We sit down and we plan and we create Google documents for all the groups and we create their calendar meetings. Or if we can, we get resources for someone else to do it eventually. But we have to be, also have some kind of patience that you will not get those resources until people see the value of this network. But when you do, you need to give it support. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I have in mind one successful case which has well, uh, uh, which is a long, uh, long tradition, and in, uh, uh, it, it is the Collie Calling Conference of Computer Science Education, uh, which is organized, uh, which has been organized for 20 years now uh, uh, at at the. Uh, 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 at Collie, which which is a hot, hotel in the middle of a na uh, national park, park in eastern Finland, uh, um, uh, so so it's it's a very isolated place, and and this conference has grown to an international event uh, uh, where people are coming coming there again uh, and from australia new zealand uh, us <laughs> and and, uh, and it's very hard to get there but uh, <clears throat> Uh, but now that interesting thing that this conference is not driven by any formal organization. It is it, it's working on an, on a volunteer base uh, for the 20, 20 years. Uh, so there is no formal association uh, organizing it. Like for example, what about this uh, the EDC conference uh, or Frontiers in Education, uh, which have which have their back uh, and back by the uh, ACMI Triple E. Uh, and uh, so the organizing body there is, uh, is is a research group at the University of Eastern Finland. Uh, some senior uh, is taking uh, taking care of, of the organization and the, and use their PhD students as the uh, people for uh, the practical work, work. And then the program committee uh, is a uh, normal program, uh, program com com committee, which uh, then ha has a two year hand handover so that there's a senior and junior chair uh, every year and, and the junior junior becomes uh, senior for the next year. And um, and it's very informally orga organized, uh, but, but it, it does work because people who ha who who have uh, attended the conference many many times they they found that this is an excellent place for networking because you come there for three days uh, uh, and you cannot go anywhere. Uh, everyone is there. Uh, roughly 50, 60 people at the at the moment. You can meet all people uh, there during during these uh, three, three days and uh, lots of PhD students there uh, uh, and. 
Uh, so the experience that, okay, this is a very unique, uh, you, you, unique type of con conference, uh, always there, uh, and uh, one for nature around. around. Um, uh, and um, it's it's running on a volunteer base in, 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 indeed, uh, uh, and, and that has been successful. I think uh, uh, people uh, who participate in the program committee consider that okay, it's worthwhile supporting the con con conference, and 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 then uh, uh, the organizing department know because they have done it for twenty years, they know exactly what to do. Uh, uh, so very specific uh, pro processes. For what, what needs to be done, and they have new PhD students who can then take over the practical work. So that actually is a working organization, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sounds interesting, but maybe, uh, Lauri, a bit difficult to divide between free mm. spare time and uh, mm. work time uh, when mm. it's not a formal organization. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would like to introduce Peter Göransson, the Secretary General of the Nortec, uh, and he had a, a comment on on networking. I think could you share your thoughts, Peter? Yeah, you have a lot of years Jedimilas. experience, right? Yeah, thank you, Yedimilas. So uh, I'm I'm being with you all the day, and I think it's so interesting, even if I'm not doing with education anymore. But uh, as a, as a comment to to the problem, we'll have continue to in, in a network. I, I just a small comment that Nortec, where we is the, the organizer behind this, we have existed in the lot at least 70 years now. So there is at least one university network who has existed and survived many, many changes during the time. And, and I will also just say that we uh, I can say something how we are organized. We changed a uh, president, leader of, of the whole thing uh, each biannual. But we start, we elect the new president, president elect one year before. So we, so the new president has time to, to uh, understand what's going on and also to have um, developed some ideas what he wants to do or she wants to do in, in the, the coming year. And, and the, the 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 ex president also stay in the board for at least one year more, so we have a period of four years. And when we have so the, the only person in in, uh, in in the network who is still there is me, uh, and I am working outside the university, so I have no other obligations to 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 um, to so, to compete with so so I think that that is I think that is a reason for the success for, for Nordic and we we still feel that we can develop and, and so so uh, yes thank you <laughs> yes thanks Peter uh, I was actually trying to move over to Nordic um, but first I wanted to just thank the speakers of this session. Uh, I think it was a good ending by ending with uh, networking as our third session. Uh, and I thought that was a good uh, bridge over to my last issue. And that is about this network, because now we have been participating in the NEE Network's first seminar organized by Vilnius Tech. Uh, and I introduced myself in the beginning. So I'm Lena Gemere from KTH and Maladolin University, and I'm chairing this part of Nortec. And I have had help of, of, uh, by you, Peter, a lot just to establishing this. And yeah, Deminas is one of the people in our steering committee. And we, we just hope that you have enjoyed the day. But of course, now in the end, we want your advices on how this can be this successful network. And one thing I want to know is whether you think it's good to have this online network or if it should be a IRL network. And the other things I hope you want to reflect on is just those pressing issues that you talk about uh, that can make it work coming and rewarding. What uh, kind of issues might that be to bring up? 
Well, the question uh, question from uh, for the online or uh, on site it there are pros and cons cons and uh, uh, very, very very much uh, it's it's much much easier uh, uh, to participate in online events because you you don't need to use time for travel traveling and and uh, and for busy senior people that is so, so certainly an asset but on the other hand uh, uh, I think uh, meeting people in person and uh, having having discussions over, over lunches and dinners and, and with the social events that's highly important to, <laughs> to get feel the community so it's it's much harder to uh, to be able to uh, uh, when you enter a com community uh, 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 just purely on, online um, but I'm not sure that what will happen in the future because now that the whole world has been exercising the, uh, these online events and online uh, uh, com com communication for so long time uh, and, and so we are more familiar with that kind of method and, and we see the advantages and, and, and so one interesting thing to see is that what will happen with the conferences the, perhaps with the hybrid, the hybrid conferences that you can some people are on site some people uh, will be over uh, uh, following the conference on, on, on online perhaps with a lower fee um, <clears throat> and uh, so uh, I don't know the, world, the, the academic traditions could change in some way but I, I really don't know what, what will be the future I will let Peter also say if you have a comment Peter Oh, I fully agree with Laurie in the sense that uh, I think that's also going to happen. However, to me, um, most of my networking thing is really on the social side when you have a beer together or a glass yeah. of wine and something. Yes, together. yes, that's important. That in, you cannot do that you know, on, on, on online <laughs> in a similar way. It's not, it's not the same. <laughs> that, that is really challenging. So. So I was lucky to have a lot of new uh, externally funded research projects last year. And all of them but one that I'm the coordinator of was actually uh, started with an online um, kickoff meeting. And we are still have only had online meetings, which means you don't know them. You don't know them the way, you don't get this yeah. genuine interest uh, of people. Mm -hmm. So I think if you know people, if you have the network already, yeah. Then the online things make sense. Yes, um, yes. But you don't get new, real uh, contacts to people that you would collaborate with for, say, three or four decades uh, of things. You don't get them without having this genuine interest. And you can only get that if you really meet face to face and have other things you can, can, can do together. Yes. Thanks, Peter. Uh, then I will move to Anna Karin and Jeneminas. Can we, after that, can we let in all the people in the audience as well so they can participate? Uh, Anna Karin, please. Yes, uh, I agree very much with the previous. I'd just like to add some thoughts. Uh, it's, I think, it's also a generational issue. So we should really reflect on that. that it's different from us who are experienced networkers in various forms and the younger ones and how they would want to network and how they are used to the online networking and mm -hmm. that they can find platforms for this and don't feel this. So oh, I can't have a beer in a bar. <laughs> so I think that will disappear more and more. And there will be other things that they are perfectly fine. You see our kids like, uh, I, I ask, oh, aren't you going to meet any friends this weekend? And they're like, I'm meeting 10 or 15. They are in my computer. Mm -hmm. So and uh, so that's one thing. And then I also want to reflect on what Lauri mentioned when he talked about his network, that they, they should actually do something too. Mm -hmm. So maybe they should produce papers together or collaborate or research applications. And I can recognize that a lot because both Lauri and I, we have been in, in the Nordic Five Tech uh, network alliance uh, which is smaller and then we could see different groups so the nordic five tech pedagogical groups they just met to talk mainly share experiences and for my side i thought that was a bit well i could do it fun but it felt a bit more like waste of time and a bit abstract nothing happens but in another group which was called peer evaluation 
we had yearly projects with program directors from each university in the same field that we gathered a yearly process, meeting, comparing, reading, master thesis, discussing improvements, giving feedback, finding courses to share. And it kept on running from 2008 until long. And we wrote papers, Laura and me and others, about it as well, because we found so many things. Mm -hmm. And there, then we had faculty members and student representatives and admin staff involved. And we learned a lot about program development there too. So I think doing things is not to be underestimated either. In the evenings, we had beers and <laughs> wine as well. And of course, mm. yeah. But then there was, um, in these program evaluations, and uh, there was a concrete task to be done. Uh, uh, so, 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 uh, and both both could uh, see, see the benefit of discussing with that. Uh, whereas uh, in, in this other pedagogical network, it, wasn't, it was not clear that what is the task actually. It was a little bit of invent that what you could do is, uh, re reasonably. And, um, and, and so uh, uh, that was one of the, one of the Challenge, challenge is what I experienced when I was uh, uh, participating uh, that. Uh, 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 and and uh, then when everyone was busy, uh, 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 then it slowly turned turned down. That okay, it was even the, the difficult to organize meetings uh, to discuss uh, 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 with delays in responding emails and uh, and, and, and so, so, so so on. And it it just ceased. That that, that activity, even though moving uh, five uh, as as a network, uh, obviously con continues uh, because it's a formal uh, formal network uh, uh, on the president's level. Um, yes, and not so many partners. Uh, yeah, um, mm -hmm. I want to ask also the audience if you want to add something. Do you do you, what do you see? Do you want to keep online meetings or do you have any pressing issues you want us to bring up? Yeah, I don't think we're going to get audience attendees. You can also uh, raise your hands if you want to say something for this final <laughs> ending of the conference. But uh, it's it is late. I just wanted to give yeah. the chance. Yeah, because I was on the participant side previously, and we couldn't write in the chat. It was closed. No, no, you can you can raise hand or just Q and A. Mm. So. Yeah. But okay. I think yeah, I think we should. I, uh, I think uh, then I would say that we will put a note on the web page where you can contribute. Uh, on how we should run next year's seminars. And I think we who are in the steering committee will look at the homepage, of course, and uh, see if there's any opinions that has been raised there. So by that, I, Jedimina, from my side, I want to thank the speakers for this session and uh, give the word back to you. Well, thank you for um, <clears throat> thank you for giving the word, and actually thank you for uh, organizing, helping us organizing this event, and of course for uh, contributing by moderating this session. So uh, once again, we would like to express our gratitude to you. Oh, thank you! <laughs> oh, to yeah. all the participants. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for the nice yeah. gifts that you sent home to us. <laughs> Anna, yeah, if you didn't receive yes, it, thanks. you will. <laughs> the post thank you. Yeah, works, indeed. Uh, works slow yeah. in, in the COVID. But yeah, thank everyone for participating. We had a very interesting conference. I think we will share the recordings with everyone uh, so you can double double check on the things you most most find interesting or maybe something you have missed so uh, that would be a great chance to revise all the things which were mentioned here today and yes Anna helps us to promote all the gifts which we actually send to the speakers <laughs> so thank you so so much uh, we are glad you have received those uh, if you did not well giving us is absolutely right you will definitely do uh, okay thank you <laughs> that is it that is it for this first <laughs>
conference of yes, Nordic and engineering. We, we really, really hope to see you all next year. Uh, well, either on our screens or maybe even in person. So let us hope for the best. Thank you for making this day happen and uh, stay safe. This is uh, a usual ending of all the events yeah. right now. You most have a probably. great weekend, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and a great okay. summer already. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Yeah, thanks a lot, Jedimina.